Section 20 of Volume 1D of History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688 by David Hume. Volume 1D, Section 20, Chapter 40. Part seven. Requisens, though a man of milder dispositions, could not appease the violent hatred which the revolted Hollanders had conceived against the Spanish government, and the war continued as obstinate as ever. In the siege of Leyden, undertaken by the Spaniards, the Dutch opened the dikes and sluices in order to drive them from the enterprise and the very peasants were active in ruining their fields by an inundation rather than fall again under the hated tyranny of spain but notwithstanding this repulse the governor still pursued the war and the contest seemed too unequal between so mighty a monarch and two small provinces however fortified by nature and however defended by the desperate resolution of the inhabitants the prince of orange therefore in fifteen seventy five was resolved to sue for foreign succour and to make applications to one or other of his great neighbours henry or elizabeth the court of france was not exempt from the same spirit of tyranny and persecution which prevailed among the spaniards and that kingdom torn by domestic dissensions seemed not to enjoy at present either leisure or ability to pay regard to foreign interests but england long connected both by commerce and alliance with the netherlands and now more concerned in the fate of the revolted provinces by sympathy in religion seemed naturally interested in their defence and as Elizabeth had justly entertained great jealousy of Philip, and governed her kingdom in perfect tranquillity, hopes were entertained that her policy, her ambition, or her generosity, would engage her to support them under their present calamities. They sent, therefore, a solemn embassy to London, consisting of St. Aldegondi, Douza, Nivelle, Buys, and Melson and after employing the most humble supplications to the queen they offered her the possession and sovereignty of their provinces if she would exert her power in their defence there were many strong motives which might impel elizabeth to accept of so liberal an offer she was apprised of the injuries which philip had done to her by his intrigues with the malcontents in england and ireland she foresaw the danger which she must incur from a total prevalence of the catholics in the low countries and the maritime situation of those provinces as well as their command over the great rivers was an inviting circumstance to a nation like the english who were beginning to cultivate commerce and naval power but this princess though magnanimous had never entertained the ambition of making conquests or gaining new acquisitions and the whole purpose of her vigilant and active politics was to maintain by the most frugal and cautious expedients the tranquillity of her own dominions an open war with the spanish monarchy was the apparent consequence of her accepting the dominion of these provinces and after taking the inhabitants under her protection she could never afterwards in honour abandon them but however desperate their defence might become she must embrace it even further than her convenience or interests would permit for these reasons she refused in positive terms the sovereignty proffered her but told the ambassadors that in return for the good will which the prince of orange and the states had shown her she would endeavour to mediate an agreement for them on the most reasonable terms that could be obtained she sent accordingly sir henry cobham to philip and represented to him the danger which he would incur of losing entirely the low countries 
if france could obtain the least interval from her intestine disorders and find leisure to offer her protection to those mutinous and discontented provinces philip seemed to take this remonstrance in good part but no accord ensued and war in the netherlands continued with the same rage and violence as before it was an accident that delivered the hollanders from their present desperate situation requesens the governor dying suddenly the spanish troops discontented for want of pay and licentious for want of a proper authority to command them broke into a furious mutiny and threw everything into confusion they sacked and pillaged the cities of maastricht and antwerp and executed great slaughter on the inhabitants they threatened the other cities with a like fate and all the provinces excepting luxembourg united for mutual defence against their violence and called in the prince of orange and the hollanders as their protectors a treaty commonly called the pacification of ghent was formed by common agreement and the removal of foreign troops with the restoration of their ancient liberties was the object which the provinces mutually stipulated to pursue don john of austria natural brother to philip being appointed governor found on his arrival at luxembourg that the states had so fortified themselves and that the spanish troops were so divided by their situation that there was no possibility of resistance and he agreed to the terms required of him the spaniards evacuated the country and these provinces seemed at last to breathe a little from their calamities but it was not easy to settle entire peace while the thirst of revenge and dominion governed the king of spain and while the flemings were so strongly agitated with resentment of past and fear of future injuries the ambition of don john who coveted this great theatre for his military talents engaged him rather to inflame than appease the quarrel and as he found the states determined to impose very strict limitations on his authority he broke all articles seized namur and procured the recall of the spanish army from italy this prince endowed with a lofty genius and elated by the prosperous successes of his youth had opened his mind to vast undertakings and looking much beyond the conquest of the revolted provinces had projected to espouse the queen of scots and to acquire in her right the dominion of the british kingdoms elizabeth was aware of his intentions and seeing now from the union of all the provinces a fair prospect of their making a long and vigorous defence against spain she no longer scrupled to embrace the protection of their liberties which seemed so intimately connected with her own safety after sending them a sum of money about twenty thousand pounds for the immediate pay of their troops she concluded a treaty with them in which she stipulated to assist them with five thousand foot and a thousand horse at the charge of the flemings and to lend them a hundred thousand pounds on receiving the bonds of some of the most considerable towns of the netherlands for her repayment within the year it was further agreed that the commander of the english army should be admitted into the council of the states and nothing be determined concerning war or peace without previously informing the queen or him of it that they should enter into no league without her consent that if any discord arose among themselves it should be referred to her arbitration and that if any prince on any pretext should attempt hostilities against her they should send to her assistance an army equal to that which she had employed in their defence this alliance was signed on the seventh of january fifteen seventy eight one considerable inducement to the queen for entering into treaty with the states was to prevent their throwing themselves into the arms of france and she was desirous to make the king of spain believe that it was her sole motive 
she represented to him by her ambassador thomas wilkes that hitherto she had religiously acted the part of a good neighbour and ally had refused the sovereignty of holland and zealand when offered her had advised the prince of orange to submit to the king and had even accompanied her counsel with menaces in case of his refusal she persevered she said in the same friendly intentions and as a proof of it would venture to interpose with her advice for the composure of the present differences let don john whom she could not but regard as her mortal enemy be recalled let some other prince more popular be substituted in his room let the spanish armies be withdrawn let the flemish be restored to their ancient liberties and privileges and if after these concessions they were still obstinate not to return to their duty she promised to join her arms with those of the king of spain and force them to compliance philip dissembled his resentment against the queen and still continued to supply don john with money and troops that prince though once repulsed at riminont by the valour of the english under norris and though opposed as well by the army of the states as by prince casimir who had conducted to the low countries a great body of germans paid by the queen gained a great advantage over the flemings at gemblours but was cut off in the midst of his prosperity by poison given him secretly as was suspected by orders from philip who dreaded his ambition the prince of parma succeeded to the command who uniting valour and clemency negotiation and military exploits made great progress against the revolted flemings and advanced the progress of the spaniards by his arts as well as by his arms during these years while europe was almost everywhere in great commotion england enjoyed a profound tranquillity owing chiefly to the prudence and vigour of the queen's administration and to the wise precautions which she employed in all her measures by supporting the zealous protestants in scotland she had twice given them the superiority over their antagonists had closely connected their interests with her own and had procured herself entire security from that quarter whence the most dangerous invasions could be made upon her she saw in france her enemies the guises though extremely powerful yet counterbalanced by the huguenots her zealous partisans and even hated by the king who was jealous of their restless and exorbitant ambition the bigotry of philip gave her just ground of anxiety but the same bigotry had happily excited the most obstinate opposition among his own subjects and had created him enemies whom his arms and policy were not likely soon to subdue the queen of scots her antagonist and rival and the pretender to her throne was a prisoner in her hands and by her impatience and high spirit had been engaged in practices which afforded the queen a presence for rendering her confinement more rigorous and for cutting off her communication with her partisans in england religion was the capital point on which depended all the political transactions of that age and the queen's conduct in this particular making allowance for the prevailing prejudices of the times could scarcely be accused of severity or imprudence she established no inquisition into men's bosoms she imposed no oath of supremacy except on those who received trust or emolument from the public and though the exercise of every religion but the established was prohibited by statute the violation of this law by saying mass and receiving the sacrament in private houses was in many instances connived at while on the other hand the catholics in the beginning of her reign showed little reluctance against going to church or frequenting the ordinary duties of public worship the pope sensible that this practice would by degrees reconcile all his partisans to the reformed religion 
hastened the publication of the bull which excommunicated the queen and freed her subjects from their oaths of allegiance and great pains were taken by the emissaries of rome to render the breach between the two religions as wide as possible and to make the frequenting of protestant churches appear highly criminal in the catholics these practices with the rebellion which ensued increased the vigilance and severity of the government but the romanists if their condition were compared with that of the nonconformists in other countries and with their own maxims where they domineered could not justly complain of violence or persecution the queen appeared rather more anxious to keep a strict hand over the puritans who though their pretensions were not so immediately dangerous to her authority seemed to be actuated by a more unreasonable obstinacy and to retain claims of which both in civil and ecclesiastical matters it was as yet difficult to discern the full scope and intention some secret attempts of that sect to establish a separate congregation and discipline had been carefully repressed in the beginning of this reign and when any of the established clergy discovered a tendency to their principles by omitting the legal habits or ceremonies the queen had shown a determined resolution to punish them by fines and deprivation though her orders to that purpose had been frequently eluded by the secret protection which these sectaries received from some of her most considerable courtiers but what chiefly tended to gain elizabeth the hearts of her subjects was her frugality which though carried sometimes to an extreme led her not to amass treasures but only to prevent impositions upon her people who were at that time very little accustomed to bear the burdens of government by means of her rigid economy she paid all the debts which she found on the crown with their full interest though some of these debts had been contracted even during the reign of her father some loans which she had exacted at the commencement of her reign were repaid by her a practice in that age somewhat unusual and she established her credit on such a footing that no sovereign in europe could more readily command any sum which the public exigencies might at any time require during this peaceable and uniform government england furnishes few materials for history and except the small part which elizabeth took in foreign transactions there scarcely passed any occurrence which requires a particular detail the most memorable event in this period was a session of parliament held on the eighth of february fifteen seventy six where debates were started which may appear somewhat curious and singular peter wentworth a puritan who had signalized himself in former parliaments by his free and undaunted spirit opened this session with a premeditated harangue which drew on him the indignation of the house and gave great offence to the queen and the ministers as it seems to contain a rude sketch of those principles of liberty which happily gained afterwards the ascendant in england it may not be proper to give in a few words the substance of it he promised that the name of liberty is sweet but the thing itself is precious beyond the most inestimable treasures and that it behooved them to be careful lest contenting themselves with the sweetness of the name they forego the substance and abandon what of all earthly possessions was of the highest value to the kingdom he then proceeded to observe that freedom of speech in that house a privilege so useful to sovereign and subject had been formerly infringed in many essential articles and was at present exposed to the most imminent danger that it was usual when any subject of importance was handled especially if it regarded religion to surmise that these topics were disagreeable to the queen and that the further proceeding in them would draw down her indignation upon their temerity that solomon had justly affirmed the king's displeasure to be a messenger of death 
and it was no wonder if men even though urged by motives of conscience and duty should be inclined to stop short when they found themselves exposed to so severe a penalty that by the employing of this argument the house was incapacitated from serving their country and even from serving the queen herself whose ears besieged by pernicious flatterers were thereby rendered inaccessible to the most salutary truths that it was a mockery to call an assembly a parliament yet deny it that privilege which was so essential to its being and without which it must degenerate into an abject school of servility and dissimulation that as the parliament was the great guardian of the laws they ought to have liberty to discharge their trust and to maintain that authority whence even kings themselves derive their being that a king was constituted such by law and though he was not dependent on man yet was he subordinate to god and the law and was obliged to make their prescriptions not his own will the rule of his conduct that even his commission as god's vice-regent enforced instead of loosening this obligation since he was thereby invested with authority to execute on earth the will of god which is nothing but law and justice that though these surmises of displeasing the queen by their proceedings had impeached in a very essential point all freedom of speech a privilege granted them by a special law yet was there a more express and more dangerous invasion made on their liberties by frequent messages from the throne that it had become a practice when the house was entering on any question either ecclesiastical or civil to bring an order from the queen inhibiting them absolutely from treating of such matters and debarring them from all further discussion of these momentous articles that the prelates emboldened by her royal protection had assumed a decisive power in all questions of religion and required that every one should implicitly submit his faith to their arbitrary determinations that the love which he bore his sovereign forbade him to be silent under such abuses or to sacrifice on this important occasion his duty to servile flattery and complaisance and that as no earthly creature was exempt from fault so neither was the queen herself but in imposing this servitude on her faithful commons had committed a great and even dangerous fault against herself and the whole commonwealth it is easy to observe from this speech that in this dawn of liberty the parliamentary style was still crude and unformed and that the proper decorum of attacking ministers and councillors without interesting the honour of the crown or mentioning the person of the sovereign was not yet entirely established the commons expressed great displeasure at this unusual licence they sequestered wentworth from the house and committed him prisoner to the sergeant-at-arms they even ordered him to be examined by a committee consisting of all those members who were also members of the privy council and a report to be next day made to the house this committee met in the star chamber and wearing the aspect of that arbitrary court summoned wentworth to appear before them and answer for his behaviour but though the commons had discovered so little delicacy or precaution in thus confounding their own authority with that of the star chamber wentworth better understood the principles of liberty and refused to give these councillors any account of his conduct in parliament till he were satisfied that they acted not as members of the privy council but as a committee of the house he justified his liberty of speech by pleading the rigour and hardship of the queen's messages and notwithstanding that the committee showed him by instances in other reigns that the practice of sending such messages was not unprecedented he would not agree to express any sorrow or repentance the issue of the affair was that after a month's confinement 
the queen sent to the commons informing them that from her special grace and favour she had restored him to his liberty and to his place in the house by this seeming lenity she indirectly retained the power which she had assumed of imprisoning the members and obliging them to answer before her for their conduct in parliament and sir walter mildmay endeavoured to make the house sensible of her majesty's goodness in so gently remitting the indignation which she might justly conceive at the temerity of their member but he informed them that they had not the liberty of speaking what and of whom they pleased and that indiscreet freedoms used in that house had both in the present and foregoing ages met with a proper chastisement he warned them therefore not to abuse further the queen's clemency lest she be constrained contrary to her inclination to turn an unsuccessful lenity into a necessary severity the behaviour of the two houses was in every other respect equally tame and submissive instead of a bill which was at first introduced for the reformation of the church they were contented to present a petition to her majesty for that purpose and when she told them that she would give orders to her bishops to amend all abuses and if they were negligent she would herself by her supreme power and authority over the church give such redress as would entirely satisfy the nation the parliament willingly acquiesced in this sovereign and peremptory decision though the commons showed so little spirit in opposing the authority of the crown they maintained this session their dignity against an encroachment of the peers and would not agree to a conference which they thought was demanded of them in an irregular manner they acknowledged however with all humbleness such is their expression the superiority of the lords they only refused to give that house any reason for their proceedings and asserted that where they altered a bill sent them by the peers it belonged to them to desire a conference not the upper house to require it the commons granted an aid of one subsidy and two fifteenths mild may in order to satisfy the house concerning the reasonableness of this grant entered into a detail of the queen's past expenses in supporting the government and of the increasing charges of the crown from the daily increase in the price of all commodities he did not however forge to admonish them that they were to regard this detail as the pure effect of the queen's condescension since she was not bound to give them any account of how she employed her treasure end of section twenty chapter forty part seven section twenty one of volume one d of history of england from the invasion of julius caesar to the revolution of sixteen eighty eight this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688 by David Hume, Volume 1D, Section 21, Chapter 41, Part 1. Elizabeth The greatest and most absolute security that Elizabeth enjoyed during her whole reign never exempted her from vigilance and attention but the scene began now to be more overcast and dangers gradually multiplied on her from more than one quarter the earl of morton had hitherto retained scotland in strict alliance with the queen and had also restored domestic tranquillity to that kingdom but it was not to be expected that the factitious and legal authority of a regent would long maintain itself in a country unacquainted with law and order where even the natural dominion of hereditary princes so often met with opposition and control the nobility began anew to break into factions the people were disgusted with some instances of morton's avarice 
and the clergy who complained of further encroachments on their narrow revenue joined and increased the discontent of the other orders the regent was sensible of his dangerous situation and having dropped some peevish expressions as if he were willing or desirous to resign the noblemen of the opposite parties favourites of the young king laid hold of this concession and required that demission which he seemed so frankly to offer them james was at this time but eleven years of age yet morton having secured himself as he imagined by a general pardon resigned his authority into the hands of the king who pretended to conduct in his own name the administration of the kingdom the regent retired from the government and seemed to employ himself entirely in the care of his domestic affairs but either tired with this tranquillity which appeared insipid after the agitations of ambition or thinking it time to throw off dissimulation he came again to court acquired an ascendant in the council and though he resumed not the title of regent governed with the same authority as before the opposite party after holding separate conventions took to arms on pretence of delivering their prince from captivity and restoring him to the free exercise of his government queen elizabeth interposed by her ambassador sir robert bowles and mediated an agreement between the factions morton kept possession of the government but his enemies were numerous and vigilant and his authority seemed to become every day more precarious the count d'aubigny of the house of lennox cousin german to the king's father had been born and educated in france and being a young man of good address and a sweet disposition he appeared to the duke of guise a proper instrument for detaching james from the english interest and connecting him with his mother and her relations he no sooner appeared at stirling where james resided than he acquired the affections of the young monarch and joining his interests with those of james stuart of the house of oakiltree a man of profligate manners who had acquired the king's favour he employed himself under the appearance of play and amusement in instilling into the tender mind of the prince new sentiments of politics and government he represented to him the injustice which had been done to mary in her deposition and made him entertain thoughts either of resigning the crown into her hands or of associating her with him in the administration elizabeth alarmed at the danger which might ensue from the prevalence of this interest in scotland sent anew sir robert bowes to stirling and accusing d'aubigny now created earl of lennox of an attachment to the french warned james against entertaining such suspicious and dangerous connections the king excused himself by sir alexander hume his ambassador and lennox finding that the queen had openly declared against him was further confirmed in his intention of overturning the english interest and particularly of ruining morton who was regarded as the head of it that nobleman was arrested in council accused as an accomplice in the late king's murder committed to prison brought to trial and condemned to suffer as a traitor he confessed that bothwell had communicated to him the design had pleaded Mary's consent, and had desired his concurrence, but he denied that he himself had ever expressed any approbation of the crime, and in excuse for his concealing it, he alleged the danger of revealing the secret either to Henry, who had no resolution nor constancy, or Morton, who appeared to be an accomplice in the murder. Sir Thomas Randolph was sent by the Queen to intercede in favour of Morton, and that ambassador not content with discharging this duty of his function engaged by his persuasion 
the earls of Argyle, Montrose, Angus, Mar, and Glencairn, to enter into a confederacy for protecting, even by force of arms, the life of the prisoner. The more to overawe that nobleman's enemies, Elizabeth ordered forces to be assembled on the borders of England. But this expedient served only to hasten his sentence and execution. Morton died with that constancy and resolution which had attended him through all the various events of his life, and left a reputation which was less disputed with regard to abilities than probity and virtue. But this conclusion of the scene happened not till the subsequent year. Elizabeth was, during this period, extremely anxious on account of every revolution in Scotland, both because that country alone, not being separated from England by sea, and bordering on all the Catholic and malcontent counties, afforded her enemies a safe and easy method of attacking her, and because she was sensible that Mary, thinking herself abandoned by the French monarch, had been engaged by the Guises to have recourse to the powerful protection of Philip, who, though he had not yet come to an open rupture with the Queen, was every day, both by the injuries which he committed and suffered, more exasperated against her. That he might retaliate the assistance which she gave to his rebels in the Low Countries, he had sent, under the name of the Pope, a body of seven hundred Spaniards and Italians into Ireland, where the inhabitants, always turbulent, and discontented with the English government, were now alienated by religious prejudices, and were ready to join every invader. The Spanish general, San Gisofo, built a fort in Kerry, and being there besieged by the Earl of Ormond, president of Munster, who was soon after joined by Lord Grey, the deputy, he made a weak and cowardly defence. After some assaults, feebly sustained, he surrendered at discretion, and Grey, who commanded but a small force, finding himself encumbered with so many prisoners, put all the Spaniards and Italians to the sword without mercy, and hanged about fifteen hundred of the Irish, a cruelty which gave great displeasure to Elizabeth. When the English ambassador made complaints of this invasion, he was answered by like complaints of the piracies committed by Francis Drake, a bold seaman who had assaulted the Spaniards in the place where they deemed themselves most secure, in the New World. This man, sprung from mean parents in the county of Devon, having acquired considerable riches by depredations made in the Isthmus of Panama, and having there gotten a sight of the Pacific Ocean, was so stimulated by ambition and avarice that he scrupled not to employ his whole fortune in a new adventure through those seas, so much unknown at that time to all the European nations. By means of Sir Christopher Hatton, then vice-chamberlain, a great favourite of the Queen's, he obtained her consent and approbation, and he set sail from Plymouth in 1577, with four ships and a pinnace, on board of which were 164 able sailors. He passed into the South Sea by the Straits of Magellan, and attacked the Spaniards, who expected no enemy in these quarters. He took many rich prizes, and prepared to return with the booty which he had acquired. Apprehensive of being intercepted by the enemy, if he took the same way homewards by which he had reached the Pacific Ocean, he attempted to find a passage by the north of California, and failing in that enterprise, he set sail for the East Indies, and returned safely this year by the Cape of Good Hope. He was the first Englishman who sailed round the globe, and the first commander-in-chief, for Magellan, whose ship executed the same adventure, died in his passage. His name became celebrated on account of so bold and fortunate an attempt, but many, apprehending the resentment of the Spaniards, 
endeavoured to persuade the queen that it would be more prudent to disavow the enterprise to punish drake and to restore the treasure but elizabeth who admired valour and who was allured by the prospect of sharing in the booty determined to countenance that gallant sailor she conferred on him the honour of knighthood and accepted of a banquet from him at deptford on board the ship which had achieved so memorable a voyage when philip's ambassador mendoza exclaimed against drake's piracies she told him that the spanish by arrogating a right to the whole new world and excluding thence all other european nations who should sail thither even with the view of exercising the most lawful commerce naturally tempted others to make a violent eruption into those countries to pacify however the catholic monarch she caused part of the booty to be restored to pedro sabura a spaniard who pretended to be agent for the merchants whom drake had spoiled having learned afterwards that philip had seized the money and had employed part of it against herself in ireland part of it in the pay of the prince of parma's troops she decided to make no more restitutions there was another cause which induced the queen to take this resolution she was in such want of money that she was obliged to assemble a parliament a measure which as she herself openly declared she never embraced except when constrained by the necessity of her affairs the parliament besides granting her a supply of one subsidy and two fifteenths enacted some statutes for the security of her government chiefly against the attempts of the catholics whoever in any way reconciled any one to the church of rome or was himself reconciled was declared to be guilty of treason to say mass was subjected to the penalty of a year's imprisonment and a fine of two hundred marks the being present was punishable by a year's imprisonment and a fine of a hundred marks a fine of twenty pounds a month was imposed on every one who continued during that time absent from church to utter slanderous or seditious words against the queen was punishable for the first offence with the pillory and loss of ears the second offence was declared felony the writing or printing of such words was felony even on the first offence the puritans prevailed so far as to have further applications made for reformation in religion and paul wentworth brother to the member of that name who had distinguished himself in the preceding session moved that the commons from their own authority should appoint a general fast and prayers a motion to which the house unwarily assented for this presumption they were severely reprimanded by a message from the queen as encroaching on the royal prerogative and supremacy and they were obliged to submit and ask forgiveness the queen and parliament were engaged to pass these severe laws against the catholics by some late discoveries of the treasonable practices of their priests when the ancient worship was suppressed and the reformation introduced into the universities the king of spain reflected that as some species of literature was necessary for supporting these doctrines and controversies the romish communion must decay in england if no means were found to give erudition to the ecclesiastics and for this reason he founded a seminary at douay where the catholics sent their children chiefly such as were intended for the priesthood in order to receive the rudiments of their education the cardinal of lorraine imitated this example by erecting a like seminary in his diocese of rheims and though rome was somewhat distant the pope would not neglect to adorn by a foundation of the same nature that capital of orthodoxy these seminaries founded with so hostile an intention sent over every year a colony of priests who maintained the catholic superstition in its full height of bigotry 
and being educated with a view to the crown of martyrdom, were not deterred either by danger or fatigue from maintaining and propagating their principles. They infused into all their votaries an extreme hatred against the queen, whom they treated as a usurper, a schismatic, a heretic, a persecutor of the orthodox, and one solemnly and publicly anathemized by the Holy Father. Sedition, rebellion, sometimes assassination, were the expedients by which they intended to effect their purposes against her, and the severe restraint, not to say persecution, under which the Catholics labored, made them the more willingly receive from their ghostly fathers such violent doctrines. These seminaries were all of them under the direction of the Jesuits, a new order of regular priests erected in Europe, when the court of Rome perceived that the lazy monks and beggarly friars, who sufficed in times of ignorance, were no longer able to defend the ramparts of the church, assailed on every side, and that the inquisitive spirit of the age required a society more active and more learned to oppose its dangerous progress. These men, as they stood foremost in the contest against the Protestants, drew on them the extreme animosity of that whole sect, and by assuming a superiority over the other more numerous and more ancient orders of their own commission, were even exposed to the envy of their brethren, so that it is no wonder if the blame to which their principles and conduct might be exposed has in many instances been much exaggerated. This reproach, however, they must bear from posterity, that by the very nature of their institution they were engaged to pervert learning, the only effectual remedy against superstition, into a nourishment of that infirmity, and as their erudition was chiefly of the ecclesiastical and scholastic kind, though a few members have cultivated polite literature, they were only the more enabled by that acquisition to refine away the plainest dictates of morality, and to erect a regular system of casuistry by which prevarication, perjury, and every crime, when it served their ghostly purposes, might be justified and defended. The Jesuits, as devoted servants to the court of Rome, exalted the prerogative of the sovereign pontiff above all earthly power, and by maintaining his authority of deposing kings, set no bounds either to his spiritual or temporal jurisdiction. This doctrine became so prevalent among the zealous Catholics in England that the excommunication fulminated against Elizabeth excited many scruples of a singular kind, to which it behooved the Holy Father to provide a remedy. The bull of Pius, in absolving the subjects from their oaths of allegiance, commanded them to resist the Queen's usurpation and many Romanists were apprehensive that by this clause they were obliged in conscience, even though no favourable opportunity offered to rebel against her, and that no dangers or difficulties could free them from this indispensable duty. But Parsons and Campion, two Jesuits, were sent over with a mitigation and explanation of the doctrine, and they taught their disciples that though the bull was forever binding on Elizabeth and her partisans, it did not oblige the Catholics to obedience except when the sovereign pontiff should think proper by a new summons to require it. Campion was afterwards detected in treasonable practices, and being put to the rack and confessing his guilt, he was publicly executed. His execution was ordered at the very time when the Duke of Anjou was in England, and prosecuted with the greatest appearance of success. His marriage with the Queen and this severity was probably intended to appease her Protestant subjects, and to satisfy them, that whatever measures she might pursue, 
she would never depart from the principles of the reformation the duke of alencon now created duke of anjou had never entirely dropped his pretensions to elizabeth and that princess though her suitor was near twenty-five years younger than herself and had no knowledge of her person but by pictures or descriptions was still pleased with the image which his addresses afforded her of love and tenderness the duke in order to forward his suit besides employing his brother's ambassador sent over simier an agent of his own an artful man of an agreeable conversation who soon remarking the queen's humour amused her with gay discourse and instead of serious political reasonings which he found only awakened her ambition and hurt his master's interests he introduced every moment all the topics of passion and of gallantry the pleasure which she found in this man's company soon produced a familiarity between them and amidst the greatest hurry of business her most confidential ministers had not such ready access to her as had simier who on pretence of negotiation entertained her with accounts of the tender attachment borne her by the duke of anjou the earl of leicester who had never before been alarmed with any courtship paid her and who always trusted that her love of dominion would prevail over her inclination to marriage began to apprehend that she was at last caught in her own snare and that the artful encouragement which she had given to this young suitor had unawares engaged her affections to render simier odious he availed himself of the credulity of the times and spread reports that the minister had gained an ascendant over the queen not by any natural principles of her constitution but by incantations and love potions simier in revenge endeavoured to discredit leicester with the queen and he revealed to her a secret which none of her courtiers dared to disclose that this nobleman was secretly without her consent married to the widow of the earl of essex an action which the queen interpreted either to proceed from want of respect to her or as a violation of their mutual attachment and which so provoked her that she threatened to send him to the tower the quarrel went so far between leicester and the french agent that the former was suspected of having employed one tudor a bravo to take away the life of his enemy and the queen thought it necessary by proclamation to take simier under her immediate protection it happened that while elizabeth was rowed in her barge on the thames attended by simier and some of her courtiers a shot was fired which wounded one of the bargemen but the queen finding upon inquiry that the piece had been discharged by accident gave the person his liberty without further punishment so far was she from entertaining any suspicion against her people that she was often heard to say that she would lend credit to nothing against them which parents would not believe of their own children the duke of anjou encouraged by the accounts sent him of the queen's prepossessions in his favour paid her secretly a visit at greenwich and after some conference with her the purport of which is not known he departed it appeared that though his figure was not advantageous he had lost no ground by being personally known to her and soon after she commanded burley now treasurer sussex leicester bedford lincoln hatton and secretary walsingham to concert with the french ambassadors the terms of the intended contract of marriage henry had sent over on this occasion a splendid embassy consisting of francis de bourbon prince of dauphiny and many considerable noblemen and as the queen had in a manner the power of prescribing what terms she pleased the articles were soon settled with the english commissioners 
it was agreed that the marriage should be celebrated within six weeks after the ratification of the articles that the duke and his retinue should have the exercise of their religion that after the marriage he should bear the title of king but the administration remain solely in the queen that their children male or female should succeed to the crown of england that if there be two males the elder in case of henry's death without issue should be king of france the younger of england that if there be but one male and he succeed to the crown of france he should be obliged to reside in england eight months every two years that the laws and customs of england should be preserved inviolate and that no foreigner should be promoted by the duke to any office in england end of section twenty one chapter forty one part one section twenty two of volume one d of history of england from the invasion of julius caesar to the revolution of sixteen eighty eight this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org history of england from the invasion of julius caesar to the revolution of sixteen eighty eight by david hume volume one d section twenty two chapter forty one part two these articles providing for the security of england in case of its annexation to the crown of france opened but a dismal prospect to the english had not the age of elizabeth who was now in her forty-ninth year contributed very much to allay their apprehensions of this nature the queen also as a proof of her still remaining uncertainty added a clause that she was not bound to complete the marriage till further articles which were not specified should be agreed on between the parties and till the king of france be certified of this agreement soon after the queen sent over walsingham as ambassador to france in order to form closer connections with henry and enter into a league offensive and defensive against the increasing power and dangerous usurpations of spain the french king who had been extremely disturbed with the unquiet spirit the restless ambition the enterprising yet timid and inconstant disposition of anjou had already sought to free the kingdom from his intrigues by opening a scene for his activity in flanders and having allowed him to embrace the protection of the states had secretly supplied him with men and money for the undertaking the prospect of settling him in england was for a like reason very agreeable to that monarch and he was desirous to cultivate by every expedition the favourable sentiments which elizabeth seemed to entertain towards him but this princess though she had gone further in her amorous dalliance than could be justified or accounted for by any principles of policy was not yet determined to carry matters to a final conclusion and she confined walsingham in his instructions to negotiating conditions of a mutual alliance between france and england henry with reluctance submitted to hold conferences on the subject but no sooner had walsingham begun to settle the terms of alliance than he was informed that the queen foreseeing hostility with spain to be the result of this confederacy had declared that she would prefer the marriage with the war before the war without the marriage the french court pleased with this change of resolution broke off the conferences concerning the league and opened a negotiation for the marriage but matters had not long proceeded in this train before the queen again declared for the league in preference to the marriage and ordered walsingham to renew the conferences for that purpose before he had leisure to bring this point to maturity he was interrupted by a new change of resolution and not only the court of france but walsingham himself burleigh 
and all the wisest ministers of elizabeth were in amazement doubtful where this contest between inclination and reason love and ambition would at last terminate in the course of this affair elizabeth felt another variety of intentions from a new contest between her reason and her ruling passions the duke of anjou expected from her some money by which he might be enabled to open the campaign in flanders and the queen herself though her frugality made her long reluctant was sensible that this supply was necessary and she was at last induced after much hesitation to comply with his request she sent him a present of a hundred thousand crowns by which joined to his own domain and the assistance of his brother and the queen dowager he levied an army and took the field against the prince of parma he was successful in raising the siege of cambray and being chosen by the states governor of the netherlands he put his army into winter quarters and came over to england in order to prosecute his suit to the queen the reception which he met made him expect entire success and gave him hopes that elizabeth had surmounted all scruples and was finally determined to make choice of him for her husband in the midst of the pomp which attended the anniversary of her coronation she was seen after long and intimate discourse with him to take a ring from her own finger and to put it upon his and all the spectators concluded that in this ceremony she had given him a promise of marriage and was even desirous of signifying her intentions to all the world st aldegondi ambassador from the states dispatched immediately a letter to his masters informing them of this great event and the inhabitants of antwerp who as well as all the other flemings regarded the queen as a kind of titular divinity testified their joy by bonfires and the discharge of their great ordnance a puritan of lincoln's inn had written a passionate book which he entitled the gulf in which england will be swallowed by the french marriage he was apprehended and prosecuted by order of the queen and was condemned to lose his right hand as a libeller such was the constancy and loyalty of the man that immediately after the sentence was executed he took off his hat with the other hand and waving it over his head cried god save the queen but notwithstanding this attachment which elizabeth so openly discovered to the duke of anjou the combat of her sentiments was not entirely over and her ambition as well as prudence rousing itself by intervals still filled her breast with doubt and hesitation almost all the courtiers whom she trusted and favoured leicester hatton and walsingham discovered an extreme aversion to the marriage and the ladies of her bedchamber made no scruple of opposing her resolution with the most zealous remonstrances among other enemies to the match sir philip son of sir henry sidney deputy of ireland and nephew to leicester a young man the most accomplished of the age declared himself and he used the freedom to write her a letter in which he dissuaded her from her present resolution with an unusual elegance of expression as well as force of reasoning he told her that the security of her government depended entirely on the affection of her protestant subjects and she could not by any measure more effectually disgust them than by espousing a prince who was son of the perfidious catherine brother to the cruel and perfidious charles and who had himself imbrued his hands in the blood of the innocent and defenceless protestants that the catholics were her mortal enemies and believed either that she had originally usurped the crown or was now lawfully deposed by the pope's bull of excommunication and nothing had ever so much elevated their hopes as the prospect of her marriage with the duke of anjou 
that her chief security at present against the efforts of so numerous rich and united a faction was that they possessed no head who could conduct to their dangerous enterprises and she herself was rashly supplying that defect by giving an interest in the kingdom to a prince whose education has zealously attached him to that communion that though he was a stranger to the blood royal of england the dispositions of men were now such that they preferred the religious to the civil connections and were more influenced by sympathy in theological opinions than by the principles of legal and hereditary government that the duke himself had discovered a very restless and turbulent spirit and having often violated his loyalty to his elder brother and his sovereign there remained no hopes that he would passively submit to a woman whom he might in quality of husband think himself entitled to command that the french nation so populous so much abounding in soldiers so full of nobility who were devoted to arms and for some time accustomed to serve for plunder would supply him with partisans dangerous to a people unwarlike and defenceless like the generality of her subjects that the plain and honourable path which she had followed of cultivating the affections of her people had hitherto rendered her reign secure and happy and however her enemies might seem to multiply upon her the same invincible rampart was still able to protect and defend her that so long as the throne of france was filled by henry or his posterity it was in vain to hope that the ties of blood would ensure the amity of that kingdom preferably to the maxims of policy or the prejudices of religion and if ever the crown devolved on the duke of anjou the conjunction of france and england would prove a burden rather than a protection to the latter kingdom that the example of her sister mary was insufficient to instruct her in the danger of such connections and to prove that the affection and confidence of the english could never be maintained where they had such reason to apprehend that their interests would every moment be sacrificed to those of a foreign and hostile nation that notwithstanding these great inconveniences discovered by past experience the house of burgundy it must be confessed was more popular in the nation than the family of france and what was of chief moment philip was of the same communion with mary and was connected with her by this great band of interest and affection and that however the queen might remain childless even though old age should grow upon her the singular felicity and glory of her reign would preserve her from contempt the affections of her subjects and those of all the protestants in europe would defend her from danger and her own prudence without other aid or assistance would baffle all the efforts of her most malignant enemies these reflections kept the queen in great anxiety and irresolution and she was observed to pass several nights without any sleep or repose at last her settled habits of prudence and ambition prevailed over her temporary inclination and having sent for the duke of anjou she had a long conference with him in private where she was supposed to have made him apologies for breaking her former engagements he expressed great disgust on his leaving her threw away the ring which she had given him and uttered many curses on the mutability of women and islanders soon after he went over to his government of the netherlands lost the confidence of the states by a rash and violent attempt on their liberties was expelled that country retired into france and there died the queen by timely reflection saved herself from the numerous mischiefs which must have attended so imprudent a marriage and the distracted state of the french monarchy prevented her from feeling any effects of that resentment which she had reason to dread from the affront so wantonly put upon that royal family the anxiety of the queen from the attempts of the english catholics 
never ceased during the whole course of her reign but the variety of revolutions which happened in all the neighbouring kingdoms were the source sometimes of her hopes sometimes of her apprehensions this year the affairs of scotland strongly engaged her attention the influence which the earl of lennox and james stuart who now assumed the title of earl of arran had acquired over the young king was but a slender foundation of authority while the generality of the nobles and all the preachers were so much discontented with their administration the assembly of the church appointed a solemn fast of which one of the avowed reasons was the danger to which the king was exposed from the company of wicked persons and on that day the pulpits resounded with declamations against lennox arran and all the present councillors when the minds of the people were sufficiently prepared by these lectures a conspiracy of the nobility was formed probably with the concurrence of elizabeth for seizing the person of james at ruthven a seat at the earl of gowry's and the design being kept secret succeeded without any opposition the leaders in this enterprise were the earl of gowry himself the earl of mar the lords lindsay and boyd the masters of glamis and oliphant the abbots of dunfermling paisley and cambus kenneth the king wept when he found himself detained a prisoner but the master of glamis said no matter for his tears better that boys weep than bearded men an expression which james could never afterwards forgive but notwithstanding his resentment he found it necessary to submit to the present necessity he pretended an entire acquiescence in the conduct of the associators acknowledged the detention of his person to be acceptable service and agreed to summon both an assembly of the church and a convention of estates in order to ratify that enterprise the assembly though they had established it as an inviolable rule that the king on no account and under no pretence should ever intermeddle in ecclesiastical matters made no scruple of taking civil affairs under their cognizance and of deciding on this occasion that the attempt of the conspirators was acceptable to all that feared god or tendered the preservation of the king's person and prosperous state of the realm they even enjoined all the clergy to recommend these sentiments from the pulpit and they threatened with ecclesiastical censures every man who should oppose the authority of the confederated lords the convention being composed chiefly of these lords themselves added their sanction to these proceedings arran was confined a prisoner in his own house lennox though he had power to resist yet rather than raise a civil war or be the cause of bloodshed chose to retire into france where he soon after died he persevered to the last in the protestant religion to which james had converted him but which the scottish clergy could never be persuaded that he had sincerely embraced the king sent for his family restored his son to his paternal honours and estate took care to establish the fortunes of all his other children and to his last moments never forgot the early friendship which he had borne their father a strong proof of the good dispositions of that prince no sooner was this revolution known in england than the queen sent sir henry gary and sir robert bowes to james in order to congratulate him on his deliverance from the pernicious counsels of lennox and arran to exhort him not to resent the seeming violence committed on him by the confederated lords and to procure from him permission for the return of the earl of angus who ever since morton's fall had lived in england they easily prevailed in procuring the recall of angus and as james suspected that elizabeth had not been entirely unacquainted with the project of his detention 
he thought proper before the english ambassadors to dissemble his resentment against the authors of it soon after la mothe fenelon and meneville appeared as ambassadors from france their errand was to inquire concerning the situation of the king make professions of their master's friendship confirm the ancient league with france and procure an accommodation between james and the queen of scots this last proposal gave great umbrage to the clergy and the assembly voted the settling of terms between the mother and son to be a most wicked undertaking the pulpits resounded with declamations against the french ambassador particularly fenelon whom they called the messenger of the bloody murderer meaning the duke of guise and as that minister being knight of the holy ghost wore a white cross on his shoulder they commonly denominated it in contempt the badge of antichrist the king endeavoured though in vain to repress these insolent reflections but in order to make the ambassadors some compensation he desired the magistrates of edinburgh to give them a splendid dinner before their departure to prevent this entertainment the clergy appointed that very day for a public fast and finding that their orders were not regarded they employed their sermons in thundering curses on the magistrates who by the king's direction had put this mark of respect on the ambassadors they even pursued them afterwards with the censures of the church and it was with difficulty they were prevented from issuing the sentence of excommunication against them on account of their submission to royal preferably to clerical authority what increased their alarm with regard to an accommodation between james and mary was that the english ambassadors seemed to concur with the french in this proposal and the clergy were so ignorant as to believe the sincerity of the professions made by the former the queen of scots had often made overtures to elizabeth which had been entirely neglected but hearing of james detention she wrote a letter in a more pathetic and more spirited strain than usual craving the assistance of that princess both for her own and her son's liberty she said that the account of the prince's captivity had excited her most tender concern and the experience which she herself during so many years had of the extreme infelicity attending that situation had made her the more apprehensive lest a like fate should pursue her unhappy offspring that the long train of injustice which she had undergone the calumnies to which she had been exposed were so grievous that finding no place for right or truth among men she was reduced to make her last appeal to heaven the only competent tribunal between princes of equal jurisdiction degree and dignity that after her rebellious subjects secretly instigated by elizabeth's ministers had expelled her the throne had confined her in prison had pursued her with arms she had voluntarily thrown herself under the protection of england fatally allured by those reiterated professions of amity which had been made her and by her confidence in the generosity of a friend an ally and a kinswoman that not content with excluding her from her presence with supporting the usurpers of her throne with contributing to the destruction of her faithful subjects elizabeth had reduced her to a worse captivity than that from which she had escaped and made her this cruel return for the unlimited confidence which she had reposed in her that though her resentment of such severe usage had never carried her further than to use some disappointed efforts for her deliverance unhappy for herself and fatal to others she found the rigours of confinement daily multiplied upon her and at length carried to such a height that it surpassed the bounds of all human patience any longer to endure them that she was cut off from all communication not only with the rest of mankind but with her only son 
and her maternal fondness which was now more enlivened with their unhappy sympathy in situation and was her sole remaining attachment to this world deprived of even that melancholy solace which letters or messages could give that the bitterness of her sorrows still more than her close confinement had preyed upon her health and had added the insufferable weight of body infirmity to all those other calamities under which she labored that while the daily experience of her maladies opened to her the comfortable prospect of an approaching deliverance into a region where pain and sorrow are no more her enemies envied her that last consolation and having secluded her from every joy on earth had done what in them lay to debar her from all hopes in her future and eternal existence that the exercise of her religion was refused her the use of those sacred rites in which she had been educated the commerce with those holy ministers whom heaven had appointed to receive the acknowledgment of our transgressions and to seal our penitence by a solemn readmission into heavenly favour and forgiveness that it was in vain to complain of the rigours of persecution exercised in other kingdoms when a queen and an innocent woman was excluded from an indulgence which never yet in the most barbarous countries had been denied to the meanest and most obnoxious malefactor that she could ever be induced to descend from that royal dignity in which providence had placed her or depart from her appeal to heaven there was only one other tribunal to which she would appeal from all her enemies to the justice and humanity of elizabeth's own breast and to that lenity which uninfluenced by malignant counsel she would naturally be induced to exercise towards her and that she finally entreated her to resume her natural disposition and to reflect on the support as well as comfort which she might receive from her son and herself if joining the obligations of gratitude to the ties of blood she would deign to raise them from their present melancholy situation and reinstate them in that liberty and authority to which they were entitled End of section 22, chapter 41, part 2. Section 23 of volume 1D of History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688 by David Hume, Volume 1D, Section 23, Chapter 41, Part 3. Elizabeth was engaged to obstruct Mary's restoration, chiefly because she foresaw an unhappy alternative attending that event. If this princess recovered any considerable share of authority in Scotland, her resentment, ambition, zeal, and connections, both domestic and foreign, might render her a dangerous neighbour to England, and enable her, after suppressing the Protestant party among her subjects, to revive those pretensions which she had formerly advanced to the crown, and which her partisans in both kingdoms still supported with great industry and assurance if she were reinstated in power with such strict limitations as could not be broken she might be disgusted with her situation and flying abroad form more desperate attempts than any sovereign who had a crown to hazard would willingly undertake mary herself sensible of these difficulties and convinced by experience that elizabeth would forever debar her the throne was now become more humble in her wishes, and as age and infirmities had repressed those sentiments of ambition by which she had formerly been so much actuated, she was willing to sacrifice all her hopes of grandeur, 
in order to obtain a liberty a blessing to which she naturally aspired with the fondest impatience she proposed therefore that she should be associated with her son in the title to the crown of scotland but that the administration should remain solely in him and she was content to live in england in a private station and even under a kind of restraint but with some more liberty both for exercise and company than she had enjoyed since the first discovery of her intrigues with the duke of norfolk but elizabeth afraid lest such a loose method of guarding her would facilitate her escape into france or spain or at least would encourage and increase her partisans and enable her to conduct those intrigues to which she had already discovered so strong a propensity was secretly determined to deny her requests and though she feigned to assent to them she well knew how to disappoint the expectations of the unhappy princess while lennox maintained his authority in scotland she never gave any reply to all the application made to her by the scottish queen at present when her own creatures had acquired possession of the government she was resolved to throw the odium of refusal upon them and pretending that nothing further was required to a perfect accommodation than the concurrence of the council of state in scotland she ordered her ambassador bowes to open the negotiation for mary's liberty and her association with the son in the title to the crown though she seemed to make this concession to mary she refused her the liberty of sending any ambassador of her own and that princess could easily conjecture from this circumstance what would be the result of the pretended negotiation the privy council of scotland instigated by the clergy rejected all treaty and james who was now a captive in their hands affirmed that he had never agreed to an association with his mother and that the matter had never gone further than some loose proposals for that purpose the affairs of scotland remained not long in the present situation james impatient of restraint made his escape from his keepers and flying to st andrews summoned his friends and partisans to attend him the earls of argyle marshal montrose and rothes hastened to pay their duty to their sovereign and the opposite party found themselves unable to resist so powerful a combination they were offered a pardon upon their submission and an acknowledgment of their fault in seizing the king's person and restraining him from his liberty some of them accepted of the terms the greater number particularly angus hamilton mar glamis left the country and took shelter in ireland or england where they were protected by elizabeth the earl of arran was recalled to court and the malcontents who could not brook the authority of lennox a man of virtue and moderation found that by their resistance they had thrown all power into the hands of a person whose counsels were as violent as his manners were profligate elizabeth wrote a letter to james in which she quoted a moral sentence from isocrates and indirectly reproached him with inconstancy and a breach of his engagements james in his reply justified his measures and retaliated by turning two passages of isocrates against her she next sent walsingham on an embassy to him and her chief purpose in employing that aged minister in an errand where so little business was to be transacted was to learn from a man of so much penetration and experience the real character of james this young prince possessed good parts though not accompanied with that vigour and industry which his station required and as he excelled in general discourse and conversation walsingham entertained a higher idea of his talents than he was afterwards found when real business was transacted to have fully merited the account which he gave his mistress induced her to treat james thenceforth with some more regard 
than she had hitherto been inclined to pay him the king of scots persevering in his present views summoned a parliament where it was enacted that no clergyman should presume in his sermons to utter false untrue or scandalous speeches against the king the council or the public measures or to meddle in an improper manner with the affairs of his majesty and the states the clergy finding that the pulpit would no longer be a sanctuary for them were extremely offended they said that the king was become popish in his heart and they gave their adversaries the epithets of gross libertines belly gods and infamous persons the violent conduct of arran soon brought over the popularity to their side the earl of gowry though pardoned for the late attempt was committed to prison was tried on some new accusations condemned and executed many innocent persons suffered from the tyranny of this favourite and the banished lords being assisted by elizabeth now found the time favourable for the recovery of their estates and authority after they had been foiled in one attempt upon stirling they prevailed in another and being admitted to the king's presence were pardoned and restored to his favour arran was degraded from authority deprived of that estate and title which he had usurped and the whole country seemed to be composed to tranquillity elizabeth after opposing during some time the credit of the favourite had found it more expedient before his fall to compound all differences with him by means of davison a minister whom she sent to scotland but having more confidence in the lords whom she had helped to restore she was pleased with this alteration of affairs and maintained a good correspondence with the new court and ministry of james these revolutions in scotland would have been regarded as of small importance to the repose and security of elizabeth had her own subjects been entirely united and had not the zeal of the catholics excited by constraint more properly than persecution daily threatened her with some dangerous insurrection the vigilance of the ministers particularly of burleigh and walsingham was raised in proportion to the activity of the malcontents and many arts which had been blamable in a more peaceable government were employed in detecting conspiracies and even discovering the secret inclinations of men counterfeit letters were written in the name of the queen of scots or of the english exiles and privately conveyed to the houses of the catholics spies were hired to observe the actions and discourse of suspected persons informers were countenanced and though the sagacity of these two great ministers helped them to distinguish the true from the false intelligence many calumnies were no doubt hearkened to and all the subjects particularly the catholics kept in the utmost anxiety and inquietude henry piercy earl of northumberland brother to the earl beheaded some years before and philip howard earl of arundel son of the unfortunate duke of norfolk fell under suspicion and the latter was by order of council confined to his own house francis throgmorton a private gentleman was committed to custody on account of a letter which he had written to the queen of scots and which was intercepted lord paget and charles arundel who had been engaged with him in treasonable designs immediately withdrew beyond sea throgmorton confessed that a plan for an invasion and insurrection had been laid and though on his trial he was desirous of retracting this confession and imputing it to the fear of torture he was found guilty and executed mendoza the spanish ambassador having promoted this conspiracy was ordered to depart the kingdom and wade was sent into spain to excuse his dismission and to desire the king to send another ambassador in his place but philip would not so much as admit the english ambassador to his presence 
Crichton, a Scottish Jesuit, coming over on board a vessel which was seized, tore some papers with an intention of throwing them into the sea, but the wind blowing them back upon the ship they were pieced together and discovered some dangerous secrets. Many of these conspiracies were, with great appearance of reason, imputed to the intrigues of the Queen of Scots, and as her name was employed in all of them, the council thought that they could not use too many precautions against the danger of her claims, and the restless activity of her temper. She was removed from under the care of the Earl of Shrewsbury, who, though vigilant and faithful in that trust, had also been indulgent to his prisoner, particularly with regard to air and exercise, and she was committed to the custody of Sir Amias Paulet and Sir Drew Drury, men of honour but inflexible in their care and attention. An association was also set on foot by the Earl of Leicester and other courtiers, and as Elizabeth was beloved by the whole nation except the more zealous Catholics, men of all ranks willingly flocked to the subscription of it. The purport of this association was to defend the queen, to revenge her death or any injury committed against her, and to exclude from the throne all claimants, what title soever they might possess, by whose suggestion, or for whose behoof, any violence should be offered to her majesty. The Queen of Scots was sensible that this association was levelled against her, and to remove all suspicion from herself, she also desired leave to subscribe it. Elizabeth, that she might the more discourage malcontents by showing them the concurrence of the nation in her favour, summoned a new Parliament, and she met with that dutiful attachment which she expected. The association was confirmed by Parliament, and a clause was added by which the Queen was empowered to name commissioners for the trial of any pretender to the Crown, who should attempt or imagine any invasion, insurrection, or assassination against her. Upon condemnation pronounced by these commissioners, the guilty person was excluded from all claim to the succession, and was further punishable as Her Majesty should direct and for greater security a council of regency in case of the queen's violent death was appointed to govern the kingdom to settle the succession and to take vengeance for that act of treason a severe law was also enacted against jesuits and popish priests it was ordained that they should depart the kingdom within forty days that those who should remain beyond that time, or should afterwards return, should be guilty of treason, that those who harboured or relieved them should be guilty of felony, that those who were educated in seminaries, if they returned not in six months after notice given, and submitted not themselves to the queen, before a bishop or two justices, should be guilty of treason, and that if any so submitting themselves should within ten years approach the court or come within ten miles of it their submission should be void by this law the exercise of the catholic religion which had formerly been prohibited under lighter penalties and which was in many instances connived at was totally suppressed in the subsequent part of the queen's reign the law was sometimes executed by the capital punishment of priests, and though the partisans of the princess asserted that they were punished for their treason, not their religion, the apology must only be understood in this sense, that the law was enacted on account of the treasonable views and attempts of the sect, not that every individual who suffered the penalty of the law was convicted of treason. The Catholics, therefore, might now with justice complain of a violent persecution, which we may safely affirm, in spite of the rigid and bigoted maxims of that age, not to be the best method of converting them, or of reconciling them to the established government and religion.
the parliament besides arming the queen with these powers granted her a supply of one subsidy and two fifteenths the only circumstances in which their proceedings were disagreeable to her was an application made by the commons for a further reformation in ecclesiastical matters yet even in this attempt which affected her as well as them in a delicate point they discovered how much they were overawed by her authority the majority of the house were puritans or inclined to that sect but the severe reprimands which they had already in former sessions met with from the throne deterred them from introducing any bill concerning religion a proceeding which would have been interpreted as an encroachment on the prerogative they were content to proceed by way of humble petition and that not addressed to her majesty which would have given offence but to the house of lords or rather the bishops who had a seat in that house and from whom alone they were willing to receive all advances towards reformation a strange departure from what we now apprehend to be the dignity of the commons the commons desired in their humble position that no bishop should exercise his function of ordination but with the consent and concurrence of six presbyters but this demand as it really introduced a change of ecclesiastical government was firmly rejected by the prelates they desired that no clergyman should be instituted into any benefice without previous notice being given to the parish that they might examine whether there lay any objection to his life or doctrine an attempt towards a popular model which naturally met with the same fate in another article of the petition they prayed that the bishops should not insist upon every ceremony or deprive incumbents for omitting part of the service as if uniformity in public worship had not been established by law or as if the prelates had been endowed with a dispensing power they complained of abuses which prevailed in pronouncing the sentence of excommunication and they entreated the reverend fathers to think of some law for the remedy of these abuses implying that those matters were too high for the commons of themselves to attempt but the most material article which the commons touched upon in their petition was the court of ecclesiastical commission and the oath ex officio as it was known exacted by that court this is a subject of such important as to merit some explanation the first primate after the queen's accession was parker a man rigid in exacting conformity to the established worship and in punishing by fine or deprivation all the puritanical clergymen who attempted to innovate anything in the habits ceremonies or liturgy of the church he died in fifteen seventy five and was succeeded by grindal who as he himself was inclined to the new sect was with great difficulty brought to execute the laws against them or to punish the non-conforming clergy he declined obeying the queen's orders for the suppression of prophesyings or the assemblies of the zealots in private houses which she apprehended had become so many academies of fanaticism and for this offence she had by an order of the star chamber sequestered him from his archiepiscopal function and confined him to his own house upon his death which happened in fifteen eighty three she determined not to fall into the same error in her next choice and she named whitgift a zealous churchman who had already signalized his pen in controversy and who having in vain attempted to convince the puritans by argument was now resolved to open their eyes by power and by the execution of penal statutes he informed the queen that all the spiritual authority lodged in the prelates was insignificant without the sanction of the crown 
and as there was no ecclesiastical commission at that time in force, he engaged her to issue a new one, more arbitrary than any of the former, and conveying more unlimited authority. She appointed forty-four commissioners, twelve of whom were ecclesiastics. Three commissioners made a quorum. The jurisdiction of the court extended over the whole kingdom and over all orders of men, and every circumstance of its authority and all its methods of proceeding were contrary to the clearest principles of law and natural equity. The commissioners were empowered to visit and reform all errors, heresies, schisms, in a word, to regulate all opinions, as well as to punish all breaches of uniformity in the exercise of public worship. They were directed to make inquiry not only by the legal methods of juries and witnesses, but by all other means and ways which they could devise, that is, by the rack, by torture, by inquisition, by imprisonment. Where they found reason to suspect any person, they might administer to him an oath, called ex officio, by which he was bound to answer all questions, and might thereby be obliged to accuse himself or his most intimate friend. The fines which they levied were discretionary, and often occasioned the total ruin of the offender, contrary to the established laws of the kingdom. The imprisonment to which they condemned any delinquent was limited by no rule but their own pleasure. They assumed a power of imposing on the clergy what new articles of subscription, and consequently of faith, they thought proper. Though all other spiritual courts were subject, since the Reformation, to inhibitions from the supreme courts of law, the ecclesiastical commissioners were exempted from that legal jurisdiction, and were liable to no control, and the more to enlarge their authority, they were empowered to punish all incests, adulteries, fornications, all outrages, misbehaviours, and disorders in marriage, and the punishments which they might inflict were according to their wisdom, conscience, and direction. In a word, this court was a real inquisition, attended with all the iniquities as well as cruelties inseparable from that tribunal, and as the jurisdiction of the ecclesiastical court was destructive of all law, so its erection was deemed by many a mere usurpation of this imperious princess, and had no other foundation than a clause of statute, restoring the supremacy to the crown and empowering the sovereign to appoint commissioners for exercising that prerogative. But prerogative in general, especially the supremacy, was supposed in that age to involve powers which no law, precedent, or reason could limit and determine. End of section 23, chapter 41, part 3. Section 24 of Volume 1D of History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688 by David Hume. Volume 1D section twenty four chapter forty one part four but though the commons in their humble petition to the prelates had touched so gently and submissively on the ecclesiastical grievances the queen in a speech from the throne at the end of the session could not forbear taking notice of their presumption and reproving them for those murmurs which for fear of offending her they had pronounced so low as not directly to reach her royal ears. After giving them some general thanks for their attachment to her, and making professions of affection to her subjects, she told them that whoever found fault with the church threw a slander upon her, 
since she was appointed by God supreme ruler over it, and no heresies or schisms could prevail in the kingdom but by her permission and negligence, that some abuses must necessarily have place in everything. But she warned the prelates to be watchful, for if she found them careless of their charge, she was fully determined to depose them, that she was commonly supposed to have employed herself in many studies, particularly philosophical, by which I suppose she meant theological, and she would confess that few whose leisure had not allowed them to make profession of science had read or reflected more, that as she could discern the presumption of many in curiously canvassing the scriptures and starting innovations, she would no longer endure this licentiousness, but meant to guide her people by God's rule in the just mean between the corruptions of Rome and the errors of modern sectaries, and that as the Romanists were the inveterate enemies of her person, so the other innovators were dangerous to all kingly government, and under colour of preaching the word of God, presumed to exercise their private judgment and to censure the actions of the prince. From the whole of this transaction we may observe that the commons, in making their general application to the prelates, as well as in some particular articles of their petition, showed themselves wholly ignorant, no less than the queen, of the principles of liberty and a legal constitution. And it may not be unworthy of remark that Elizabeth, so far from yielding to the displeasure of the parliament against the ecclesiastical commission granted before the end of her reign a new commission in which she enlarged rather than restrained the powers of the commissioners during this session of parliament there was discovered a conspiracy which much increased the general animosity against the catholics and still further widened the breach between the religious parties. William Parry, a Catholic gentleman, had received the Queen's pardon for a crime by which he was exposed to capital punishment, and having obtained permission to travel, he retired to Milan, and made open profession of his religion, which he had concealed while he remained in England. He was here persuaded by Palmio, a Jesuit, that he could not perform a more meritorious action than to take away the life of his sovereign and his benefactress. The nuncio Campeggio, when consulted, approved extremely of this pious undertaking, and Parry, though still agitated with doubts, came to Paris with an intention of passing over to England and executing his bloody purpose. He was here encouraged in the design by Thomas Morgan, a gentleman of great credit in the party, and though Watts and some other Catholic priests told him that the enterprise was criminal and impious, he preferred the authority of Ragazzoni, the nuncio at Paris, and determined to persist in his resolution. He here wrote a letter to the Pope, which was conveyed to Cardinal Como. He communicated his intention to the Holy Father, and craved his absolution and paternal benediction. He received an answer from the Cardinal, by which he found that his purpose was extremely applauded, and he came over to England with the full design of carrying it into execution. So deeply are the sentiments of morality engraved in the human breast, that it is difficult even for the prejudices of false religion totally to efface them, and this bigoted assassin resolved, before he came to extremities, to try every other expedient for alleviating the persecutions under which the Catholics at that time laboured. He found means of being introduced to the Queen assured her that many conspiracies were formed against her, and exhorted her, as she tendered her life, to give the Romans some more indulgence in the exercise of their religion. But lest he should be tempted by the opportunity to assassinate her, 
he always came to court unprovided with every offensive weapon he even found means to be elected member of parliament and having made a vehement harangue against the severe laws enacted this last session was committed to custody for his freedom and sequestered from the house his failure in these attempts confirmed him the more in his former resolution and he communicated his intentions to neville who entered zealously into the design and was determined to have a share in the merits of its execution a book newly published by dr allen afterwards created a cardinal served further to efface all their scruples with regard to the murder of an heretical prince and having agreed to shoot the queen while she should be taking the air on horseback they resolved if they could not make their escape to sacrifice their lives in fulfilling a duty so agreeable as they imagined to the will of god and to true religion but while they were watching an opportunity for the execution of their purpose the earl of westmoreland happened to die in exile and as neville was next heir to that family he began to entertain hopes that by doing some acceptable service to the queen he might recover the estate and honours which had been forfeited by the rebellion of the last earl he betrayed the whole conspiracy to the ministers and parry being thrown into prison confessed the guilt both to them and to the jury who tried him the letter from cardinal como being produced in court put parry's narrative beyond all question and that criminal having received sentence of death suffered the punishment which the law appointed for his treasonable conspiracy these bloody designs now appeared everywhere as the result of that bigoted spirit by which the two religions especially the catholic were at this time actuated somerville a gentleman of the county of warwick somewhat disordered in his understanding had heard so much of the merit attending the assassination of heretics and persecutors that he came to london with a view of murdering the queen but having betrayed his design by some extravagances he was thrown into prison and there perished by voluntary death about the same time balthazar gerard a burgundian undertook and executed the same design against the prince of orange and that great man perished at delft by the hands of a desperate assassin who with a resolution worthy of a better cause sacrificed his own life in order to destroy the famous restorer and protector of religious liberty the flemings who regarded that prince as their father were filled with great sorrow as well when they considered the miserable end of so brave a patriot as in their own forlorn condition from the loss of so powerful and prudent a leader and from the rapid progress of the spanish arms the prince of parma had made every year great advances upon them had reduced several of the provinces to obedience and had laid close siege to antwerp the richest and most populous city of the netherlands whose subjection it was foreseen would give a mortal blow to the already declining affairs of the revolted provinces the only hopes which remained to them arose from the prospect of foreign succour being well acquainted with the cautious and frugal maxims of elizabeth they expected better success in france and in the view of engaging henry to embrace their defence they tendered him the sovereignty of their provinces but the present condition of that monarchy obliged the king to reject so advantageous an offer the duke of anjou's death which he thought would have tended to restore public tranquillity in delivering him from the intrigues of that prince plunged him into the deepest distress and the king of navarre a professed huguenot being next heir to the crown the duke of guise took thence occasion to revive the catholic league and to urge henry by the most violent expedients 
to seek the exclusion of that brave and virtuous prince henry himself though a zealous catholic yet because he declined complying with their precipitate measures became an object of aversion to the league and as his zeal in practising all the superstitious observances of the romish church was accompanied with a very licentious conduct in private life the catholic faction in contradiction to universal experience embraced thence the pretext of representing his devotion as mere deceit and hypocrisy finding his authority to decline he was obliged to declare war against the huguenots and to put arms into the hands of the league whom both on account of their dangerous pretensions at home and their close alliance with philip he secretly regarded as his more dangerous enemies constrained by the same policy he dreaded the danger of associating himself with the revolted protestants in the low countries and was obliged to renounce that inviting opportunity of revenging himself for all the hostile intrigues and enterprises of philip the states reduced to this extremity sent over a solemn embassy to london and made anew an offer to the queen of acknowledging her for their sovereign on condition of obtaining her protection and assistance elizabeth's wisest counsellors were divided in opinion with regard to the conduct which she should hold in this critical and important emergence some advised her to reject the offer of the states and represented the imminent dangers as well as injustice attending the acceptance of it they said that the suppression of rebellious subjects was the common cause of all sovereigns and any encouragement given to the revolt of the flemings might prove the example of a like pernicious license to the english and that though princes were bound by the laws of the supreme being not to oppress their subjects the people never were entitled to forget all duty to their sovereign or transfer from every fancy or disgust or even from the justest ground of complaint their obedience to any other master that the queen in the succours hitherto afforded the flemings had considered them as labouring under oppression not as entitled to freedom and had intended only to admonish philip not to persevere in his tyranny without any view of ravishing from him those provinces which he enjoyed by hereditary right from his ancestors that her situation in ireland and even in england would afford that powerful monarch sufficient opportunity of retaliating upon her and she must thenceforth expect that instead of secretly fomenting faction he would openly employ his whole force in the protection and defence of the catholics that the pope would undoubtedly unite his spiritual arms to the temporal ones of spain and that the queen would soon repent her making so precarious an acquisition in foreign countries by exposing her own dominions to the most imminent danger other counsellors of elizabeth maintained a contrary opinion they asserted that the queen had not even from the beginning of her reign but certainly had not at present the choice whether she would embrace friendship or hostility with philip that by the whole tenor of that prince's conduct it appeared that his sole aims were the extending of his empire and the entire subjection of the protestants under the specious pretence of maintaining the catholic faith that the provocations which she had already given him joined to his general scheme of policy would forever render him her implacable enemy and as soon as he had subdued his revolted subjects he would undoubtedly fall with the whole force of his united empire on her defenceless state that the only question was whether she would maintain a war abroad and supported by allies 
or wait until the subjection of all the confederates of england should give her enemies leisure to begin their hostilities in the bowels of the kingdom that the revolted princes though in a declining condition possessed still considerable force and by the assistance of england by the advantages of their situation and by their inveterate antipathy to philip might still be enabled to maintain the contest against the spanish monarchy that their maritime power united to the queen's would give her entire security on the side from which alone she could be assaulted and would even enable her to make inroads on philip's dominions both in europe and the indies that a war which was necessary could never be unjust and self-defence was concerned as well in preventing certain dangers at a distance as in repelling any immediate invasion and that since hostility with spain was the unavoidable consequence of the present interests and situations of the two monarchies it were better to compensate that danger and loss by the acquisition of such important provinces to the english empire amidst these opposite councils the queen apprehensive of the consequences attending each extreme was inclined to steer a middle course and though such conduct is seldom prudent she was not in this resolution guided by any prejudice or mistaken affection she was determined not to permit without opposition the total subjection of the revolted provinces whose interests she deemed so closely connected with her own but foreseeing that the acceptance of their sovereignty would oblige her to employ her whole force in their defence would give umbrage to her neighbours and would expose her to the reproach of ambition and usurpation imputations which hitherto she had carefully avoided she immediately rejected this offer she concluded a league with the states on the following conditions that she should send over an army to their assistance of five thousand foot and a thousand horse and pay them during the war that the general and to others whom she should appoint should be admitted into the council of the states that neither party should make peace without the consent of the other that her expenses should be refunded after the conclusion of the war and that the towns of flushing and the Breal, with the castle of ramekins should in the meantime be consigned into her hands by the way of security the queen knew that this measure would immediately engage her in open hostilities with philip yet was not she terrified with the view of the present greatness of that monarch the continent of spain was at that time rich and populous and the late addition of portugal besides securing internal tranquillity had annexed an opulent kingdom to philip's dominions had made him master of many settlements in the east indies and of the whole commerce of those regions and had much increased his naval power in which he was before chiefly deficient all the princes of italy even the pope and the court of rome were reduced to a kind of subjection under him and seemed to possess their sovereignty on terms somewhat precarious the austrian branch in germany with their dependent principalities was closely connected with him and was ready to supply him with troops for every enterprise all the treasures of the west indies were in his possession and the present scarcity of the precious metals in every country of europe rendered the influence of his riches the more forcible and extensive the netherlands seemed on the point of relapsing into servitude and small hopes were entertained of their withstanding those numerous and veteran armies which under the command of the most experienced generals he employed against them even france which was wont to counterbalance the austrian greatness had lost all her force from intestine commotions 
and as the catholics the ruling party were closely connected with him he rather expected thence an augmentation than a diminution of his power upon the whole such prepossessions were everywhere entertained concerning the force of the spanish monarchy that the king of sweden when he heard that elizabeth had openly embraced the defence of the revolted flemings scrupled not to say that she had now taken the diadem from her head and adventured it upon the doubtful chance of war yet was this princess rather cautious than enterprising in her natural temper she ever needed more to be impelled by the vigour than restrained by the prudence of her ministers but when she saw an evident necessity she braved danger with magnanimous courage and trusting to her own consummate wisdom and to the affections however divided of her people she prepared herself to resist and even to assault the whole force of the catholic monarch the earl of leicester was sent over to holland at the head of the english auxiliary forces he carried with him a splendid retinue being accompanied by the young earl of essex his son-in-law the lords audley and north sir william russell sir thomas shirley sir arthur bassett sir walter weller sir gervase clifton and a select troop of five hundred gentlemen he was received on his arrival at flushing by his nephew sir philip sidney the governor and every town through which he passed expressed their joy by acclamations and triumphal arches as if his presence and the queen's protection had brought them the most certain deliverance the states desirous of engaging elizabeth still further in their defence and knowing the interest which leicester possessed with her conferred on him the title of governor and captain-general of the united provinces appointed a guard to attend him and treated him in some respects as their sovereign but this step had a contrary effect to what they expected the queen was displeased with the artifice of the states and the ambition of leicester she severely reprimanded both and it was with some difficulty that after many humble admissions they were able to appease her End of section twenty four chapter forty one part four Section twenty five of volume one d of History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of sixteen eighty eight. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of sixteen eighty eight by David Hume. Volume one d, section twenty five chapter forty one part five america was regarded as the chief source of philip's power as well as the most defenceless part of his dominions and elizabeth finding that an open breach with that monarch was unavoidable resolved not to leave him unmolested in that quarter the great success of the spaniards and portuguese in both indies had excited a spirit of emulation in england and as the progress of commerce still more that of colonies is slow and gradual it was happy that a war in this critical period had opened a more flattering prospect to the avarice and ambition of the english and had tempted them by the views of sudden and exorbitant profit to engage in naval enterprises a fleet of twenty sail was equipped to attack the Spaniards in the West Indies. Two thousand three hundred volunteers, besides seamen, engaged on board of it. Sir Francis Drake was appointed admiral, Christopher Carlyle commander of the land forces. They took St. Jago near Cape Verde by surprise, and found in it plenty of provisions, but no riches, they sailed to hispaniola and easily making themselves master of st domingo by assault 
obliged the inhabitants to ransom their houses by a sum of money cartagena fell next into their hands after some more resistance and was treated in the same manner they burnt st anthony and st helens two towns on the coast of florida sailing along the coast of virginia they found the small remains of a colony which had been planted there by sir walter raleigh and which had gone extremely to decay this was the first attempt of the english to form such settlements and though they have since surpassed all european nations both in the situation of their colonies and in the noble principles of liberty and industry on which they are founded they had here been so unsuccessful that the miserable planters abandoned their settlements and prevailed on drake to carry them with him to england he returned with so much riches as encouraged the volunteers and with such accounts of the spanish weakness in those countries as served extremely to inflame the spirits of the nation to future enterprises the great mortality which the climate had produced in his fleet was as is usual but a feeble restraint on the avidity and sanguine hopes of young adventurers it is thought that drake's fleet first introduced the use of tobacco into england the enterprises of leicester were much less successful than those of drake this man possessed neither courage nor capacity equal to the trust reposed in him by the queen and as he was the only bad choice she made for any considerable employment men naturally believed that she had here been influenced by an affection still more partial than that of friendship he gained at first some advantage in an action against the spaniards and threw succors into grave by which that place was enabled to make a vigorous defence but the cowardice of the governor van hemert rendered all these efforts useless he capitulated after a feeble resistance and being tried for his conduct suffered a capital punishment from the sentence of a court-martial the prince of parma next undertook the siege of venlo which was surrendered to him after some resistance the fate of noise was more dismal being taken by assault while the garrison was treating of a capitulation rimberg which was garrisoned by twelve hundred english under the command of colonel morgan was afterwards besieged by the spaniards and leicester thinking himself too weak to attempt raising the siege endeavoured to draw off the prince of parma by forming another enterprise he first attacked Duisburg and succeeded. He then sat down before Zutphen, which the Spanish general thought so important a fortress that he hastened to its relief. He made the Marquis of Guasto advance with a convoy which he intended to throw into the place. They were favoured by a fog, but falling by accident on a body of English cavalry, a furious action ensued in which the Spaniards were worsted, and the Marquis of Gonzaga, an Italian nobleman of great reputation and family, was slain. The pursuit was stopped by the advance of the Prince of Parma with the main body of the Spanish army, and the English cavalry, on their return from the field, found their advantage more than compensated by the loss of Sir Philip Sidney, who, being mortally wounded in the action was carried off by the soldiers and soon after died this person is described by the writers of that age as the most perfect model of an accomplished gentleman that could be formed even by the wanton imagination of poetry or fiction virtuous conduct polite conversation heroic valour and elegant erudition all concurred to render him the ornament and delight of the english court and as the credit which he possessed with the queen and the earl of leicester was wholly employed in the encouragement of genius and literature his praises have been transmitted with advantage to posterity no person was so low as not to become an object of his humanity 
after this last action while he was lying on the field mangled with wounds a bottle of water was brought him to relieve his thirst but observing a soldier near him in a like miserable condition he said this man's necessity is still greater than mine and resigned to him the bottle of water the king of scots struck with admiration of sidney's virtue celebrated his memory in a copy of latin verses which he composed on the death of that young hero the english though a long peace had deprived them of all experience were strongly possessed of military genius and the advantages gained by the prince of parma were not attributed to the superior bravery and discipline of the spaniards but solely to the want of military abilities in leicester the states were much discontented with his management of the war still more with his arbitrary and imperious conduct and at the end of the campaign they applied to him for a redress of all their grievances but leicester without giving them any satisfaction departed soon after for england the queen while she provoked so powerful an enemy as the king of spain was not forgetful to secure herself on the side of scotland and she endeavoured both to cultivate the friendship and alliance of her kinsman james and to remove all grounds of quarrel between them an attempt which she had made some time before was not well calculated to gain the confidence of that prince she had dispatched wotton as her ambassador to scotland but though she gave him private instructions with regard to her affairs she informed james that when she had any political business to discuss with him she would employ another minister that this man was not fitted for serious negotiations and that her chief purpose in sending him was to entertain the king with witty and facetious conversation and to partake without reserve of his pleasures and amusements wotton was master of profound dissimulation and knew how to cover under the appearance of a careless gaiety the deepest designs and most dangerous artifices when but a youth of twenty he had been employed by his uncle dr wotton ambassador in france during the reign of mary to ensnare the constable montmorency and had not his purpose been frustrated by pure accident his cunning had prevailed over all the caution and experience of that aged minister it is no wonder that after years had improved him in all the arts of deceit he should gain an ascendant over a young prince of so open and unguarded a temper as james especially when the queen's recommendation prepared the way for his reception he was admitted into all the pleasures of the king made himself master of his secrets and had so much the more authority with him in political transactions as he did not seem to pay the least attention to these matters the scottish ministers who observed the growing interest of this man endeavoured to acquire his friendship and scrupled not to sacrifice to his intrigues the most essential interests of their master elizabeth's usual jealousies with regard to her heirs began now to be levelled against james and as that prince had attained the years proper for marriage she was apprehensive lest by being strengthened by children and alliances he should acquire the greater interest and authority with her english subjects she directed wotton to form a secret concert with some scottish noblemen and to procure their promise that james during three years should not on any account be permitted to marry in consequence of this view they endeavoured to embroil him with the king of denmark who had sent ambassadors to scotland on pretence of demanding restitution of the orkneys but really with a view of opening a proposal of marriage between james and his daughter wotton is said to have employed his intrigues to purposes still more dangerous 
he formed it is pretended a conspiracy with some malcontents to seize the person of the king and to deliver him into the hands of elizabeth who would probably have denied all concurrence in the design but would have been sure to retain him in perpetual thraldom if not captivity the conspiracy was detected and wotton fled hastily from scotland without taking leave of the king james situation obliged him to dissemble his resentment of this traitorous attempt and his natural temper inclined him soon to forgive and forget it the queen found no difficulty in renewing the negotiations for a strict alliance between scotland and england and the more effectually to gain the prince's friendship she granted him a pension equivalent to his claim on the inheritance of his grandmother the countess of lennox lately deceased a league was formed between elizabeth and james for the mutual defence of their dominions and of their religion now menaced by the open combination of all the catholic powers of europe it was stipulated that if elizabeth were invaded james should aid her with a body of two thousand horse and five thousand foot that elizabeth in a like case should send to his assistance three thousand horse and six thousand foot that the charge of these armies should be defrayed by the prince who demanded assistance that if the invasion should be made upon england within sixty miles of the frontiers of scotland this latter kingdom should march its whole force to the assistance of the former and that the present league should supersede all former alliances of either state with any foreign kingdom so far as religion was concerned by this league james secured himself against all attempts from abroad opened a way for acquiring the confidence and affections of the english and might entertain some prospect of domestic tranquillity which while he lived on bad terms with elizabeth he could never expect long to enjoy besides the turbulent disposition and inveterate feuds of the nobility ancient maladies of the scottish government the spirit of fanaticism had introduced a new disorder so much the more dangerous as religion when corrupted by false opinion is not restrained by any rules of morality and is even scarcely to be accounted for in its operations by any principles of ordinary conduct and policy the insolence of the preachers who triumphed in their dominion over the populace had at this time reached an extreme height and they carried their arrogance so far not only against the king but against the whole civil power that they excommunicated the archbishop of st andrews because he had been active in parliament for promoting a law which restrained their seditious sermons nor could that prelate save himself by any expedient from this terrible sentence but by renouncing all pretensions to ecclesiastical authority one gibson said in the pulpit that captain james stuart meaning the late earl of arran and his wife jezebel had been deemed the chief persecutors of the church but it was now seen that the king himself was the great offender and for this crime the preacher denounced against him the curse which fell upon jeroboam that he should die childless and be the last of his race the secretary thirlstone perceiving the king so much molested with ecclesiastical affairs and with the refractory disposition of the clergy advised him to leave them to their own courses for that in a short time they would become so intolerable that the people would rise against them and drive them out of the country true replied the king if i purposed to undo the church and religion your counsel were good but my intention is to maintain both therefore i cannot suffer the clergy to follow such a conduct as it will in the end bring religion into contempt and derision end of section twenty five chapter forty one part five
Section twenty six of volume one D of History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of sixteen eighty eight. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of sixteen eighty eight by David Hume, volume one D, section twenty six. Chapter forty two, part one. Elizabeth. The dangers which arose from the character, principles, and pretensions of the Queen of Scots had very early engaged Elizabeth to consult, in her treatment of that unfortunate princess, the dictates of jealousy and politics rather than of friendship or generosity. Resentment of this usage had pushed Mary into enterprises which had nearly threatened the repose and authority of Elizabeth. The rigour and restraint thence redoubled upon the captive queen, still impelled her to attempt greater extremities, and while her impatience of confinement, her revenge and her high spirit concurred with religious zeal and the suggestions of desperate bigots, she was at last engaged in designs which afforded her enemies, who watched the opportunity, a pretense or reason for effecting her final ruin. The English seminary at Rheims had wrought themselves up to a high pitch of rage and animosity against the Queen. The recent persecutions from which they had escaped, the new rigours which they knew awaited them in the course of their missions, the liberty which for the present they enjoyed of declaiming against that princess, and the contagion of that religious fury which everywhere surrounded them in France. All these causes had obliterated with them every maxim of common sense, and every principle of morals or humanity. Intoxicated with admiration of the divine power and infallibility of the Pope, they revered his bull by which he excommunicated and deposed the queen and some of them had gone to that height of extravagance as to assert that that performance had been immediately dictated by the holy ghost the assassination of heretical sovereigns and of that princess in particular was represented as the most meritorious of all enterprises and they taught that whoever perished in such pious attempts enjoyed without dispute the glorious and never-fading crown of martyrdom by such doctrines they instigated john savage a man of desperate courage who had served some years in the low countries under the prince of parma to attempt the life of elizabeth and this assassin, having made a vow to persevere in his design, was sent over to England and recommended to the confidence of the more zealous Catholics. About the same time, John Ballard, a priest of that seminary, had returned to Paris from his mission in England and Scotland, and as he had observed a spirit of mutiny and rebellion to be very prevalent among the catholic devotees in these countries he had founded on that disposition the prospect of dethroning elizabeth and of restoring by force of arms the exercise of the ancient religion the situation of affairs abroad seemed favourable to this enterprise the pope the spaniard the duke of guise concurring in interests had formed a resolution to make some attempt against England, and Mendoza, the Spanish ambassador at Paris, strongly encouraged Ballard to hope for succours from these princes. Charles Paget alone, a zealous Catholic and a devoted partisan of the Queen of Scots, being well acquainted with the prudence, vigour, and general popularity of Elizabeth, always maintained that so long as that princess was allowed to live it was in vain to expect any success from an enterprise upon england ballard persuaded of this truth saw more clearly the necessity of executing the design formed at rheims 
he came over to england in the disguise of a soldier and assumed the name of captain fortescue and he bent his endeavours to effect at once the project of an assassination an insurrection and an invasion the first person to whom he addressed himself was antony babington of dethick in the county of derby this young gentleman was of a good family possessed a plentiful fortune had discovered an excellent capacity and was accomplished in literature beyond most of his years or station being zealously devoted to the catholic communion he had secretly made a journey to paris some time before and had fallen into intimacy with thomas morgan a bigoted fugitive from england and with the bishop of glasgow mary's ambassador at the court of france by continually extolling the amiable accomplishments and heroical virtues of that princess they impelled the sanguine and unguarded mind of young babington to make some attempt for her service and they employed every principle of ambition gallantry and religious zeal to give him a contempt of those dangers which attended any enterprise against the vigilant government of elizabeth finding him well disposed for their purpose they sent him back to england and secretly unknown to himself recommended him to the queen of scots as a person worth engaging in her service she wrote him a letter full of friendship and confidence and babington ardent in his temper and zealous in his principles thought that these advances now bound him in honour to devote himself entirely to the service of that unfortunate princess during some time he had found means of conveying to her all her foreign correspondence but after she was put under the custody of sir amias paulet and reduced to a more rigorous confinement he experienced so much difficulty and danger in rendering her this service that he had desisted from every attempt of that nature when ballard began to open his intentions to babington he found his zeal suspended not extinguished his former ardour revived on the mention of any enterprise which seemed to promise success in the cause of mary and of the catholic religion he had entertained sentiments conformable to those of paget and represented the folly of all attempts which during the lifetime of elizabeth could be formed against the established religion and government of england ballard encouraged by this hint proceeded to discover to him the design undertaken by savage and was well pleased to observe that instead of being shocked with the project babington only thought it not secure enough when entrusted to one single hand and proposed to join five others with savage in this desperate enterprise in prosecution of these views babington employed himself in increasing the number of his associates and he secretly drew into the conspiracy many catholic gentlemen discontented with the present government barnwell of a noble family in ireland charnock a gentleman of lancashire and abington whose father had been cofferer to the household readily undertook the assassination of the queen charles tilney the heir of an ancient family and titchborne of southampton when the design was proposed to them expressed some scruples which were removed by the arguments of babington and ballard savage alone refused during some time to share the glory of the enterprise with any others he challenged the whole to himself and it was with some difficulty he was induced to depart from this preposterous ambition the deliverance of the queen of scots at the very same instant when elizabeth should be assassinated was requisite for effecting the purpose of the conspirators and babington undertook with a party of a hundred horse to attack her guards while she should be taking the air on horseback 
In this enterprise he engaged Edward Windsor, brother to the lord of that name, Thomas Salisbury, Robert Gage, John Travers, John Jones, and Henry Don, most of them men of family and interest. The conspirators much wanted, but could not find, any nobleman of note whom they might place at the head of the enterprise, but they trusted that the great events of the Queen's death and Mary's deliverance would rouse all the zealous Catholics to arms, and that foreign forces taking advantage of the general confusion would easily fix the Queen of Scots on the throne and re-establish the ancient religion. These desperate projects had not escaped the vigilance of Elizabeth's council, particularly of Walsingham, Secretary of State. That artful minister had engaged Maud, a Catholic priest whom he retained in pay to attend Ballard in his journey to France, and had thereby got a hint of the designs entertained by the fugitives. Polly, another of his spies, had found means to insinuate himself among the conspirators in England, and though not entirely trusted, had obtained some insight into their dangerous secrets. But the bottom of the conspiracy was never fully known, till Gifford, a seminary priest, came over and made a tender of his services to Walsingham. By his means the discovery became of the utmost importance, and involved the fate of Mary, as well as of those zealous partisans of that princess. Babington and his associates, having laid such a plan as, they thought, promised infallible success, were impatient to communicate the design to the Queen of Scots, and to obtain her approbation and concurrence. For this service they employed Gifford, who immediately applied to Walsingham, that the interest of that minister might forward his secret correspondence with Mary. Walsingham proposed the matter to Paulette, and desired him to connive at Gifford's corrupting one of his servants. But Paulette, averse to the introducing of such a pernicious precedent into his family, desired that they would rather think of some other expedient. Gifford found a brewer, who supplied the family with ale, and bribed him to convey letters to the captive queen. The letters, by Paulette's connivance, were thrust through a chink in the wall, and answers were returned by the same conveyance. Ballard and Babington were at first diffident of Gifford's fidelity, and to make trial of him, they gave him only blank papers made up like letters. But finding by the answers that these had been faithfully delivered, they laid aside all further scruple, and conveyed by his hands the most criminal and dangerous parts of their conspiracy. Babington informed Mary of the design laid for a foreign invasion, the plan of an insurrection at home, the scheme for her deliverance, and the conspiracy for assassinating the usurper by six noble gentlemen, as he termed them, all of them his private friends, who from the zeal which they bore to the Catholic cause and her majesty's service, would undertake the tragical execution. Mary replied that she approved highly of the design, that the gentlemen might expect all the rewards which it should ever be in her power to confer, and that the death of Elizabeth was a necessary circumstance, before any attempts were made either for her own deliverance or an insurrection. These letters, with others to Mendoza, Charles Paget, the Archbishop of Glasgow, and Sir Francis Inglefield, were carried by Gifford to Secretary Walsingham, were deciphered by the art of Phillips, his clerk, and copies taken of them. Walsingham employed another artifice in order to obtain full insight into the plot. He subjoined to a letter of Mary's a postscript in the same cipher, in which he made her desire Babington to inform her of the names of the conspirators. The indiscretion of Babington furnished Walsingham with still another means of detection, 
as well as of defence that gentleman had caused a picture to be drawn where he himself was represented standing amidst the six assassins and a motto was subjoined expressing that their common perils were the band of their confederacy a copy of this picture was brought to elizabeth that she might know the assassins and guard herself against their approach to her person meanwhile babington anxious to ensure and hasten the foreign succours resolved to dispatch ballard into france and he procured for him under a feigned name a license to travel in order to remove from himself all suspicion he applied to walsingham pretended great zeal for the queen's service offered to go abroad and professed his intentions of employing the confidence which he had gained among the catholics to the detection and disappointment of their conspiracies walsingham commended his loyal purposes and promising his own counsel and assistance in the execution of them still fed him with hopes and maintained a close correspondence with him a warrant meanwhile was issued for seizing ballard and this incident joined to the consciousness of guilt begat in all the conspirators the utmost anxiety and concern some advised that they should immediately make their escape others proposed that savage and charnock should without delay execute their purpose against elizabeth and babington in prosecution of this scheme furnished savage with money that he might buy good clothes and thereby have more easy access to the queen's person next day they began to apprehend that they had taken the alarm too hastily and babington having renewed his correspondence with walsingham was persuaded by that subtle minister that the seizure of ballard had proceeded entirely from the usual diligence of informers in the detection of popish and seminary priests he even consented to take lodgings secretly in walsingham's house that they might have more frequent conferences together before his intended departure for france but observing that he was watched and guarded he made his escape and gave the alarm to the other conspirators they all took to flight covered themselves with several disguises and lay concealed in woods or barns but were soon discovered and thrown into prison in their examinations they contradicted each other and the leaders were obliged to make a full confession of the truth fourteen were condemned and executed of whom seven acknowledged the crime on their trial the rest were convicted by evidence the lesser conspirators being dispatched measures were taken for the trial and conviction of the queen of scots on whose account and with whose concurrence these attempts had been made against the life of the queen and the tranquillity of the kingdom some of elizabeth's counsellors were averse to this procedure and thought that the close confinement of a woman who was become very sickly and who would probably put a speedy period to their anxiety by her natural death might give sufficient security to the government without attempting a measure of which there scarcely remains any example in history leicester advised that mary should be secretly dispatched by poison and he sent a divine to convince walsingham of the lawfulness of that action but walsingham declared his abhorrence of it and still insisted in conjunction with the majority of the councillors for the open trial of the queen of scots the situation of england and of the english ministers had indeed been hitherto not a little dangerous no successor of the crown was declared but the heir of blood to whom the people in general were likely to adhere was by education an enemy to the natural religion was from multiplied provocations an enemy to the ministers and principal nobility and their personal safety as well as the safety of the public seemed to depend alone on the queen's life 
who was now somewhat advanced in years no wonder therefore that elizabeth's counsellors knowing themselves to be so obnoxious to the queen of scots endeavoured to push every measure to extremities against her and were even more anxious than the queen herself to prevent her from ever mounting the throne of england though all england was acquainted with the detection of babington's conspiracy every avenue to the queen of scots had been so strictly guarded that she remained in utter ignorance of the matter and it was a great surprise to her when sir thomas gorges by elizabeth's orders informed her that all her accomplices were discovered and arrested he chose the time for giving her this intelligence when she was mounted on horseback to go a-hunting and she was not permitted to return to her former place of abode but was conducted from one gentleman's house to another till she was lodged in Fotheringay Council in the county of Northampton, which it was determined to make the last stage of her trial and sufferings. Her two secretaries, now a Frenchman and Curl a Scot, were immediately arrested. All her papers were seized and sent up to the council. Above sixty different keys to ciphers were discovered, there were also found many letters from persons beyond sea and several too from english noblemen containing expressions of respect and attachment the queen took no notice of this latter discovery but the persons themselves knowing their correspondence to be detected thought that they had no other means of making atonement for their imprudence than by declaring themselves thenceforth the most inveterate enemies of the queen of scots it was resolved to try mary not by the common statute of treasons but by the act which had passed the former year with a view to this very event and the queen in terms of that act appointed a commission consisting of forty noblemen and privy councillors and empowered them to examine and pass sentence on mary whom she denominated the late queen of scots and heir to james v of scotland the commissioners came to fotheringay castle and sent to her sir walter mildmay sir amias paulet and edward barker who delivered her a letter from elizabeth informing her of the commission and of the approaching trial mary received the intelligence without emotion or astonishment she said however that it seemed strange to her that the queen should command her as a subject to submit to a trial and examination before subjects that she was an absolute independent princess and would yield to nothing which might derogate either from her royal majesty from the state of sovereign princes or from the dignity and rank of her son that however oppressed by misfortunes she was not yet so much broken in spirit as her enemies flattered themselves nor would she on any account be accessory to her own degradation and dishonour that she was ignorant of the laws and statutes of england was utterly destitute of counsel and could not conceive who were entitled to be called her peers or could legally sit as judges on her trial that though she had lived in england for many years she had lived in captivity and not having received the protection of the laws she could not merely by her involuntary residence in the country be supposed to have subjected herself to their jurisdiction that notwithstanding the superiority of her rank she was willing to give an account of her conduct before an english parliament but could not view these commissioners in any other light than as men appointed to justify by some colour of legal proceeding her condemnation and execution and that she warned them to look to their conscience and their character in trying an innocent person and to reflect that these transactions would somewhere be subject to revisal 
and that the theatre of the whole world was much wider than the kingdom of england in return the commissioners sent a new deputation informing her that her plea either from her royal dignity or from her imprisonment could not be admitted and that they were empowered to proceed to her trial even though she should refuse to answer before them burley the treasurer and bromley the chancellor employed much reasoning to make her submit but the person whose arguments had the chief influence was sir christopher hatton vice-chamberlain his speech was to this purpose you are accused madam said he but not condemned of having conspired the destruction of our lady and queen anointed you say you are a queen but in such a crime as this and such a situation as yours the royal dignity itself neither by the civil or canon law nor by the law of nature or of nations is exempt from judgment if you be innocent you wrong your reputation in avoiding a trial we have been present at your protestations of innocence but queen elizabeth thinks otherwise and is heartily sorry for the appearances which lie against you to examine therefore your cause she has appointed commissioners honourable persons prudent and upright men who are ready to hear you with equity and even with favour and will rejoice if you can clear yourself of the imputations which have been thrown upon you believe me madam the queen herself will rejoice who affirmed to me at my departure that nothing which ever befell her had given her so much uneasiness as that you should be suspected of a concurrence in these criminal enterprises laying aside therefore the fruitless claim of privilege from your royal dignity which can now avail you nothing trust to the better defence of your innocence make it appear in open trial and leave not upon your memory that stain of infamy which must attend your obstinate silence on this occasion end of section twenty six chapter forty two part one section twenty seven of volume one d of history of england from the invasion of julius caesar to the revolution of sixteen eighty eight this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688 by David Hume, Volume 1D, Section 27, Chapter 42, Part 2. By this artful speech, Mary was persuaded to answer before the court and thereby gave an appearance of legal procedure to the trial and prevented those difficulties which the commissioners must have fallen into had she persevered in maintaining so specious a plea as that of her sovereign and independent character her conduct in this particular must be regarded as the more imprudent because formerly when elizabeth's commissioners pretended not to exercise any jurisdiction over her and only entered into her cause by her own consent and approbation she declined justifying herself when her honour which ought to have been dearer to her than life seemed absolutely to require it on her first appearance before the commissioners mary either sensible of her imprudence or still unwilling to degrade herself by submitting to a trial renewed her protestation against the authority of her judges the chancellor answered her by pleading the supreme authority of the english laws over every one who resided in england and the commissioners accommodated matters by ordering both her protestation and his answer to be recorded the lawyers of the crown then opened the charge against the queen of scots they proved by intercepted letters that she had allowed cardinal allen and others 
to treat her as queen of england and that she had kept a correspondence with lord paget and charles paget in view of engaging the spaniards to invade the kingdom mary seemed not anxious to clear herself from either of these imputations she only said that she could not hinder others from using what style they pleased in writing to her and that she might lawfully try every expedient for the recovery of her liberty an intercepted letter of hers to mendoza was next produced in which she promised to transfer to philip her right to the kingdom of england if her son should refuse to be converted to the catholic faith an event she there said of which there was no expectation while he remained in the hands of his scottish subjects even this part of the charge she took no pains to deny or rather she seemed to acknowledge it she said that she had no kingdoms to dispose of yet was it lawful for her to give at her pleasure what was her own and she was not accountable to any for her actions she added that she had formerly rejected that proposal from spain but now since all her hopes in england were gone she was fully determined not to refuse foreign assistance there was also produced evidence to prove that allen and parsons were at that very time negotiating by her orders at rome the conditions of transferring her english crown to the king of spain and of disinheriting her heretical son it is remarkable that mary's prejudices against her son were at this time carried so far that she had even entered into a conspiracy against him had appointed lord claude hamilton regent of scotland and had instigated her adherents to seize james's person and deliver him into the hands of the pope or the king of spain whence he was never to be delivered but on condition of his becoming catholic the only part of the charge which mary positively denied was her concurrence in the design of assassinating elizabeth this article indeed was the most heavy and the only one that could fully justify the queen in proceeding to extremities against her in order to prove the accusation there were produced the following evidence copies taken in secretary walsingham's office of the intercepted letters between her and babington in which her approbation of the murder was clearly expressed the evidence of her two secretaries now and curl who had confessed without being put to any torture both that she had received these letters from babington and that they had written the answers by her order the confession of babington that he had written the letters and received the answers and the confession of ballard and savage that babington had showed them these letters of mary written in the cipher which had been settled between them it is evident that this complication of evidence though every circumstance corroborates the general conclusion resolves itself finally into the testimony of the two secretaries who alone were certainly acquainted with their mistress's concurrence in babington's conspiracy but who knew themselves exposed to all the rigours of imprisonment torture and death if they refused to give any evidence which might be required of them in the case of an ordinary criminal this proof with all its disadvantages would be esteemed legal and even satisfactory if not opposed by some other circumstances which shake the credit of the witnesses but on the present trial where the absolute power of the prosecutor concurred with such important interests and such a violent inclination to have the princess condemned the testimony of two witnesses even though men of character ought to be supported by strong probabilities in order to remove all suspicion of tyranny and injustice the proof against mary it must be confessed is not destitute of this advantage and it is difficult if not impossible to account for babington's receiving an answer written in her name and in the cipher concerted between them 
without allowing that the matter had been communicated to that princess such is the light in which this matter appears even after time has discovered every thing which could guide our judgment with regard to it no wonder therefore that the queen of scots unassisted by counsel and confounded by so extraordinary a trial found herself incapable of making a satisfactory defence before the commissioners her reply consisted chiefly in her own denial whatever force may be in that denial was much weakened by her positively affirming that she had never had any correspondence of any kind with babington a fact however of which there remains not the least question she asserted that as now and curl had taken an oath of secrecy and fidelity to her that their evidence against her ought not to be credited she confessed however that now had been in the service of her uncle the cardinal of lorraine and had only been recommended to her by the king of france as a man in whom she might safely confide she also acknowledged curl to be a very honest man but simple and easily imposed on by now if these two men had received any letters or had written any answers without her knowledge the imputation she said could never lie on her and she was the more inclined she added to entertain this suspicion against them because now had in other instances been guilty of a like temerity and had ventured to transact business in her name without communicating the matter to her the sole circumstance of her defence which to us may appear to have some force was her requiring that now and curl should be confronted with her and her affirming that they never would to her face persist in their evidence but that demand however equitable was not then supported by law in trials of high treason and was often refused even in other trials where the crown was prosecutor the clause contained in an act of the thirteenth of the queen was a novelty that the species of treason there enumerated must be proved by two witnesses confronted with the criminal but mary was not tried upon that act and the ministers and crown lawyers of this reign were always sure to refuse every indulgence beyond what the strict letter of the law and the settled practice of the courts of justice required of them not to mention that these secretaries were probably at fotheringay castle during the time of the trial and could not upon mary's demand be produced before the commissioners there passed two incidents in this trial which may be worth observing a letter between mary and babington was read in which mention was made of the earl of arundel and his brothers on hearing their names she broke into a sigh alas said she what has the noble house of the howards suffered for my sake she affirmed with regard to the same letter that it was easy to forge the handwriting and cipher of another she was afraid that this was too familiar a practice with walsingham who she also heard had frequently practised both against her life and her son's walsingham who was one of the commissioners rose up he protested that in his private capacity he had never acted anything against the queen of scots in his public capacity he owned that his concern for his sovereign's safety had made him very diligent in searching out by every expedient all designs against her sacred person or her authority for attaining that end he would not only make use of the assistance of ballard or any other conspirator he would also reward them for betraying their companions but if he had tampered in any matter unbefitting his character and office why did none of the late criminals either at their trial or execution accuse him of such practices mary endeavoured to pacify him by saying that she spoke from information 
and she begged him to give thenceforth no more credit to such as slandered her than she would to such as accused him the great character indeed which sir francis walsingham bears for probity and honour should remove from him all suspicion of such base arts as forgery and subornation arts which even the most corrupt ministers in the most corrupt times would scruple to employ having finished the trial the commissioners adjourned from fotheringay castle and met in the star chamber at london where after taking the oaths of mary's two secretaries who voluntarily without hope or reward vouched the authenticity of those letters before produced they pronounced sentence of death upon the queen of scots and confirmed it by their seals and subscriptions the same day a declaration was published by the commissioners and the judges that the sentence did no wise derogate from the title and honour of james king of scotland but that he was in the same place degree and right as if the sentence had never been pronounced the queen had now brought affairs with mary to that situation which she had long ardently desired and had found a plausible reason for executing vengeance on a competitor whom from the beginning of her reign she had ever equally dreaded and hated but she was restrained from instantly gratifying her resentment by several important considerations she foresaw the invidious colours in which this example of uncommon jurisdiction would be represented by the numerous partisans of mary and the reproach to which she herself might be exposed with all foreign princes perhaps with all posterity the rights of hospitality of kindred and of royal majesty seemed in one signal instance to be all violated and this sacrifice of generosity to interest of clemency to revenge might appear equally unbecoming a sovereign and a woman elizabeth therefore who was an excellent hypocrite pretended the utmost reluctance to proceed to the execution of the sentence affected the most tender sympathy with her prisoner displayed all her scruples and difficulties rejected the solicitation of her courtier and ministers and affirmed that were she not moved by the deepest concern for her people's safety she would not hesitate a moment in pardoning all the injuries which she herself had received from the queen of scots that the voice of her people might be more audibly heard in the demand of justice upon mary she summoned a new parliament and she knew both from the usual dispositions of that assembly and from the influence of her ministers over them that she should not want the most earnest solicitation to consent to that measure which was so agreeable to her secret inclinations she did not open this assembly in person but appointed for that purpose three commissioners bromley the chancellor burley the treasurer and the earl of derby the reason assigned for this measure was that the queen foreseeing that the affair of the queen of scots would be canvassed in parliament found her tenderness and delicacy so much hurt by that melancholy incident that she had not the courage to be present while it was under deliberation but withdrew her eyes from what she could not behold without the utmost reluctance and uneasiness she was also willing that by this unusual precaution the people should see the danger to which her person was hourly exposed and should thence be more strongly incited to take vengeance on the criminal whose restless intrigues and bloody conspiracies had so long exposed her to the most imminent perils the parliament answered the queen's expectations the sentence against mary was unanimously ratified by both houses and an application was voted to obtain elizabeth's consent to its publication and execution she gave an answer ambiguous embarrassed 
full of real artifice and seeming irresolution she mentioned the extreme danger to which her life was continually exposed she declared her willingness to die did she not foresee the great calamities which would thence fall upon the nation she made professions of the greatest tenderness to her people she displayed the clemency of her temper and expressed her violent reluctance to execute the sentence against her unhappy kinswoman she affirmed that the late law by which that princess was tried so far from being made to ensnare her was only intended to give her warning beforehand not to engage in such attempts as might expose her to the penalties with which she was thus openly menaced and she begged them to think once again whether it were possible to find any expedient besides the death of the queen of scots for securing the public tranquillity the parliament in obedience to her commands took the affair again under consideration but could find no other possible expedient they reiterated their solicitations and entreaties and arguments they even remonstrated that mercy to the queen of scots was cruelty to them her subjects and children and they affirmed that it were injustice to deny execution of the law to any individual much more to the whole body of the people now unanimously and earnestly suing for this pledge of her parental care and tenderness this second address set the pretended doubts and scruples of elizabeth anew in agitation she complained of her now unfortunate situation expressed her uneasiness from their importunity renewed the professions of affection to her people and dismissed the committee of parliament in an uncertainty what after all this deliberation might be her final resolution but though the queen affected reluctance to execute the sentence against mary she complied with the request of parliament in publishing it by proclamation and this act seemed to be attended with the unanimous and hearty rejoicings of the people lord buckhurst and beale clerk of the council were sent to the queen of scots and notified to her the sentence pronounced against her its ratification by parliament and the earnest applications made for its execution by that assembly who thought that their religion could never while she was alive attain a full settlement and security mary was nowise dismayed at this intelligence on the contrary she joyfully laid hold of the last circumstance mentioned to her and insisted that since her death was demanded by the protestants for the establishment of their faith she was really a martyr to her religion and was entitled to all the merits attending that glorious character she added that the english had often imbrued their hands into the blood of their sovereigns no wonder they exercised cruelty against her who derived her descent from these monarchs paulette her keeper received orders to take down her canopy and to serve her no longer with the respect due to sovereign princes he told her that she was now to be considered a dead person and incapable of any dignity this harsh treatment produced not in her any seeming emotion she only replied that she received her royal character from the hands of the almighty and no earthly power was ever able to bereave her of it the queen of scots wrote her last letter to elizabeth full of dignity without departing from that spirit of meekness and of charity which appeared suitable to this concluding scene of her unfortunate life she preferred no petition for averting the fatal sentence on the contrary she expressed her gratitude to heaven for thus bringing to a speedy period her sad and lamentable pilgrimage she requested some favours of elizabeth and entreated her that she might be beholden for them to her own goodness alone without making applications to those ministers who had discovered 
such an extreme malignity against her person and her religion she desired that after her enemies should be satiated with her innocent blood her body which it was determined should never enjoy rest while her soul was united to it might be consigned to her servants and be conveyed by them to france there to repose in a catholic land with the sacred relics of her mother in scotland she said the sepulchres of her ancestors were violated and the churches either demolished or profaned and in england where she might be interred among the ancient kings her own and elizabeth's progenitors she could entertain no hopes of being accompanied to the grave with those rites and ceremonies which her religion required she requested that no one might have the power of inflicting a private death upon her without elizabeth's knowledge but that her execution should be public and attended by her ancient servants who might bear testimony of her perseverance in the faith and of her submission to the will of heaven she begged that these servants might afterwards be allowed to depart whithersoever they pleased and might enjoy those legacies which she should bequeath them and she conjured her to grant these favours by their near kindred by the soul and memory of henry the seventh the common ancestor of both and by the royal dignity of which they equally participated elizabeth made no answer to this letter being unwilling to give mary a refusal in her present situation and foreseeing inconveniences from granting some of her requests while the queen of scots thus prepared herself to meet her fate great efforts were made by foreign powers with elizabeth to prevent the execution of the sentence pronounced against her besides employing lobespine the french resident at london a creature of the house of guise henry sent over belivre with a professed intention of interceding for the life of mary the duke of guise and the league at that time threatened very nearly the king's authority and elizabeth knew that though that monarch might from decency and policy think himself obliged to interpose publicly on behalf of the queen of scots he could not secretly be much displeased with the death of a princess on whose fortune and elevation his mortal enemies had always founded so many daring and ambitious projects it is even pretended that Belivre had orders after making public and vehement remonstrances against the execution of mary to exhort privately the queen in his master's name not to defer an act of justice so necessary for their common safety but whether the french king's intercession were sincere or not it had no weight with the queen and she still persisted in her former resolution End of section 27, chapter 42, part 2. Section 28 of volume 1D of History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688 by David Hume, Volume 1D, Section 28, Chapter 42, Part 3. The interposition of the young King of Scots, though not able to change Elizabeth's determination, seemed on every account to merit more regard as soon as james heard of the trial and condemnation of his mother he sent sir william keith a gentleman of his bedchamber to london and wrote a letter to the queen in which he remonstrated in very severe terms against the indignity of the procedure he said that he was astonished to hear of the presumption of english noblemen and councillors who had dared to sit in judgment and pass sentence upon a queen of scotland 
descended from the blood royal of england but he was still more astonished to hear that thoughts were seriously entertained of putting that sentence in execution that he entreated elizabeth to reflect on the dishonour which she would draw on her name by imbruing her hands in the blood of her near kinswoman a person of the same royal dignity and of the same sex with herself that in this unparalleled attempt she offered an affront to all diadems and even to her own and by reducing sovereigns to a level with other men taught the people to neglect all duty towards those whom providence had appointed to rule over them that for his part he must deem the injury and insult so enormous as to be incapable of all atonement nor was it possible for him thenceforward to remain in any terms of correspondence with a person who without any pretence of legal authority had deliberately inflicted an ignominious death upon his parent and that even if the sentiments of nature and duty did not inspire him with this purpose of vengeance his honour required it of him nor could he ever acquit himself in the eyes of the world if he did not use every effort and endure every hazard to revenge so great an indignity soon after james sent the master of gray and sir robert melville to enforce the remonstrances of keith and to employ with the queen every expedient of argument and menaces elizabeth was at first offended with the sharpness of these applications and she replied in a like strain to the scottish ambassadors when she afterwards reflected that this earnestness was no more than what duty required of james she was pacified but still retained her resolution of executing the sentence against mary it is believed that the master of gray gained by the enemies of that princess secretly gave his advice not to spare her and undertook in all events to pacify his master the queen also from many considerations was induced to pay small attention to the applications of james and to disregard all the efforts which he could employ in behalf of his mother she was well acquainted with his character and interests the factions which prevailed among his people and the inveterate hatred which the zealous protestants particularly the preachers bore to the queen of scots the present incidents set these dispositions of the clergy in a full light james observing the fixed purpose of elizabeth ordered prayers to be offered up for mary in all the churches and knowing the captious humour of the ecclesiastics he took care that the form of the petition should be most cautious as well as humane and charitable that it might please god to illuminate mary with the light of his truth and save her from the apparent danger with which she was threatened but excepting the king's own chaplains and one clergyman more all the preachers refused to pollute their churches by prayers for a papist and would not so much as prefer a petition for her conversion james unwilling or unable to punish this disobedience and desirous of giving the preachers an opportunity of amending their fault appointed a new day when prayers should be said for his mother and that he might at least secure himself from any insult in his own presence he desired the archbishop of st andrews to officiate before him in order to disappoint this purpose the clergy instigated one cooper a young man who had not yet received holy orders to take possession of the pulpit early in the morning and to exclude the prelate when the king came to church and saw the pulpit occupied by cooper he called to him from his seat and told him that the place was destined for another 
yet since he was there if he would obey the charge given and remember the queen in his prayers he might proceed to divine service the preacher replied that he would do as the spirit of god should direct him this answer sufficiently instructed james in his purpose and he commanded him to leave the pulpit as cooper seemed not disposed to obey the captain of the guard went to pull him from his place upon which the young man cried aloud that this day would be a witness against the king in the great day of the lord and he denounced a woe upon the inhabitants of edinburgh for permitting him to be treated in that manner the audience at first appeared desirous to take part with him but the sermon of the prelate brought them over to a more dutiful and more humane disposition elizabeth when solicited either by james or foreign princes to pardon the queen of scots seemed always determined to execute the sentence against her but when her ministers urged her to interpose no more delays her scruples and her hesitation returned her humanity could not allow her to embrace such violent and sanguinary measures and she was touched with compassion for the misfortunes and with respect for the dignity of the unhappy prisoner the courtiers sensible that they could do nothing more acceptable to her than to employ persuasion on this head failed not to enforce every motive for the punishment of mary and to combat all the objections urged against this act of justice they said that the treatment of that princess in england had been on her first reception such as sound reason and policy required and if she had been governed by principles of equity she would not have refused willingly to acquiesce in it that the obvious inconveniences either of allowing her to retire into france or of restoring her by force to her throne in opposition to the reformers and the english party in scotland had obliged the queen to detain her in england till time should offer some opportunity of serving her without danger to the kingdom or to the protestant religion that her usage there had been such as became her rank her own servants in considerable numbers had been permitted to attend her exercise had been allowed for her health and all access of company for amusement and these indulgences would in time have been carried further if by her subsequent conduct she had appeared worthy of them that after she had instigated the rebellion of northumberland the conspiracy of norfolk the bull of excommunication of pope pius an invasion from flanders after she had seduced the queen's friends and incited every enemy foreign and domestic against her it became necessary to treat her as a most dangerous rival and to render her confinement more strict and rigorous that the queen notwithstanding these repeated provocations had in her favour rejected the importunity of her parliaments and the advice of her sagest ministers and was still in hopes of her amendment determined to delay coming to the last extremities against her that mary even in this forlorn condition retained so high and unconquerable a spirit that she acted as competitor to the crown and allowed her partisans everywhere and in their very letters addressed to herself to treat her as queen of england that she had carried her animosity so far as to encourage in repeated instances the atrocious design of assassinating the queen and this crime was unquestionably proved upon her by her own letters by the evidence of her secretaries and by the dying confession of her accomplices that she was but a titular queen and at present possessed nowhere any right of sovereignty much less in england where the moment she set foot in the kingdom 
she voluntarily became subject to the laws and to elizabeth the only true sovereign that even allowing her to be still the queen's equal in rank and dignity self-defence was permitted by a law of nature which could never be abrogated and every one still more a queen had sufficient jurisdiction over an enemy who by open violence and still more who by secret treachery threatened the utmost danger against her life that the general combination of the catholics to exterminate the protestants was no longer a secret and as the sole resource of the latter persecuted sect lay in elizabeth so the chief hope which the former entertained of final success consisted in the person and in the title of the queen of scots that this very circumstance brought matters to extremity between these princesses and rendering the life of one the death of the other pointed out to elizabeth the path which either regard to self-preservation or to the happiness of her people should direct her to pursue and that necessity more powerful than policy thus demanded of the queen that resolution which equity would authorize and which duty prescribed when elizabeth thought that as many importunities had been used and as much delay interposed as decency required she at last determined to carry the sentence into execution but even in this final resolution she could not proceed without displaying a new scene of duplicity and artifice in order to alarm the vulgar rumours were previously dispersed that the spanish fleet was arrived in milford haven that the scots had made an irruption into england that the duke of guise was landed in sussex with a strong army that the queen of scots was escaped from prison and had raised an army that the northern counties had begun an insurrection that there was a new conspiracy on foot to assassinate the queen and set the city of london on fire nay that the queen was actually assassinated an attempt of this nature was even imputed to lobespine the french ambassador and that minister was obliged to leave the kingdom the queen affecting to be in terror and perplexity was observed to sit much alone pensive and silent and sometimes to mutter to herself half sentences importing the difficulty and distress to which she was reduced she at last called davison a man of parts but easy to be imposed on and who had lately for that very reason been made secretary and she ordered him privately to draw a warrant for the execution of the queen of scots which she afterwards said she intended to keep by her in case any attempt should be made for the deliverance of that princess she signed the warrant and then commanded davison to carry it to the chancellor in order to have the great seal appended to it next day she sent killigrew to davison enjoining him to forbear some time executing her former orders and when davison came and told her that the warrant had already passed the great seal she seemed to be somewhat moved and blamed him for his precipitation davison being in perplexity acquainted the council with this whole transaction and they endeavoured to persuade him to send off beale with the warrant if the queen should be displeased they promised to justify his conduct and to take on themselves the whole blame of this measure the secretary not sufficiently aware of their intention complied with the advice and the warrant was dispatched to the earls of shrewsbury and kent and some others ordering them to see the sentence executed upon the queen of scots the two earls came to fotheringay castle and being introduced to mary informed her of their commission and desired her to prepare for death next morning at eight o'clock 
she seemed nowise terrified though somewhat surprised with the intelligence she said with a cheerful and even a smiling countenance that she did not think the queen her sister would have consented to her death or have executed the sentence against a person not subject to the laws and jurisdiction of england but as such is her will said she death which puts an end to all my miseries shall be to me most welcome nor can i esteem that soul worthy the felicities of heaven which cannot support the body under the horrors of the last passage to these blissful mansions she then requested the two noblemen that they would permit some of her servants and particularly her confessor to attend her but they told her that compliance with this last demand was contrary to their conscience and that dr fletcher dean of peterborough a man of great learning should be present to instruct her in the principles of true religion her refusal to have any conference with this divine inflamed the zeal of the earl of kent and he bluntly told her that her death would be the life of their religion as on the contrary her life would have been the death of it mention being made of babington she constantly denied his conspiracy to have been at all known to her and the revenge of her wrongs she resigned into the hands of the almighty when the earls had left her she ordered supper to be hastened that she might have the more leisure after it to finish the few affairs which remained to her in this world and to prepare for her passage to another it was necessary for her she said to take some sustenance lest a failure of her bodily strength should depress her spirits on the morrow and lest her behaviour should thereby betray a weakness unworthy of herself she supped sparingly as her manner usually was and her wonted cheerfulness did not even desert her on this occasion she comforted her servants under the affliction which overwhelmed them and which was too violent for them to conceal it from her turning to burgoyne her physician she asked him whether he did not remark the great and invincible force of truth they pretend said she that i must die because i conspired against their queen's life but the earl of kent avowed that there was no other cause of my death than the apprehensions which if i should live they entertain for their religion my constancy in the faith is my real crime the rest is only a colour invented by interested and designing men towards the end of supper she called in all her servants and drank to them they pledged her in order on their knees and craved her pardon for any past neglect of their duty she deigned in return to ask for a pardon for her offences towards them and a plentiful effusion of tears attended this last solemn farewell and exchange of mutual forgiveness mary's care of her servants was the sole remaining affair which employed her concern she perused her will in which she had provided for them by legacies she ordered the inventory of her goods clothes and jewels to be brought to her and she wrote down the names of those to whom she bequeathed each particular to some she distributed money with her own hands and she adapted the recompense to their different degrees of rank and merit she wrote also letters of recommendation for her servants to the french king and to her cousin the duke of guise whom she made the chief executor of her testament at her wonted time she went to bed slept some hours and then rising spent the rest of the night in prayer having foreseen the difficulty of exercising the rites of her religion she had had the precaution to obtain a consecrated host from the hands of pope pius and she had reserved the use of it for this last period of her life 
by this expedient she supplied as much as she could the want of a priest and confessor who was refused her towards the morning she dressed herself in a rich habit of silk and velvet the only one which she had reserved to herself she told her maids that she would willingly have left them this dress rather than the plain garb which she wore the day before but it was necessary for her to appear at the ensuing solemnity in a decent habit thomas andrews sheriff of the county entered the room and informed her that the hour was come and that he must attend her to the place of execution she replied that she was ready and bidding adieu to her servants she leaned on two of sir amias paulet's guards because of an infirmity in her limbs and she followed the sheriff with a serene and composed countenance in passing through a hall adjoining to her chamber she was met by the earls of shrewsbury and kent sir amias paulet sir drew drury and many other gentlemen of distinction here she also found sir andrew melville her steward who flung himself on his knees before her and wringing his hands cried aloud ah madam unhappy me what man was ever before the messenger of such heavy tidings as i must carry when i shall return to my native country and shall report that i saw my gracious queen and mistress beheaded in england his tears prevented further speech and mary too felt herself moved more from sympathy than affliction cease my good servant said she cease to lament thou hast cause rather to rejoice than to mourn for now shalt thou see the troubles of mary stuart receive their long expected period and completion no continued she good servant that all the world at best is vanity and subject still to more sorrow than a whole ocean of tears is able to bewail but i pray thee carry this message from me that i die a true woman to my religion and unalterable in my affections to scotland and to france heaven forgive them that have long desired my end and have thirsted for my blood as the heart panteth after the water brooks o god added she thou art the author of truth and truth itself thou knowest the inmost recesses of my heart thou knowest that i was ever desirous to preserve an entire union between scotland and england and to obviate the source of all these fatal discords but recommend me melville to my son and tell him that notwithstanding all my distresses i have done nothing prejudicial to the state and kingdom of scotland after these words reclining herself with weeping eyes and face bedewed with tears she kissed him and so said she good melville farewell once again farewell good melville and grant the assistance of thy prayers to thy queen and mistress end of section twenty eight chapter forty two part three section twenty nine of volume one d of history of england from the invasion of julius caesar to the revolution of sixteen eighty eight this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688 by David Hume. Volume 1D, Section 29, Chapter 42, Part 4. she next turned to the nobleman who attended her and made a petition in behalf of her servants that they might be well treated be allowed to enjoy the presents which she had made them and be sent safely into their own country having received a favourable answer 
she preferred another request that they might be permitted to attend her at her death in order said she that their eyes may behold and their hearts bear witness how patiently their queen and mistress can submit to her execution and how constantly she perseveres in her attachment to her religion the earl of kent opposed this desire and told her that they would be apt by their speeches and cries to disturb both herself and the spectators he was also apprehensive lest they should practise some superstition not meet for him to suffer such as dipping their handkerchiefs in her blood for that was the instance which he made use of my lord said the queen of scots i will give my word although it be but dead that they shall not incur any blame in any of the actions which you have named but alas poor souls it would be a great consolation for them to bid their mistress farewell and i hope added she that your mistress being a maiden queen would vouchsafe in regard of womanhood that i should have some of my own people about me at my death i know that her majesty hath not given you any such strict command but that you might grant me a request of far greater courtesy even though i were a woman of inferior rank to that which i bear finding that the earl of kent persisted still in his refusal her mind which had fortified itself against the terrors of death was affected by this indignity for which she was not prepared i am cousin to your queen cried she and descended from the blood royal of henry the seventh and a married queen of france and an anointed queen of scotland the commissioners perceiving how invidious their obstinacy would appear conferred a little together and agreed that she might carry a few of her servants along with her she made a choice of four men and two maidservants for that purpose she then passed into another hall where was erected the scaffold covered in black and she saw with an undismayed countenance the executioners and all the preparations of death the room was crowded with spectators and no one was so steeled against all sentiments of humanity as not to be moved when he reflected on her royal dignity considered the surprising train of her misfortunes beheld her mild but inflexible constancy recalled her amiable accomplishments or surveyed her beauties which though faded by years and yet more by her afflictions still discovered themselves in this fatal moment here the warrant for her execution was read to her and during this ceremony she was silent but showed in her behaviour an indifference and unconcern as if the business had nowise regarded her before the executioners performed their office the dean of peterborough stepped forth and though the queen frequently told him that he needed not concern himself about her that she was settled in the ancient catholic and roman religion and that she meant to lay down her life in defence of that faith he still thought it his duty to persist in his lectures and exhortations and to endeavour her conversion the terms which he employed were under colour of pious instructions cruel insults on her unfortunate situation and besides their own absurdity may be regarded as the most mortifying indignities to which she had ever yet been exposed he told her that the queen of england had on this occasion shown a tender care of her and notwithstanding the punishment justly to be inflicted on her for her manifold trespasses was determined to use every expedient for saving her soul from that destruction with which it was so nearly threatened 
that she was now standing upon the brink of eternity and had no other means of escaping endless perdition than by repenting her former wickedness by justifying the sentence pronounced against her by acknowledging the queen's favours and by exerting a true and lively faith in christ jesus that the scriptures were the only rule of doctrine the merits of christ the only means of salvation and if she trusted in the inventions or devices of men she must expect in an instant to fall into utter darkness into a place where shall be weeping howling and gnashing of teeth that the hand of death was upon her the axe was laid to the root of the tree the throne of the great judge of heaven was erected the book of her life was spread wide and the particular sentence and judgment was ready to be pronounced upon her and that it was now during this important moment in her choice either to rise to the resurrection of life and hear that joyful salutation come ye blessed of my father or to share the resurrection of condemnation replete with sorrow and anguish and to suffer that dreadful denunciation go ye cursed into everlasting fire during this discourse mary could not sometimes forbear betraying her impatience by interrupting the preacher and the dean finding that he had profited nothing by his lecture at last bade her change her opinion repent of her former wickedness and settle her faith upon this ground that only in christ jesus could she hope to be saved she answered again and again with great earnestness trouble not yourself any more about the matter for i was born in this religion i have lived in this religion and in this religion i am resolved to die even the two earls perceived that it was fruitless to harass her any further with theological disputes and they ordered the dean to desist from his unseasonable exhortations and to pray for her conversion during the dean's prayer she employed herself in private devotion from the office of the virgin and after he had finished she pronounced aloud some petitions in english for the afflicted church for an end of her own troubles for her son and for queen elizabeth and prayed god that the princess might long prosper and be employed in his service the earl of kent observing that in her devotions she made frequent use of the crucifix could not forbear reproving her for her attachment to that popish trumpery as he termed it and he exhorted her to have christ in her heart not in her hand she replied with presence of mind that it was difficult to hold such an object in her hand without feeling her heart touched with some compunction she now began with the aid of her two women to disrobe herself and the executioner also lent his hand to assist them she smiled and said that she was not accustomed to undress herself before so large a company nor to be served by such valets her servants seeing her in this condition ready to lay her head upon the block burst into tears and lamentations she turned about to them put her finger upon her lips as a sign of imposing silence upon them and having given them her blessing desired them to pray for her one of her maids whom she had appointed for that purpose covered her eyes with a handkerchief she laid herself down without any sign of fear or trepidation and her head was severed from her body at two strokes by the executioner he instantly held it up to the spectators streaming with blood and agitated with the convulsions of death the dean of peterborough alone exclaimed so perish all queen elizabeth's enemies the earl of kent alone replied amen 
the attention of all the other spectators was fixed on the melancholy scene before them and zeal and flattery alike gave place to present pity and admiration of the expiring princess thus perished in the forty-fifth year of her age and nineteenth of her captivity in england mary queen of scots a woman of great accomplishments both of body and mind natural as well as acquired but unfortunate in her life and during one period very unhappy in her conduct the beauties of her person and graces of her air combined to make her the most amiable of women and the charms of her dress and conversation aided the impression which her lovely figure made on the hearts of all beholders ambitious and active in her temper yet inclined to cheerfulness and society of a lofty spirit constant and even vehement in her purpose yet polite and gentle and affable in her demeanour she seemed to partake only so much of the male virtues as to render her estimable without relinquishing those soft graces which compose the proper ornament of her sex in order to form a just idea of her character we must set aside one part of her conduct while she abandoned herself to the guidance of a profligate man and must consider these faults whether we admit them to be imprudences or crimes as the result of an inexplicable though not uncommon inconstancy in the human mind of the frailty of our nature of the violence of passion and of the influence which situations and sometimes momentary incidents have on persons whose principles are not thoroughly confirmed by experience and reflection enraged by the ungrateful conduct of her husband seduced by the treacherous counsels of one in whom she reposed confidence transported by the violence of her own temper which never lay sufficiently under the guidance of discretion she was betrayed into actions which may with some difficulty be accounted for but which admit of no apology nor even of alleviation an enumeration of her qualities might carry the appearance of a panegyric an account of her conduct must in some parts wear the aspect of severe satire and invective her numerous misfortunes the solitude of her long and tedious captivity and the persecutions to which she had been exposed on account of her religion had wrought her up to a degree of bigotry during her later years and such were the prevalent spirit and principles of the age that it is the less wonder if her zeal her resentment and her interest uniting induced her to give consent to a design which conspirators actuated only by the first of these motives had formed against the life of elizabeth when the queen was informed of mary's execution she affected the most utmost surprise and indignation her countenance changed her speech faltered and failed her for a long time her sorrow was so deep that she could not express it but stood fixed like a statue in silence and mute astonishment after her grief was able to find vent it burst out in loud wailings and lamentations she put herself in deep mourning for this deplorable event and she was seen perpetually bathed in tears and surrounded only by her maids and women none of her ministers or counsellors dared to approach her or if any had such temerity she chased them from her with the most violent expressions of rage and resentment they had all of them been guilty of an unpardonable crime in putting to death her dear sister and kinswoman contrary to her fixed purpose of which they were sufficiently apprised and acquainted no sooner was her sorrow so much abated as to leave room for reflection than she wrote a letter of apology to the king of scots 
and sent it by sir robert carey son of lord hunsdon she there told him that she wished he knew but not felt the unutterable grief which she experienced on account of that lamentable accident which without her knowledge much less concurrence had happened in england that as her pen trembled when she attempted to write it she found herself obliged to commit the relation of it to the messenger her kinsman who would likewise inform his majesty of every circumstance attending this dismal and unlooked-for misfortune that she appealed to the supreme judge of heaven and earth for her innocence and was also so happy amidst her other afflictions as to find that many persons in her court could bear witness to her veracity in this protestation that she abhorred dissimulation deemed nothing more worthy of a prince than a sincere and open conduct and could never surely be esteemed so base and poor-spirited as that if she had really given orders for this fatal execution she could on any consideration be induced to deny them that though sensible of the justice of the sentence pronounced against the unhappy prisoner she determined from clemency never to carry it into execution and could not but resent the temerity of those who on this occasion had disappointed her intention and that as no one loved him more dearly than herself or bore a more anxious concern for his welfare she hoped that he would consider every one as his enemy who endeavoured on account of the present incident to excite any animosity between them in order the better to appease james she committed davison to prison and ordered him to be tried in the star chamber for his misdemeanour the secretary was confounded and being sensible of the danger which must attend his entering into a contest with the queen he expressed penitence for his error and submitted very patiently to be railed at by those very counsellors whose persuasion had induced him to incur the guilt and who had promised to countenance and protect him he was condemned to imprisonment during the queen's pleasure and to pay a fine of ten thousand pounds he remained a long time in custody and the fine though it reduced him to beggary was rigorously levied upon him all the favour which he could obtain from the queen was sending him some small supplies from time to time to keep him from perishing in necessity he privately wrote an apology to his friend walsingham which contains many curious particulars the french and scotch ambassadors he said had been remonstrating with the queen in mary's behalf and immediately after their departure she commanded him of her own accord to deliver her the warrant for the execution of the princess she signed it readily and ordered it to be sealed with the great seal of england she appeared in such good humour on the occasion that she said to him in a jocular manner go tell all this to walsingham who is now sick though i fear he will die of sorrow when he hears of it she added that though she had so long delayed the execution lest she should seem to be actuated by malice or cruelty she was all along sensible of the necessity of it in the same conversation she blamed drury and paulette that they had not before eased her of this trouble and she expressed her desire that walsingham would bring them to compliance in that particular she was so bent on this purpose that some time after she asked davison whether any letter had come from paulette with regard to the service expected of him davison showed her paulette's letter in which that gentleman positively refused to act anything inconsistent with the principles of honour and justice the queen fell into a passion and accused paulette as well as drury of perjury because 
having taken the oath of association in which they had bound themselves to avenge her wrongs they had yet refused to lend their hand on this occasion but others she said will be found less scrupulous davison adds that nothing but the consent and exhortations of the whole council could have engaged him to send off the warrant he was well aware of his danger and remembered that the queen after having ordered the execution of the duke of norfolk had endeavoured in a like manner to throw the whole blame and odium of that action upon lord burleigh elizabeth's dissimulation was so gross that it could deceive nobody who was not previously resolved to be blinded but as james's concern for his mother was certainly more sincere and cordial he discovered the highest resentment and refused to admit carey into his presence he recalled his ambassadors from england and seemed to breathe nothing but war and vengeance the states of scotland being assembled took part in his anger and professed that they were ready to spend their lives and fortunes in revenge of his mother's death and in defence of his title to the crown of england many of his nobility instigated him to take arms lord sinclair when the courtiers appeared in deep mourning presented himself to the king arrayed in complete armour and said that this was the proper mourning for the queen the catholics took the opportunity of exhorting james to make an alliance with the king of spain to lay immediate claim to the crown of england and to prevent the ruin which from his mother's example he might conclude would certainly if elizabeth's power prevailed overwhelm his person and his kingdom the queen was sensible of the danger attending these councils and after allowing james some decent interval to vent his grief and anger she employed her emissaries to pacify him and to set before him every motive of hope or fear which might induce him to live in amity with her walsingham wrote to lord thirlstone james's secretary a judicious letter to the same purpose he said that he was much surprised to hear of the violent resolutions taken in scotland and of the passions discovered by a prince of so much judgment and temper as james that a war founded merely on the principle of revenge and that too on account of an act of justice which necessity had extorted would for ever be exposed to censure and could not be excused by any principles of equity or reason that if these views were deemed less momentous among princes policy and interest ought certainly to be attended to and these motives did still more evidently oppose all thoughts of a rupture with elizabeth and all revival of exploded claims to the english throne that the inequality between the two kingdoms deprived james of any hopes of success if he trusted merely to the force of his own state and had no recourse to foreign powers for assistance that the objections attending the introduction of succours from a more potent monarch appeared so evident from all the transactions of history that they could not escape a person of the king's extensive knowledge but there were in the present case several peculiar circumstances which ought for ever to deter him from having recourse to so dangerous an expedient that the french monarch the ancient ally of scotland might willingly use the assistance of that kingdom against england but would be displeased to see the union of these two kingdoms in the person of james a union which would ever after exclude him from practising that policy formerly so useful to the french and so pernicious to the scottish nation that henry besides infested with faction and domestic war was not in a condition of supporting distant allies much less would he expose himself to any hazard or expense 
in order to aggrandize a near kinsman of the house of guise the most determined enemies of his repose and authority that the extensive power and exorbitant ambition of the spanish monarch rendered him a still more dangerous ally to scotland and as he evidently aspired to a universal monarchy in the west and had in particular advanced some claims to england as if he were descended from the house of lancaster he was at the same time the common enemy of all princes who wished to maintain their independence and the immediate rival and competitor of the king of scots that the queen by her own naval power and her alliance with the hollanders would probably intercept all succours which might be sent to james from abroad and be enabled to decide the controversy in this island with the superior forces of her own kingdom opposed to those of scotland that if the king revived his mother's pretensions to the crown of england he must also embrace her religion by which alone they could be justified and must therefore undergo the infamy of abandoning those principles in which he had been strictly educated and to which he had hitherto religiously adhered that as he would by such an apostasy totally alienate all the protestants in scotland and england and he could never gain the confidence of the catholics who would still entertain reasonable doubts of his sincerity that by advancing a present claim to the crown he forfeited the certain prospect of his succession and revived that national animosity which the late peace and alliance between the kingdoms had happily extinguished that the whole gentry and nobility of england had openly declared themselves for the execution of the queen of scots and if james showed such violent resentment against that act of justice they would be obliged for their own security to prevent for ever so implacable a prince from ruling over them and that however some persons might represent his honour as engaged to seek vengeance for the present affront and injury the true honour of a prince consisted in wisdom and moderation and justice not in following the dictates of blind passion or in pursuing revenge at the expense of every motive and every interest End of section twenty nine, chapter forty two, part four. Section thirty of volume one D of History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of sixteen eighty eight. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688 by David Hume, Volume 1 D, Section 30, Chapter 42, Part 5. These considerations, joined to the peaceable, unambitious temper of the young prince, prevailed over his resentment, and he fell gradually into a good correspondence with the court of England it is probable that the queen's chief object in her dissimulation with regard to the execution of mary was that she might thereby afford james a decent pretence for renewing his amity with her on which their mutual interests so much depended while elizabeth ensured tranquillity from the attempts of her nearest neighbour she was not negligent of more distant dangers hearing that philip though he seemed to dissemble the daily insults and injuries which he received from the english was secretly preparing a great navy to attack her he sent sir francis drake with a fleet to intercept his supplies to pillage his coast and to destroy his shipping drake carried out four capital ships of the queen's and twenty-six great and small with which the london merchants in hope of sharing in the plunder had supplied him having learned from two dutch ships which he met with in his passage 
that a spanish fleet richly laden was lying at cadiz ready to sail for lisbon the rendezvous of the intended armada he bent his course to the former harbour and boldly as well as fortunately made an attack on the enemy he obliged six galleys which made head against him to take shelter under the forts he burned about a hundred vessels laden with ammunition and naval stores and he destroyed a great ship of the marquis of santa croce thence he set sail for cape st vincent and took by assault the castle situated on that promontory with three other fortresses he next insulted lisbon and finding that the merchants who had engaged entirely in expectation of profit were discontented at these military enterprises he set sail for the terceras with an intention of lying in wait for a rich carrack which was expected in those parts he was so fortunate as to meet with his prize and by this short expedition in which the public bore so small a share the adventurers were encouraged to attempt further enterprises the english seamen learned to despise the great unwieldy ships of the enemy the naval preparations of spain were destroyed the intended expedition against england was retarded a twelvemonth and the queen thereby had leisure to take more secure measures against that formidable invasion this year thomas cavendish a gentleman of devonshire who had dissipated a good estate by living at court being resolved to repair his fortune at the expense of the spaniards fitted out three ships at plymouth one of a hundred and twenty tons another of sixty and a third of forty and with these small vessels he ventured into the south sea and committed great depredations on the spaniards he took nineteen vessels some of which were richly laden and returning by the cape of good hope he came to london and entered the river in a kind of triumph his mariners and soldiers were clothed in silk his sails were of damask his topsail cloth of gold and his prizes were esteemed the richest that had ever been brought into england the land enterprises of the english were not during this campaign so advantageous or honourable to the nation the important place of deventer was entrusted by leicester to william stanley with a garrison of twelve hundred english and this gentleman being a catholic was alarmed at the discovery of babington's conspiracy and became apprehensive lest every one of his religion should thenceforth be treated with distrust in england he entered into a correspondence with the spaniards betrayed the city to them for a sum of money and engaged the whole garrison to desert with him to the spanish service roland york who commanded a fort near zutphen imitated his example and the hollanders formerly disgusted with leicester and suspicious of the english broke out into loud complaints against the improvidence if not the treachery of his administration soon after he himself arrived in the low countries but his conduct was no wise calculated to give them satisfaction or to remove the suspicions which they had entertained against him the prince of parma having besieged sloys leicester attempted to relieve the place first by sea then by land but failed in both enterprises and as he had ascribed his bad success to the ill behaviour of the hollanders they were equally free in reflections upon his conduct the breach between them became wider every day they slighted his authority opposed his measures and neglected his counsels while he endeavoured by an imperious behaviour and by violence to recover that influence which he had lost by his imprudent and ill-concerted measures he was even suspected by the dutch of a design to usurp upon their liberties and the jealousy entertained against him began to extend towards the queen herself 
that princess had made some advances towards a peace with spain a congress had been opened at bourbourg a village near graveline and though the two courts especially that of spain had no other intention than to amuse each of them its enemy by negotiation and mutually relax the preparations for defence or attack the dutch who were determined on no terms to return under the spanish yoke became apprehensive lest their liberty should be sacrificed to the political interests of england but the queen who knew the importance of her alliance with the states during the present conjuncture was resolved to give them entire satisfaction by recalling leicester and commanding him to resign his government morris son of the late prince of orange a youth of twenty years of age was elected by the state's governor in his place and peregrine lord willoughby was appointed by the queen commander of the english forces the measures of these two generals were much embarrassed by the malignity of leicester who had left a faction behind him and who still attempted by means of his emissaries to disturb all the operations of the states as soon as elizabeth received intelligence of these disorders she took care to redress them and she obliged all the partisans of england to fall into unanimity with prince maurice but though her good sense so far prevailed over her partiality to leicester she never could be made fully sensible of his vices and incapacity the submissions which he made her restored him to her wonted favour and lord buckhurst who had accused him of misconduct in holland lost her confidence for some time and was even committed to custody sir christopher hatton was another favourite who at this time received some marks of her partiality though he had never followed the profession of the law he was made chancellor in the place of bromley deceased but notwithstanding all the expectations and perhaps wishes of the lawyers he behaved in a manner not unworthy of that high station his good natural capacity supplied the place of experience and study and his decisions were not found deficient either in point of equity or judgment his enemies had contributed to this promotion in hopes that his absence from court while he attended the business of chancery would gradually estrange the queen from him and give them an opportunity of undermining him in her favour these little intrigues and cabals of the court were silenced by the account which came from all quarters of the vast preparations made by the spaniards for the invasion of england and for the entire conquest of that kingdom philip though he had not yet declared war on account of the hostilities which elizabeth everywhere committed upon him had long harboured a secret and violent desire of revenge against her his ambition also and the hopes of extending his empire were much encouraged by the present prosperous state of his affairs by the conquest of portugal the acquisition of the east indian commerce and settlements and the yearly importation of vast treasures from america the point on which he rested his highest glory the perpetual object of his policy was to support orthodoxy and exterminate heresy and as the power and credit of elizabeth were the chief bulwark of the protestants he hoped if he could subdue that princess to acquire the eternal renown of reuniting the whole christian world in the catholic communion above all his indignation against his revolted subjects in the netherlands instigated him to attack the english who had encouraged that insurrection and who by their vicinity were so well enabled to support the hollanders that he could never hope to reduce these rebels while the power of that kingdom remained entire and unbroken to subdue england seemed a necessary preparative to the re-establishment of his authority in the netherlands 
and notwithstanding appearances the former was itself as a more important so a more easy undertaking than the latter the kingdom lay nearer spain than the low countries and was more exposed to invasions from that quarter after an enemy had once obtained entrance the difficulty seemed to be over as it was neither fortified by land or nature a long peace had deprived it of all military discipline and experience and the catholics in which it still abounded would be ready it was hoped to join any invader who should free them from those persecutions under which they laboured and should revenge the death of the queen of scots on whom they had fixed all their attention the fate of england must be decided in one battle at sea and another at land and what comparison between the english and spaniards either in point of naval force or in the numbers reputation and veteran bravery of their armies besides the acquisition of so great a kingdom success against england ensured the immediate subjection of the hollanders who attacked on every hand and deprived of all support must yield their stubborn necks to that yoke which they had so long resisted happily this conquest as it was of the utmost importance to the grandeur of spain would not at present be opposed by the jealousy of other powers naturally so much interested to prevent the success of the enterprise a truce was lately concluded with the turks the empire was in the hands of a friend and near ally and france the perpetual rival of spain was so torn with intestine commotions that she had no leisure to pay attention to her foreign interests this favourable opportunity therefore which might never again present itself must be seized and one bold effort made for acquiring that ascendant in europe to which the present greatness and prosperity of the spaniards seemed so fully to entitle them these hopes and motives engaged philip notwithstanding his cautious temper to undertake this hazardous enterprise and though the prince now created by the pope duke of parma when consulted opposed the attempt at least represented the necessity of previously getting possession of some seaport town in the netherlands which might afford a retreat to the spanish navy it was determined by the catholic monarch to proceed immediately to the execution of his ambitious project during some time he had been secretly making preparations out as soon as the resolution was fully taken every part of his vast empire resounded with the noise of armaments and all his ministers generals and admirals were employed in forwarding the design the marquis of santa croce a sea officer of great reputation and experience was destined to command the fleet and by his counsels were the naval equipments conducted in all the ports of sicily naples spain and portugal artisans were employed in building vessels of uncommon size and force naval stores were bought at a great expense provisions amassed armies levied and quartered in the maritime towns of spain and plans laid for fitting out such a fleet and embarkation as had never before had its equal in europe the military preparations in flanders were no less formidable troops from all quarters were every moment assembling to reinforce the duke of parma capizucci and spinelli conducted forces from italy the marquis of borgaut a prince of the house of austria levied troops in germany the walloon and burgundian regiments were completed or augmented the spanish infantry was supplied with recruits and an army of thirty-four thousand men was assembled in the netherlands and kept in readiness to be transported into england the duke of parma employed all the carpenters whom he could procure either in flanders or in lower germany and the coasts of the baltic and he built at dunkirk and newport but especially at antwerp 
a great number of boats and flat bottom vessels for the transporting of his infantry and cavalry the most renowned nobility and princes of italy and spain were ambitious of sharing in the honour of this great enterprise don amadeus of savoy don john of medicis vespasian gonzaga duke of sabionetta and the duke of pastrana hastened to join the army under the duke of parma about two thousand volunteers in spain many of them men of family had enlisted in the service no doubts were entertained but such vast preparations conducted by officers of such consummate skill must finally be successful and the spaniards ostentatious of their power and elated with vain hopes had already denominated their navy the invincible armada news of these extraordinary preparations soon reached the court of london and notwithstanding the secrecy of the spanish council and their pretending to employ this force in the indies it was easily concluded that they meant to make some effort against england the queen had foreseen the invasion and finding that she must now contend for her crown with the whole force of spain she made preparations for resistance nor was she dismayed with that power by which all europe apprehended she must of necessity be overwhelmed her force indeed seemed very unequal to resist so potent an enemy all the sailors in england amounted at that time to about fourteen thousand men the size of the english shipping was in general so small that except a few of the queen's ships of war there were not four vessels belonging to the merchants which exceeded four hundred tons the royal navy consisted of only twenty-eight sail many of which were of small size none of them exceeded the bulk of our largest frigates and most of them deserved rather the name of pinnaces than of ships the only advantage of the english fleet consisted in the dexterity and courage of the seamen who being accustomed to sail in tempestuous seas and expose themselves to all dangers as much exceeded in this particular the spanish mariners as their vessels were inferior in size and force to those of that nation all the commercial towns of england were required to furnish ships for reinforcing this small navy and they discovered on the present occasion great alacrity in defending their liberty and religion against those imminent perils with which they were menaced the citizens of london in order to show their zeal in the common cause instead of fifteen vessels which they were commanded to equip voluntarily fitted out double the number the gentry and nobility hired and armed and manned forty-three ships at their own charge and all the loans of money which the queen demanded were frankly granted by the persons applied to lord howard of effingham a man of courage and capacity was admiral and took on him the command of the navy drake hawkins and frobisher the most renowned seamen in europe served under him the principal fleet was stationed at plymouth the smaller squadron consisting of forty vessels english and flemish was commanded by lord seymour second son of protector somerset and lay off dunkirk in order to intercept the duke of parma the land forces of england compared to those of spain possessed contrary qualities to its naval power they were more numerous than the enemy but much inferior in discipline reputation and experience an army of twenty thousand men was disposed in different bodies along the south coast and orders were given them if they could not prevent the landing of the spaniards to retire backwards to waste the country around and wait for reinforcement from the neighbouring counties before they approached the enemy a body of twenty two thousand foot and a thousand horse under the command of the earl of leicester was stationed at tilbury in order to defend the capital the principal army consisted of thirty four thousand foot and two thousand horse and was commanded by lord hunsdon 
these forces were reserved for guarding the queen's person and were appointed to march whithersoever the enemy should appear the fate of england if all the spanish armies should be able to land seemed to depend on the issue of a single battle and men of reflection entertained the most dismal apprehensions when they considered the force of fifty thousand veteran spaniards commanded by experienced officers under the duke of parma the most consummate general of the age and compared this formidable armament with the military power which england not enervated by peace but long disused to war could muster up against it the chief support of the kingdom seemed to consist in the vigour and prudence of the queen's conduct who undismayed by the present dangers issued all her orders with tranquillity animated her people to a steady resistance and employed every resource which either her domestic situation or her foreign alliances could afford her she sent sir robert sidney into scotland and exhorted the king to remain attached to her and to consider the danger at which present menaced his sovereignty no less than her own from the ambition of the spanish tyrant the ambassador found james well disposed to cultivate a union with england and that prince even kept himself prepared to march with the force of his whole kingdom to the assistance of elizabeth her authority with the king of denmark and the tie of their common religion engaged this monarch upon her application to seize a squadron of ships which philip had bought or hired in the danish harbours the hans towns though not at that time on good terms with elizabeth were induced by the same motives to retard so long the equipment of some vessels in their ports that they became useless to the purpose of invading england all the protestants throughout europe regarded this enterprise as the critical event which was to decide forever the fate of their religion and though unable by reason of their distance to join their force to that of elizabeth they kept their eyes fixed on her conduct and fortune and beheld with anxiety mixed with admiration the intrepid countenance with which she encountered that dreadful tempest which was every moment advancing towards her the queen was also sensible that next to the general popularity which she enjoyed and the confidence which her subjects reposed in her prudent government the firmest support of her throne consisted in the general zeal of the people for the protestant religion and the strong prejudices which they had imbibed against popery she took care on the present occasion to revive in the nation this attachment to their own sect and this abhorrence of the opposite the english were reminded of their former danger from the tyranny of spain all the barbarities exercised by mary against the protestants were ascribed to the counsels of that bigoted and imperious nation the bloody massacres in the indies the unrelenting executions in the low countries the horrid cruelties and iniquities of the inquisition were set before men's eyes a list and description was published and pictures dispersed of the several instruments of torture with which it was pretended the spanish armada was loaded and every artifice as well as reason was employed to animate the people to a vigorous defence of their religion their laws and their liberties End of section thirty chapter forty two part five Section 31 of Volume 1D of History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688 by David Hume. Volume 1D, Section 31 chapter forty two part six 
but while the queen in this critical emergence roused the animosity of the nation against popery she treated the partisans of that sect with moderation and gave not way to an undistinguishing fury against them though she knew that sixtus quintus the present pope famous for his capacity and his tyranny had fulminated a new bull of communication against her had deposed her had absolved her subjects from their oaths of allegiance had published a crusade against england and had granted plenary indulgences to every one engaged in the present invasion she would not believe that all her catholic subjects could be so blinded as to sacrifice to bigotry their duty to their sovereign and the liberty and independence of their native country she rejected all violent counsels by which she was urged to seek pretences for dispatching the leaders of that party she would not even confine any considerable number of them and the catholics sensible of this good usage generally expressed great zeal for the public service some gentlemen of that sect conscious that they could not justly expect any trust or authority entered themselves as volunteers in the fleet or army some equipped ships at their own charge and gave the command of them to protestants others were active in animating their tenants and vassals and neighbours to the defence of their country and every rank of men burying for the present all party distinctions seemed to prepare themselves with order as well as vigour to resist the violence of these invaders the more to excite the martial spirit of the nation the queen appeared on horseback in the camp at tilbury and riding through the lines discovered a cheerful and animated countenance exhorted the soldiers to remember their duty to their country and their religion and professed her intention though a woman to lead them herself into the field against the enemy and rather to perish in battle than survive the ruin and slavery of her people by this spirited behaviour she revived the tenderness and admiration of the soldiery an attachment to her person became a kind of enthusiasm among them and they asked one another whether it were possible that englishmen could abandon this glorious cause could display less fortitude than appeared in the female sex or could ever by any dangers be induced to relinquish the defence of their heroic princess the spanish armada was ready in the beginning of may but the moment it was preparing to sail the marquis of santa croce the admiral was seized with a fever of which he soon after died the vice-admiral the duke of paliano by a strange concurrence of accidents at the very same time suffered the same fate and the king appointed for admiral the duke of medina sidonia a nobleman of great family but unexperienced in action and entirely unacquainted with sea affairs alcerade was appointed vice-admiral this misfortune besides the loss of so great an officer as santa croce retarded the sailing of the armada and gave the english more time for their preparations to oppose them at last the spanish fleet full of hopes and alacrity set sail from lisbon but next day met with a violent tempest which scattered the ships sunk some of the smallest and forced the rest to take shelter in the groin where they waited till they could be refitted when news of this event was carried to england the queen concluded that the design of an invasion was disappointed for this summer and being always ready to lay hold on every pretence for saving money she made walsingham write to the admiral directing him to lay up some of the larger ships and to discharge the seamen but lord effingham who was not so sanguine in his hopes 
used the freedom to disobey these orders and he begged leave to retain all the ships in service though it should be at his own expense he took advantage of a north wind and sailed towards the coast of spain with an intention of attacking the enemy in their harbours but the wind changing to the south he became apprehensive lest they might have set sail and by passing him at sea invade england now exposed by the absence of the fleet he returned therefore with the utmost expedition to plymouth and lay at anchor in that harbour meanwhile all the damages of the armada were repaired and the spaniards with fresh hopes set out again to sea in prosecution of their enterprise the fleet consisted of a hundred and thirty vessels of which near a hundred were galleons and were of greater size than any ever before used in europe it carried on board nineteen thousand two hundred and ninety five soldiers eight thousand four hundred and fifty six mariners two thousand and eighty eight galley slaves and two thousand six hundred and thirty great pieces of brass ordnance it was victualled for six months and was attended by twenty lesser ships called caravals and ten salves with six oars apiece the plan formed by the king of spain was that the armada should sail to the coast opposite to dunkirk and newport and having chased away all english or flemish vessels which might obstruct the passage for it was never supposed they could make opposition should join themselves with the duke of parma should thence make sail to the thames and having landed the whole spanish army thus complete at one blow the entire conquest of england in prosecution of this scheme philip gave orders to the duke of medina that in passing along the channel he should sail as near the coast of france as he could with safety that he should by this policy avoid meeting with the english fleet and keeping in view the main enterprise should neglect all smaller successes which might prove an obstacle or even interpose a delay to the acquisition of a kingdom after the armada was under sail they took a fisherman who informed them that the english admiral had been lately at sea had heard of the tempest which scattered the armada had retired back into plymouth and no longer expecting an invasion this season had laid up his ships and discharged most of the seamen from this false intelligence the duke of medina conceived the great facility of attacking and destroying the english ships in harbour and he was tempted by the prospect of so decisive an advantage to break his orders and make sail directly for plymouth a resolution which proved the safety of england the lizard was the first land made by the armada about sunset and as the spaniards took it for the ram head near plymouth they bore out to sea with an intention of returning next day and attacking the english navy they were descried by fleming a scottish pirate who was roving in those seas and who immediately set sail to inform the english admiral of their approach another fortunate event which contributed extremely to the safety of the fleet effingham had just time to get out of port when he saw the spanish armada coming full sail towards him disposed in the form of a crescent and stretching the distance of seven miles from the extremity of one division to that of the other the writers of that age raise their style by a pompous description of this spectacle the most magnificent that had ever appeared upon the ocean infusing equal terror and admiration into the minds of all beholders the lofty masts the swelling sails and the towering prows of the spanish galleons seem impossible to be justly painted but by assuming the colours of poetry and an eloquent historian of italy in imitation of camden 
has asserted that the armada though the ships bore every sail yet advanced with a slow motion as if the ocean groaned with supporting and the winds were tired with impelling so enormous a weight the truth however is that the largest of the spanish vessels would scarcely pass for third rates in the present navy of england yet were they so ill-framed or so ill-governed that they were quite unwieldy and could not sail upon a wind nor tack on occasion nor be managed in stormy weather by the seamen neither the mechanics of shipbuilding nor the experience of mariners had attained so great perfection as could serve for the security and government of such bulky vessels and the english who had already had experienced how unserviceable they commonly were beheld without dismay their tremendous appearance effingham gave orders not to come to close fight with the spaniards where the size of the ships he suspected and the numbers of the soldiers would be a disadvantage to the english but to cannonade them at a distance and to wait the opportunity which winds currents or various accidents must afford him of intercepting some scattered vessels of the enemy nor was it long before the event answered expectation a great ship of bisky on a board of which was a considerable part of the spanish money took fire by accident and while all hands were employed in extinguish the flames she fell behind the rest of the armada the great galleon of andalusia was detained by the springing of her mast and both of these vessels were taken after some resistance by sir francis drake as the armada advanced up the channel the english hung upon its rear and still infested it with skirmishes each trial abated the confidence of the spaniards and added courage to the english and the latter soon found that even in close fight the size of the spanish ships was no advantage to them their bulk exposed them the more to the fire of the enemy while their cannon placed too high shot over the heads of the english the alarm having now reached the coast of england the nobility and gentry hastened out with their vessels from every harbour and reinforced the admiral the earls of oxford northumberland and cumberland sir thomas cecil sir robert cecil sir walter raleigh sir thomas vavasour sir thomas gerard sir charles blount with many others distinguished themselves by this generous and disinterested service of their country the english fleet after the conjunction of those ships amounted to a hundred and forty sail the armada had now reached calais and cast anchor before that place in expectation that the duke of parma who had gotten intelligence of their approach would put to sea and join his forces to them the english admiral practised here a successful stratagem upon the spaniards he took eight of his smaller ships and filling them with all combustible materials sent them one after another into the midst of the enemy the spaniards fancied that they were fireships of the same contrivance with a famous vessel which had lately done so much execution in the scheld near antwerp and they immediately cut their cables and took to flight with the greatest disorder and precipitation the english fell upon them next morning while in confusion and besides doing a great damage to other ships they took or destroyed about twelve of the enemy by this time it was become apparent that the intention for which these preparations were made by the spaniards was entirely frustrated the vessels provided by the duke of parma were made for transporting soldiers not for fighting and that general when urged to leave the harbour positively refused to expose his flourishing army to such apparent hazard while the english not only were able to keep the sea but seemed even to triumph over their enemy 
the Spanish admiral found in many re-encounters that while he lost so considerable a part of his own navy, he had destroyed only one small vessel of the English, and he foresaw that by continuing so unequal a combat he must draw inevitable destruction on all the remainder. He prepared, therefore, to return homewards, but as the wind was contrary to his passage through the channel, he resolved to sail northwards, and making the tour of the island, reach the Spanish harbours by the ocean. The English fleet followed him during some time, and had not their ammunition fallen short by the negligence of the offices in supplying them, they had obliged the whole armada to surrender at discretion. The Duke of Medina had once taken that resolution, but was diverted from it by the advice of his confessor. This conclusion of the enterprise would have been more glorious to the English, but the event proved almost equally fatal to the Spaniards. A violent tempest overtook the armada after it passed the Orkneys. The ships had already lost their anchors, and were obliged to keep to sea. The mariners, unaccustomed to such hardships, and not able to govern such unwieldy vessels, yielded to the fury of the storm, and allowed their ships to drive either on the western isles of Scotland, or on the coast of Ireland, where they were miserably wrecked. Not a half of the navy returned to Spain, and the seamen, as well as soldiers who remained, were so overcome with hardships and fatigue, and so dispirited by their discomfiture, that they filled all Spain with accounts of the desperate valour of the English, and of the tempestuous violence of that ocean which surrounds them. Such was the miserable and dishonourable conclusion of an enterprise which had been preparing for three years, which had exhausted the revenue and force of Spain, and which had long filled all Europe with anxiety or expectation. Philip, who was a slave to his ambition, but had an entire command over his countenance, no sooner heard of the mortifying event which blasted all his hopes, than he fell on his knees, and rendering thanks for that gracious dispensation of providence, expressed his joy that the calamity was not greater. The Spanish priests, who had so often blessed this holy crusade, and foretold its infallible success, were somewhat at a loss to account for the victory gained over the Catholic monarch by excommunicated heretics and an execrable usurper. But they at last discovered that all the calamities of the Spaniards had proceeded from their allowing the infidel Moors to live among them. Soon after the defeat and dispersion of the Spanish Armada, the Queen summoned a new Parliament, and received from them a supply of two subsidies and four fifteenths, payable in four years. This is the first instance that subsidies were doubled in one supply, and so unusual a concession was probably obtained from the joy of the present success and from the general sense of the queen's necessities some members objected to this heavy charge on account of the great burden of loans which had lately been imposed upon the nation end of section thirty one chapter forty two part six section thirty two of volume one d of history of england from the invasion of julius caesar to the revolution of sixteen eighty eight this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org history of england from the invasion of julius caesar to the revolution of sixteen eighty eight by david hume volume one d section thirty two chapter forty two part seven Elizabeth foresaw that this House of Commons, like all the foregoing, would be governed by the Puritans, 
and therefore to obviate their enterprises she renewed at the beginning of the session her usual injunction that the parliament should not on any account presume to treat of matters ecclesiastical notwithstanding this strict inhibition the zeal of one damport moved him to present a bill to the commons for remedying spiritual grievances and for restraining the tyranny of the ecclesiastical commission which were certainly great but when mr secretary woley reminded the house of her majesty's commands no one durst second the motion the bill was not so much as read and the speaker returned it to damport without taking the least notice of it some members of the house notwithstanding the general submission were even committed to custody on account of this attempt the imperious conduct of elizabeth appeared still more clearly in another parliamentary transaction the right of purveyance was an ancient prerogative by which the officers of the crown could at pleasure take provisions for the household from all the neighbouring counties and could make use of the carts and carriages of the farmers and the price of these commodities and services was fixed and stated the payment of the money was often distant and uncertain and the rates being fixed before the discovery of the west indies were much inferior to the present market price so that purveyance besides the slavery of it was always regarded as a great burden and being arbitrary and casual was liable to great abuses we may fairly presume that the hungry courtiers of elizabeth supported by her unlimited power would be sure to render this prerogative very oppressive to the people and the commons had last session found it necessary to pass a bill for regulating those exactions but the bill was lost in the house of peers the continuance of the abuses begat a new attempt for redress and the same bill was now revived and again sent up to the house of peers together with a bill for some new regulations in the court of exchequer soon after the commons received a message from the upper house desiring them to appoint a committee for a conference at this conference the peers informed them that the queen by a message delivered by lord burley had expressed her displeasure that the commons should presume to touch on her prerogative if there were any abuses she said either in imposing purveyance or in the practice of the court of exchequer her majesty was both able and willing to provide due reformation but would not permit the parliament to intermeddle in these matters the commons alarmed at this intelligence appointed another committee to attend the queen and endeavour to satisfy her of their humble and dutiful intentions elizabeth gave gracious reception to the committee she expressed her great inestimable loving care towards her loving subjects which she said was greater than of her own self or even than any of them could have of themselves she told them that she had already given orders for an inquiry into the abuses attending purveyance but the dangers of the spanish invasion had retarded the progress of the design that she had as much skill will and power to rule her household as any subjects whatsoever to govern theirs and needed as little the assistance of her neighbours that the exchequer was her chamber consequently more near to her than even her household and therefore the less proper for them to intermeddle with and that she would of herself with advice of her counsel and the judges redress every grievance in these matters but would not permit the commons by laws moved without her privity to bereave her of the honour of attending these regulations 
the issue of this matter was the same that attended all contests between elizabeth and her parliaments she seems even to have been more imperious in this particular than her predecessors at least her more remote ones for they often permitted the abuses of purveyance to be addressed by law edward the third a very arbitrary prince allowed ten several statutes to be enacted for that purpose in so great awe did the commons stand of every courtier as well as of the crown that they durst use no freedom of speech which they thought would give the least offence to any of them sir edward hobby showed in the house his extreme grief that by some great personage not a member of the house he had been sharply rebuked for speeches delivered in Parliament. He craved the favour of the House, and desired that some of the members might inform that great personage of his true meaning and intention in these speeches. The Commons, to obviate these inconveniences, passed a vote that no one should reveal the secrets of the House. The discomfiture of the Armada had begotten in the nation a kind of enthusiastic passion for enterprises against spain and nothing seemed now impossible to be achieved by the valour and fortune of the english don antonio prior of crato a natural son of the royal family of portugal trusting to the aversion of his countrymen against the castilians had advanced a claim to the crown and flying first to france thence to england had been encouraged both by henry and elizabeth in his pretensions a design was formed by the people not the court of england to conquer the kingdom for don antonio sir francis drake and sir john norris were the leaders in this romantic enterprise near twenty thousand volunteers enlisted themselves in the service and ships were hired as well as arms provided at the charge of the adventurers the queen's frugality kept her from contributing more than sixty thousand pounds to the expense and she allowed only six of her ships of war to attend the expedition there was more spirit and bravery than foresight or prudence in the conduct of this enterprise the small stock of the adventurers did not enable them to buy either provisions or ammunition sufficient for such an undertaking. They even wanted vessels to stow the numerous volunteers who crowded to them, and they were obliged to seize by force some ships of the Hans towns, which they met with at sea, an expedient which set them somewhat at ease in point of room for their men but remedied not the deficiency of their provisions had they sailed directly to portugal it is believed that the good will of the people joined to the defenceless state of the country might have ensured them of success but hearing that great preparations were making at the groin for the invasion of england they were induced to go thither and destroy this new armament of spain they broke into the harbour, burned some ships of war, particularly one commanded by Ricalda, vice-admiral of Spain. They defeated an army of four or five thousand men, which was assembled to oppose them. They assaulted the groin, and took the lower town which they pillaged, and they would have taken the higher, though well fortified, had they not found their ammunition and provisions beginning to fail them the young earl of essex a nobleman of promising hopes who fired with the thirst of military honour had secretly unknown to the queen stolen from england here joined the adventurers and it was then agreed by common consent to make sail for portugal the main object of their enterprise the english landed at paniche a seaport town twelve leagues from lisbon and norris led the army to that capital while drake undertook to sail up the river 
and attack the city with united forces by this time the court of spain had got a leisure to prepare against the invasion forces were thrown into lisbon the portuguese were disarmed all suspected persons were taken into custody and thus though the inhabitants bore great affection to don antonio none of them durst declare in favour of the invaders the english army however made themselves masters of the suburbs which abounded with riches of all kinds but as they desired to conciliate the affections of the portuguese and were more intent on honour than profit they observed a strict discipline and abstained from all plunder meanwhile they found their ammunition and provisions much exhausted they had not a single cannon to make a breach in the walls the admiral had not been able to pass some fortresses which guarded the river there was no appearance of an insurrection in their favour sickness from fatigue hunger and intemperance in wine and fruits had seized the army so that it was found necessary to make all possible haste to re-embark they were not pursued by the enemy and finding at the mouth of the river sixty ships laden with naval stores they seized them as lawful prize though they belonged to the hans towns a neutral power they sailed thence to vigo which they took and burned and having ravaged the country around they set sail and arrived in england above half of these gallant adventurers perished by sickness famine fatigue and the sword and england reaped more honour than profit from this extraordinary enterprise it is computed that eleven hundred gentlemen embarked on board the fleet and that only three hundred and fifty survived those multiplied disasters when these ships were on their voyage homewards they met with the earl of cumberland who was outward bound with a fleet of seven sail all equipped at his own charge except one ship of war which the queen had lent him that nobleman supplied sir francis drake with some provisions a generosity which saved the lives of many of drake's men but for which the others afterwards suffered severely cumberland sailed towards the tirceras and took several prizes from the enemy but the richest valued at a hundred thousand pounds perished in her return with all her cargo near st michael's mount in cornwall many of these adventurers were killed in a rash attempt at the terceras a great mortality seized the rest and it was with difficulty that the few hands which remained were able to steer the ships back into harbour though the signal advantages gained over the spaniards and the spirit thence infused into the english gave elizabeth great security during the rest of her reign she could not forbear keeping an anxious eye on scotland whose situation rendered its revolutions always of importance to her it might have been expected that this high-spirited princess who knew so well to brave danger would not have retained that malignant jealousy towards her heir with which during the lifetime of mary she had been so much agitated james had indeed succeeded to all the claims of his mother but he had not succeeded to the favour of the catholics which could alone render these claims dangerous and as the queen was now well advanced in years and enjoyed an uncontrolled authority over her subjects it was not likely that the king of scots who was of an indolent unambitious temper would ever give her any disturbance in her possession of the throne yet all these circumstances could not remove her timorous suspicions and so far from satisfying the nation by a settlement of the succession or a declaration of james's title 
she was as anxious to prevent every incident which might anywise raise his credit or procure him the regard of the english as if he had been her immediate rival and competitor most of his ministers and favourites were her pensioners and as she was desirous to hinder him from marrying and having children she obliged them to throw obstacles in the way of every alliance even the most reasonable which could be offered him and during some years she succeeded in this malignant policy he had fixed on the elder daughter of the king of denmark who being a remote prince and not powerful could give her no umbrage yet did she so artfully cross this negotiation that the danish monarch impatient of delay married his daughter to the duke of brunswick james then renewed his suit to the younger princess and still found obstacles from the intrigues of elizabeth who merely with a view of interposing delay proposed to him the sister of the king of navarre a princess much older than himself and entirely destitute of fortune the young king besides the desire of securing himself by the prospect of issue from those traitorous attempts too frequent among his subjects had been so watched by the rigid austerity of the ecclesiastics that he had another inducement to marry which is not so usual with monarchs his impatience therefore broke through all the politics of elizabeth the articles of marriage were settled the ceremony was performed by proxy and the princess embarked for scotland but was driven by a storm into a port of norway this tempest and some others which happened near the same time were universally believed in scotland and denmark to have proceeded from a combination of the scottish and danish witches and the dying confession of the criminals was supposed to put the accusation beyond all controversy james however though a great believer in sorcery was not deterred by this incident from taking a voyage in order to conduct his bride home he arrived in norway carried the queen thence to copenhagen and having passed the winter in that city he brought her next spring to scotland where they were joyfully received by the people the clergy alone who never neglected an opportunity of vexing their prince made opposition to the queen's coronation on account of the ceremony of anointing her which they alleged was either a jewish or a popish rite and therefore utterly anti-christian and unlawful but james was as much bent on the ceremony as they were averse to it and after much controversy and many intrigues his authority which had not often happened at last prevailed over their opposition end of section thirty two chapter forty two part seven section thirty three of volume one d of history of england from the invasion of julius caesar to the revolution of sixteen eighty eight this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org history of england from the invasion of julius caesar to the revolution of sixteen eighty eight by david hume Volume 1D, Section 33, Chapter 43, Part 1 Elizabeth After a state of great anxiety and many difficulties, Elizabeth had at length reached a situation where, though her affairs still required attention and found employment for her active spirit, she was removed from all danger of any immediate revolution and might regard the efforts of her enemies with some degree of confidence and security her successful and prudent administration had gained her together with the admiration of foreigners the affections of her own subjects and after the death of the queen of scots even the catholics however discontented pretended not to dispute her title 
or adhere to any other person as her competitor james curbed by his factious nobility and ecclesiastics possessed at home very little authority and was solicitous to remain on good terms with elizabeth and the english nation in hopes that time aided by his patient tranquillity would secure him that rich succession to which his birth entitled him the hollanders though overmatched in their contest with spain still made an obstinate resistance and such was their unconquerable antipathy to their old masters and such the prudent conduct of young morris their governor that the subduing of that small territory if at all possible must be the work of years and the result of many and great successes philip who in his powerful effort against england had been transported by resentment and ambition beyond his usual cautious maxims was now disabled and still more discouraged from adventuring again on such hazardous enterprises the situation also of affairs in france began chiefly to employ his attention but notwithstanding all his artifice and force and expense the events in that kingdom proved every day more contrary to his expectations and more favourable to the friends and confederates of england the violence of the league having constrained henry to declare war against the huguenots these religionists seemed exposed to the utmost danger and elizabeth sensible of the intimate connection between her own interests and those of that party had supported the king of navarre by her negotiations in germany and by large sums of money which she remitted for levying forces in that country this great prince not discouraged by the superiority of his enemies took the field and in the year fifteen eighty seven gained at coutras a complete victory over the army of the french king but as his allies the germans were at the same time discomfited by the army of the league under the duke of guise his situation notwithstanding his victory seemed still as desperate as ever the chief advantage which he reaped by this diversity of success arose from the dissensions which by that means took place among his enemies the inhabitants of paris intoxicated with admiration of guise and strongly prejudiced against their king whose intentions had become suspicious to them took to arms and obliged henry to fly for his safety that prince dissembling his resentment entered into a negotiation with the league and having conferred many high offices on guise and his partisans summoned an assembly of the states at blois on pretence of finding expedients to support the intended war against the huguenots the various scenes of perfidy and cruelty which had been exhibited in france had justly begotten a mutual diffidence among all parties yet guise trusting more to the timidity than honour of the king rashly put himself into the hands of that monarch and expected by the ascendant of his own genius to make him submit to all his exorbitant pretensions henry though of an easy disposition not steady to his resolutions or even to his promises wanted neither courage nor capacity and finding all his subtleties eluded by the vigour of guise and even his throne exposed to the most imminent danger he embraced more violent counsels than were natural to him and ordered that prince and his brother the cardinal of guise to be assassinated in his palace this cruel execution which the necessity of it alone could excuse had nearly proved fatal to the author and seemed at first to plunge him into greater dangers than those which he sought to avoid by taking vengeance on his enemy the partisans of the league were inflamed with the utmost rage against him 
the populace everywhere particularly at paris renounced allegiance to him the ecclesiastics and the preachers filled all places with execrations against his name and the most powerful cities and most opulent provinces appeared to combine in a resolution either of renouncing monarchy or of changing their monarch henry finding slender resource among his catholic subjects was constrained to enter into a confederacy with the huguenots and the king of navarre he enlisted large bodies of swiss infantry and german cavalry and being still supported by his chief nobility he assembled by all these means an army of nearly forty thousand men and advanced to the gates of paris ready to crush the league and subdue all his enemies the desperate resolution of one man diverted the course of these great events jacques clement a dominican friar inflamed by that bloody spirit of bigotry which distinguishes this century and a great part of the following beyond all ages of the world embraced the resolution of sacrificing his own life in order to save the church from the persecutions of an heretical tyrant and having admitted under some pretext to the king's presence he gave that prince a mortal wound and was immediately put to death by the courtiers who hastily revenged the murder of their sovereign this memorable incident happened on the first of august fifteen eighty nine the king of navarre next heir to the crown assumed the government by the title of henry the fourth but succeeded to much greater difficulties than those which surrounded his predecessor the prejudices against his religion made a great part of the nobility immediately desert him and it was only by his promise of hearkening to conferences and instruction that he could engage any of the catholics to adhere to his undoubted title the league governed by the duke of mayenne brother to guise gathered new force and the king of spain entertained views either of dismembering the french monarchy or of annexing the whole to his own dominions in these distressful circumstances henry addressed himself to elizabeth and found her well disposed to contribute to his assistance and to oppose the progress of the catholic league and of philip her inveterate and dangerous enemies to prevent the desertion of his swiss and german auxiliaries she made him a present of twenty-two thousand pounds a greater sum than as he declared he had ever seen before and she sent him a reinforcement of four thousand men under lord willoughby an officer of reputation who joined the french at dieppe strengthened by these supplies henry marched directly to paris and having taken the suburbs sword in hand he abandoned them to be pillaged by his soldiers he employed this body of english in many other enterprises and still found reason to praise their courage and fidelity the time of their service being elapsed he dismissed them with many high commendations sir william drury sir thomas baskerville and sir john burroughs acquired reputation this campaign and revived in france the ancient fame of english valour the army which henry next campaign led into the field was much inferior to that of the league but as it was composed of the chief nobility of france he feared not to encounter his enemies in a pitched battle at ivray and he gained a complete victory over them this success enabled him to blockade paris and he reduced that capital to the last extremity of famine when the duke of parma in consequence of orders from philip marched to the relief of the league and obliged henry to raise the blockade having performed this important service he retreated to the low countries and by his consummate skill in the art of war 
performed these long marches in the face of the enemy without affording the french monarch that opportunity which he sought of giving him battle or so much as once putting his army in disorder the only loss which he sustained was in the low countries where prince maurice took advantage of his absence and recovered some places which the duke of parma had formerly conquered from the states the situation of henry's affairs though promising was not so well advanced or established as to make the queen discontinue her succours and she was still more confirmed in the resolution of supporting him by some advantages gained by the king of spain the duke of mercour governor of brittany a prince of the house of lorraine had declared for the league and finding himself hard pressed by henry's forces he had been obliged in order to secure himself to introduce some spanish troops into the seaport towns of that province elizabeth was alarmed at the danger and foresaw that the spaniards besides infesting the english commerce by privateers might employ these harbours as the seat of their naval preparations and might more easily from that vicinity than from spain or portugal project an invasion of england she concluded therefore a new treaty with henry in which she engaged to send over three thousand men to be employed in the reduction of brittany and she stipulated that her charges should in a twelvemonth or as soon as the enemy was expelled be refunded her these forces were commanded by sir john norris and under him by his brother henry and by anthony shirley sir roger williams was at the head of a small body which garrisoned dieppe and a squadron of ships under the command of sir henry palmer lay upon the coast of france and intercepted all the vessels belonging to the spaniards or the leaguers the operations of war can very little be regulated beforehand by any treaty or agreement and henry who found it necessary to lay aside the projected enterprise against brittany persuaded the english commanders to join his army and to take a share in the hostilities which he carried into picardy notwithstanding the disgust which elizabeth received from this disappointment he laid before her a plan for expelling the leaguers from normandy and persuaded her to send over a new body of four thousand men to assist him in that enterprise the earl of essex was appointed general of these forces a young nobleman who by many exterior accomplishments and still more real merit was daily advancing in favour with elizabeth and seemed to occupy that place in her affections which leicester now deceased had so long enjoyed essex impatient for military fame was extremely uneasy to lie some time at dieppe unemployed and had not the orders which he received from his mistress been so positive he would gladly have accepted of henry's invitation and have marched to join the french army now in champagne this plan of operations was also proposed to elizabeth by the french ambassador but she rejected it with great displeasure and she threatened immediately to recall her troops if henry should persevere any longer in his present practice of breaking all concert with her and attending to nothing but his own interests urged by these motives the french king at last led his army into normandy and laid siege to rouen which he reduced to great difficulties but the league unable of themselves to take the field against him had again recourse to the duke of parma who received orders to march to their relief he executed this enterprise with his usual abilities and success and for the present frustrated all the projects of henry and elizabeth this princess 
who kept still in view the interests of her own kingdom in all her foreign transactions was impatient under these disappointments blamed henry for his negligence in the execution of treaties and complained that the english forces were thrust foremost in every hazardous enterprise it is probable however that their own ardent courage and their desire of distinguishing themselves in so celebrated a theatre of war were the causes why they so often enjoyed this perilous honour notwithstanding the indifferent success of former enterprises the queen was sensible how necessary it was to support henry against the league and the spaniards and she formed a new treaty with him in which they agreed never to make peace with philip but by common consent she promised to send him a new supply of four thousand men and he stipulated to repay her charges in a twelvemonth to employ these forces joined to a body of french troops in an expedition against brittany and to consign into her hands a seaport town of that province for a retreat to the english henry knew the impossibility of executing some of these articles and the imprudence of fulfilling others but finding them rigidly insisted on by elizabeth he accepted of her succours and trusted that he might easily on some pretence be able to excuse his failure in executing his part of the treaty this campaign was the least successful of all those which he had yet carried on against the league during these military operations in france elizabeth employed her naval power against philip and endeavoured to intercept his west indian treasures the source of that greatness which rendered him so formidable to all his neighbours she sent a squadron of seven ships under the command of lord thomas howard for this service but the king of spain informed of her purpose fitted out a great force of fifty-five sail and dispatched them to escort the indian fleet they fell in with the english squadron and by the courageous obstinacy of sir richard greenville the vice-admiral who refused to make his escape by flight they took one vessel the first english ship of war that had yet fallen into the hands of the spaniards the rest of the squadron returned safely into england frustrated of their expectations but pleasing themselves with the idea that their attempt had not been altogether fruitless in hurting the enemy the indian fleet had been so long detained in the havana from the fear of the english that they were obliged at last to set sail in an improper season and most of them perished by shipwreck ere they reached the spanish harbours the earl of cumberland made a like unsuccessful enterprise against the spanish trade he carried out one ship of the queen's and seven others equipped at his own expense but the prizes which he made did not compensate the charges the spirit of these expensive and hazardous adventures was very prevalent in england sir walter raleigh who had enjoyed great favour with the queen finding his interest to decline determined to recover her good graces by some important undertaking and as his reputation was high among his countrymen he persuaded great numbers to engage with him as volunteers in an attempt on the west indies the fleet was detained so long in the channel by contrary winds that the season was lost raleigh was recalled by the queen sir martin frobisher succeeded to the command and made a privateering voyage against the spaniards he took one rich carrack near the island of flores and destroyed another about the same time thomas white a londoner took two spanish ships which besides fourteen hundred chests of quicksilver contained above two millions of bulls for indulgences a commodity useless to the english 
but which had cost the king of spain three hundred thousand florins and would have been sold by him in the indies for five millions this war did great damage to spain but it was attended with considerable expense to england and elizabeth's ministers computed that since the commencement of it she had spent in flanders and france and on her naval expeditions above one million two hundred thousand pounds a charge which notwithstanding her extreme frugality was too burdensome for her narrow revenues to support she summoned therefore a parliament in order to obtain supply but she either thought her authority so established that she needed to make them no concessions in return or she rated her power and prerogative above money for there never was any parliament whom she treated in a more haughty manner whom she made more sensible of their own weaknesses or whose privileges she more openly violated when the speaker sir edward coke made the three usual requests of freedom from arrests of access to her person and of liberty of speech she replied to him by the mouth of puckering lord keeper that liberty of speech was granted to the commons but they must know what liberty they were entitled to not a liberty for every one to speak what he listeth or what cometh into his brain to utter their privilege extended no further than a liberty of i or no that she enjoined the speaker if he perceived any idle heads so negligent of their own safety as to attempt reforming the church or innovating in the commonwealth that he should refuse the bills exhibited for that purpose till they were examined by such as were fitter to consider of these things and could better judge of them that she would not impeach the freedom of their persons but they must beware lest under colour of this privilege they imagined that any neglect of their duty could be covered or protected and that she would not refuse them access to her person provided it were upon urgent and weighty causes and at times convenient and when she might have leisure from other important affairs of the realm notwithstanding the menacing and contemptuous air of this speech the intrepid and indefatigable peter wentworth not discouraged by his former ill success ventured to transgress the imperial orders of elizabeth he presented to the lord keeper a petition in which he desired the upper house to join with the lower in a supplication to her majesty for entailing the succession of the crown and he declared that he had a bill ready prepared for that purpose this method of proceeding was sufficiently respectful and cautious but the subject was always extremely disagreeable to the queen and what she had expressly prohibited any one from meddling with she sent wentworth immediately to the tower committed sir thomas bromley who had seconded him to the fleet prison together with stevens and welsh two members to whom sir thomas had communicated his intention about a fortnight after a motion was made in the house to petition the queen for the release of these members but it was answered by all the privy councillors there present that her majesty had committed them for causes best known to herself and that to press her on that head would only tend to the prejudice of the gentlemen whom they meant to serve she would release them whenever she thought proper and would be better pleased to do it of her own proper motion than from their suggestion the house willingly acquiesced in this reasoning so arbitrary an act at the commencement of the session might well repress all further attempts for freedom but the religious zeal of the puritans was not so easily restrained and it inspired a courage which no human motive was able to surmount morris chancellor of the duchy and attorney of the court of wards 
made a motion for redressing the abuses in the bishop's courts but above all in the high commission where subscriptions he said were exacted to articles at the pleasure of the prelates where oaths were imposed obliging persons to answer all questions without distinction even though they should tend to their own condemnation and where every one who refused entire satisfaction to the commissioners was imprisoned without relief or remedy end of section thirty three chapter forty three part one section thirty four of volume one d of history of england from the invasion of julius caesar to the revolution of sixteen eighty eight this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org history of england from the invasion of julius caesar to the revolution of sixteen eighty eight by david hume volume one d section thirty four chapter forty three part two this motion was seconded by some members but the ministers and privy councillors opposed it and foretold the consequences which ensued the queen sent for the speaker and after requiring him to deliver to her morris's bill she told him that it was in her power to call parliaments in her power to dissolve them in her power to give assent or dissent to any determination which they should form that her purpose in summoning this parliament was twofold to have laws enacted for the further enforcement of uniformity in religion and to provide for the defence of the nation against the exorbitant power of spain that these two points ought therefore to be the object of their deliberations she had enjoined them already by the mouth of the lord keeper to meddle neither with matters of state nor of religion and she wondered how any one could be so assuming as to attempt a subject so expressly contrary to her prohibition that she was highly offended with this presumption and took the present opportunity to reiterate the commands given by the keeper and to require that no bill regarding either state affairs or reformation in causes ecclesiastical be exhibited in the house and that in particular she charged the speaker upon his allegiance if any such bills were offered absolutely to refuse them a reading and not so much as permit them to be debated by the members this command from the queen was submitted to without further question morris was seized in the house itself by a sergeant-at-arms discharged from his office of chancellor to the duchy incapacitated from any practice in his profession as a common lawyer and kept some years prisoner in tilbury castle the queen having thus expressly pointed out what the house should and should not do the commons were as obsequious to the one as to the other of her injunctions they passed a law against recusants such a law as was suited to the severe character of elizabeth and to the persecuting spirit of the age it was entitled an act to retain her majesty's subjects in their due obedience and was meant as the preamble declares to obviate such inconveniences and perils as might grow from the wicked practices of seditious sectaries and disloyal persons for these two species of criminals were always at that time confounded together as equally dangerous to the peace of society it was enacted that any person above sixteen years of age who obstinately refused during the space of a month to attend public worship should be committed to prison that if after being condemned for this offence he persist three months in his refusal he must abjure the realm 
and that if he either refused this condition or return after banishment he should suffer capitally as a felon without benefit of clergy this law bore equally hard upon the puritans and upon the catholics and had it not been imposed by the queen's authority was certainly in that respect much contrary to the private sentiments and inclinations of the majority of the house of commons very little opposition however appears there to have been openly made to it the expenses of the war with spain having reduced the queen to great difficulties the grant of subsidies seems to have been the most important business of this parliament and it was a signal proof of the high spirit of elizabeth that while conscious of a present dependence on the commons she opened the sentence with the most haughty treatment of them and covered her weakness under such a lofty appearance of superiority the commons readily voted two subsidies and four fifteenths but this sum not appearing sufficient to the court an unusual expedient was fallen upon to induce them to make an enlargement in their concessions the peers informed the commons in a conference that they could not give their assent to the supply voted thinking it too small for the queen's occasions they therefore proposed a grant of three subsidies and six fifteenths and desired a further conference in order to persuade the commons to agree to this measure the commons who had acquired the privilege of beginning bills of subsidy took offence at this procedure of the lords and at first absolutely rejected the proposal but being afraid on reflection that they had by this refusal given offence to their superiors they both agreed to the conference and afterwards voted the additional subsidy the queen notwithstanding this unusual concession of the commons ended the session with a speech containing some reprimands to them and full of the same high pretensions which she had assumed at the opening of the parliament she took notice by the mouth of the keeper that certain members spent more time than was necessary by indulging themselves in harangues and reasonings and she expressed her displeasure on account of their not paying due reverence to privy councillors who she told them were not to be accounted as common knights and burgesses of the house who are councillors but during the parliament whereas the others are standing councillors and for their wisdom and great service are called to the council of the state the queen also in her own person made the parliament a spirited harangue in which she spoke of the justice and moderation of her government expressed the small ambition she had ever entertained of making conquests displayed the just grounds of her quarrel with the king of spain and discovered how little she apprehended the power of that monarch even though he should make a greater effort against her than that of his invincible armada but i am informed added she that when he attempted this last invasion some upon the sea-coast forsook their towns fled up higher into the country and left all naked and exposed to his entrance but i swear unto you by god if i knew those persons or may know of any that shall do so hereafter i will make them feel what it is to be so fearful in so urgent a cause by this menace she probably gave the people to understand that she would execute martial law upon such cowards for there was no statute by which a man could be punished for changing his place of abode the king of france though he had hitherto made war on the league with great bravery and reputation though he had this campaign gained considerable advantages over them and though he was assisted by a considerable body of english under norris who carried hostilities into the heart of brittany was become sensible that he never could 
by force of arms alone render himself master of his kingdom the nearer he seemed by his military successes to approach to a full possession of the throne the more discontent and jealousy arose among those romanists who adhered to him and a party was formed in his own court to elect some catholic monarch of the royal blood if henry should any longer refuse to satisfy them by declaring his conversion this excellent prince was far from being a bigot to his sect and as he deemed these theological disputes entirely subordinate to the public good he had secretly determined from the beginning to come some time or other to the resolution required of him he had found on the death of his predecessor that the huguenots who formed the bravest and most faithful part of his army were such determined zealots that if he had at that time abjured their faith they would instantly have abandoned him to the pretensions and usurpations of the catholics the more bigoted catholics he knew particularly those of the league had entertained such an unsurmountable prejudice against his person and diffidence of his sincerity that even his abjuration would not reconcile them to his title and he must either expect to be entirely excluded from the throne or be admitted to it on such terms as would leave him little more than the mere shadow of royalty in this delicate situation he had resolved to temporize to retain the huguenots by continuing in the profession of their religion to gain the moderate catholics by giving them hopes of his conversion to attach both to his person by conduct and success and he hoped either that the animosity arising from war against the league would make them drop gradually the question of religion or that he might in time after some victories over his enemies and some conferences with divines make finally with more decency and dignity that abjuration which must have appeared at first mean as well as suspicious to both parties when the people are attached to any theological tenets merely from a general persuasion or prepossession they are easily induced by any motive or authority to change their faith in these mysterious subjects as appears from the example of the english who during some reigns usually embraced without scruple the still varying religion of their sovereigns but the french nation where principles had so long been displayed as the badges of faction and where each party had fortified its belief by an animosity against the other were not found so pliable or inconstant and henry was at last convinced that the catholics of his party would entirely abandon him if he gave them not immediate satisfaction in this particular the huguenots also taught by experience clearly saw that his desertion of them was become absolutely necessary for the public settlement and so general was this persuasion among them that as the duke of sully pretends even the divines of that party purposely allowed themselves to be worsted in the disputes and conferences that the king might more readily be convinced of the weakness of their cause and might more cordially and sincerely at least more decently embrace the religion which it was so much his interest to believe if this self-denial in so tender a point should appear incredible and supernatural in theologians it will at least be thought very natural that a prince so little instructed in these matters as henry and desirous to preserve his sincerity should insensibly bend his opinion to the necessity of his affairs and should believe that party to have the best arguments who could alone put him in possession of a kingdom all circumstances therefore being prepared for this great event that monarch renounced the protestant religion 
and was solemnly received by the french prelates of his party into the bosom of the church elizabeth who was herself attached to the protestants chiefly by her interests and the circumstances of her birth and who seems to have entertained some propensity during her whole life to the catholic superstition at least to the ancient ceremonies yet pretended to be extremely displeased with this abjuration of henry and she wrote him an angry letter reproaching him with this interested change of his religion sensible however that the league and the king of spain were still their common enemies she hearkened to his apologies continued her succours both of men and money and formed a new treaty in which they mutually stipulated never to make peace but by common agreement the intrigues of spain were not limited to france and england by means of the never-failing pretence of religion joined to the influence of money philip excited new disorders in scotland and gave fresh alarms to elizabeth george kerr brother to lord newbottle had been taken while he was passing secretly into spain and papers were found about him by which a dangerous conspiracy of some catholic noblemen with philip was discovered the earls of angus errol and huntley the heads of three potent families had entered into a confederacy with the spanish monarch and had stipulated to raise all their forces to join them to a body of spanish troops which philip promised to send into scotland and after re-establishing the catholic religion in that kingdom to march with their united power in order to effect the same purpose in england graham of fintry who had also entered into this conspiracy was taken and arraigned and executed elizabeth sent lord borough ambassador into scotland and exhorted the king to exercise the same severity on the three earls to confiscate their estates and by annexing them to the crown both increase his own domain and set an example to all his subjects of the dangers attending treason and rebellion the advice was certainly rational but not easy to be executed by the small revenue and limited authority of james he desired therefore some supply from her of men and money but though she had reason to deem the prosecution of the three popish earls a common cause she never could be prevailed on to grant him the least assistance the tenth part of the expense which she bestowed in supporting the french king and the states would have sufficed to execute this purpose more immediately essential to her security but she seems ever to have borne some degree of malignity to james whom she hated both as her heir and as the son of mary her hated rival and competitor so far from giving james assistance to prosecute the catholic conspirators the queen rather contributed to increase his inquietude by countenancing the turbulent disposition of the earl of bothwell a nobleman descended from a natural son of james v bothwell more than once attempted to render himself master of the king's person and being expelled the kingdom for these traitorous enterprises he took shelter in england was secretly protected by the queen and lurked near the borders where his power lay with a view of still committing some new violence he succeeded at last in an attempt on the king and by the mediation of the english ambassador imposed dishonourable terms upon that prince but james by the authority of the convention of states annulled this agreement as extorted by violence again expelled bothwell and obliged him to take shelter in england elizabeth pretending ignorance of the place of his retreat never executed the treaties by which she was bound to deliver up all rebels and fugitives to the king of scotland during these disorders increased by the refractory disposition of the ecclesiastics 
the prosecution of the catholic earls remained in suspense but at last the parliament passed an act of attainder against them and the king prepared himself to execute it by force of arms the noblemen though they obtained a victory over the earl of argyle who acted by the king's commission found themselves hard pressed by james himself and agreed on certain terms to leave the kingdom bothwell being defected in a confederacy with them forfeited the favour of elizabeth and was obliged to take shelter first in france then in italy where he died some years after in great poverty the established authority of the queen secured her from all such attempts as james was exposed to from the mutinous disposition of his subjects and her enemies found no other means of giving her domestic disturbance than by such traitorous and perfidious machinations as ended in their own disgrace and in the ruin of their criminal instruments rodrigo lopez a jew domestic physician to the queen being imprisoned on suspicion confessed that he had received a bribe to poison her from fuentes and ibarra who had succeeded parma lately deceased in the government of the netherlands but he maintained that he had no other intention than to cheat philip of his money and never meant to fulfil his engagement he was however executed for the conspiracy and the queen complained to philip of these dishonourable attempts of his ministers but could obtain no satisfaction york and williams two english traitors were afterwards executed for a conspiracy with ibarra equally atrocious instead of avenging herself by retaliating in a like manner elizabeth sought a more honourable vengeance by supporting the king of france and assisting him in finally breaking the force of the league which after the conversion of that monarch went daily to decay and was threatened with speedy ruin and dissolution norris commanded the english forces in brittany and assisted at the taking of morlaix quimper corentin and brest towns garrisoned by spanish forces in every action the english though they had so long enjoyed domestic peace discovered a strong military disposition and the queen though herself a heroine found more frequent occasion to reprove her generals for encouraging their temerity than for countenancing their fear or caution sir martin frobisher her brave admiral perished with many others before brest morlaix had been promised to the english for a place of retreat but the duke d'aumont the french general eluded this promise by making it be inserted in the capitulation that none but catholics should be admitted into that city next campaign the french king who had long carried on hostilities with philip was at last provoked by the taking of chatelet and d'orlon and the attack of cambray to declare war against that monarch elizabeth being threatened with a new invasion in england and with an insurrection in ireland recalled most of her forces and sent norris to command in this latter kingdom finding also that the french league was almost entirely dissolved and that the most considerable leaders had made an accommodation with their prince she thought that he could well support himself by his own force and valour and she began to be more sparing in his cause of the blood and treasure of her subjects some disgusts which she had received from the states joined to the remonstrances of her frugal minister burley made her also inclined to diminish her charges on that side and she even demanded by her ambassador sir thomas bodley to be reimbursed all the money which she had expended in supporting them the states besides alleging the conditions of the treaty by which they were not bound to repay her till the conclusion of a peace pleaded their present poverty and distress the great superiority of the spaniards 
and the difficulty in supporting the war much more in saving money to discharge their encumbrances after much negotiation a new treaty was formed by which the states agreed to free the queen immediately from the charge of the english auxiliaries computed at forty thousand pounds a year to pay her annually twenty thousand pounds for some years to assist her with a certain number of ships and to conclude no peace or treaty without her consent they also bound themselves on finishing a peace with spain to pay her annually the sum of a hundred thousand pounds for four years but on this condition that the payment should be in lieu of all demands and that they should be supplied through their own charge with the body of four thousand auxiliaries from england the queen still retained in her hands the cautionary towns which were a great check on the rising power of the states and she committed the important trust of flushing to sir francis vere a brave officer who had distinguished himself by his valour in the low countries she gave him the preference to essex who expected so honourable a command and though this nobleman was daily rising both in reputation with the people and favour with herself the queen who was commonly reserved in the advancement of her courtiers thought proper on this occasion to give him a refusal sir thomas baskerville was sent over to france at the head of two thousand english with which elizabeth by a new treaty concluded with henry engaged to supply that prince some stipulations for mutual assistance were formed by the treaty and all former engagements were renewed end of section thirty four chapter forty three part two Section 35 of Volume 1D of History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688 by David Hume. Volume 1D, Section 35 chapter forty three part three this body of english were maintained at the expense of the french king yet did henry esteem the supply of considerable advantage on account of the great reputation acquired by the english in so many fortunate enterprises undertaken against the common enemy in the great battle of turnholt gained this campaign by prince morris the English auxiliaries under Sir Francis Vere and Sir Robert Sidney had acquired honour, and the success of that day was universally ascribed to their discipline and valour. Though Elizabeth, at a considerable expense of blood and treasure, made war against Philip in France and the Low Countries, the most severe blows which she gave him were those by naval enterprises which either she or her subjects scarcely ever intermitted during one season in fifteen ninety four richard hawkins son of sir john the famous navigator procured the queen's commission and sailed with three ships to the south sea by the straits of magellan but his voyage proved unfortunate and he himself was taken prisoner on the coast of chile james lancaster was supplied the same year with three ships and a pinnace by the merchants of london and was more fortunate in his adventure he took thirty-nine ships of the enemy and not content with this success he made an attack on fernambuc in brazil where he knew great treasures were at that time lodged as he approached the shore he saw it lined with great numbers of the enemy but nowise daunted at this appearance he placed the stoutest of his men in boats and ordered them to row with such violence on the landing-place as to split them in pieces by this bold action he both deprived his men of all resources but in victory and terrified the enemy who fled after a short resistance 
he returned home with the treasure which he had so bravely acquired in fifteen ninety five sir walter raleigh who had anew forfeited the queen's friendship by an intrigue with a maid of honour and who had been thrown into prison for this demeanour no sooner recovered his liberty than he was pushed by his active and enterprising genius to attempt some great action the success of the first spanish adventurers against mexico and peru had begotten an extreme avidity in europe and a prepossession universally took place that in the inland parts of south america called guiana a country as yet undiscovered there were mines and treasures far exceeding any which cortez or pizarro had met with raleigh whose turn of mind was somewhat romantic and extravagant undertook at his own charge the discovery of this wonderful country having taken the small town of st joseph in the isle of trinidado where he found no riches he left his ship and sailed up the river orinoco in pinnaces but without meeting anything to answer his expectations on his return he published an account of the country full of the grossest and most palpable lies that were ever attempted to be imposed on the credulity of mankind the same year sir francis drake and sir john hawkins undertook a more important expedition against the spanish settlements in america and they carried with them six ships of the queen's and twenty more which either were fitted out at their own charge or were furnished them by private adventurers sir thomas baskerville was appointed commander of the land forces which they carried on board their first design was to attempt puerto rico where they knew a rich carrack was at that time stationed but as they had not preserved the requisite secrecy a pinnace having strayed from the fleet was taken by the spaniards and betrayed the intentions of the english preparations were made in that island for their reception and the english fleet notwithstanding the brave assault which they made on the enemy was repulsed with loss hawkins soon after died and drake pursued his voyage to nombre de dios on the isthmus of darien where having landed his men he attempted to pass forward to panama with a view of plundering that place or if he found such a scheme practicable of keeping and fortifying it but he met not with the same facility which had attended his first enterprises in those parts the spaniards taught by experience had everywhere fortified the passes and had stationed troops in the woods who so infested the english by continual alarms and skirmishes that they were obliged to return without being able to effect anything Drake himself, from the intemperance of the climate, the fatigues of his journey, and the vexation of his disappointment, was seized with the distemper of which he soon after died. Sir Thomas Baskerville took the command of the fleet, which was in a weak condition, and after having fought a battle near Cuba with a Spanish fleet, of which the event was not decisive, he returned to England. The Spanish suffered some loss from this enterprise, but the English reaped no profit. The bad success of this enterprise in the Indies made the English rather attempt the Spanish dominions in Europe, where they heard Philip was making great preparations for a new invasion of England. A powerful fleet was equipped at Plymouth, consisting of a hundred and seventy vessels, seventeen of which were capital ships of war the rest tenders and small vessels twenty ships were added by the hollanders in this fleet there were computed to be embarked six thousand three hundred and sixty soldiers a thousand volunteers and six thousand seven hundred and seventy two seamen besides the dutch the land forces were commanded by the earl of essex the navy by lord effingham high admiral both these commanders had expended great sums of their own in the armament for such was the spirit of elizabeth's reign lord thomas howard sir walter raleigh sir francis vere sir george carew and sir coniers clifford 
had commands in this expedition and were appointed counsel to the general and admiral the fleet set sail on the first of june fifteen ninety six and meeting with a fair wind bent its course to cadiz at which place by sealed orders delivered to all the captains the general rendezvous was appointed they sent before them some armed tenders which intercepted every ship that could carry intelligence to the enemy and they themselves were so fortunate when they came near cadiz as to take an irish vessel by which they learned that that port was full of merchant ships of great value and that the spaniards lived in perfect security without any apprehensions of an enemy this intelligence much encouraged the english fleet and gave them the prospect of a fortunate issue to the enterprise after a fruitless attempt to land at st sebastian's on the western side of the island of cadiz it was upon deliberation resolved by the council of war to attack the ships and galleys in the bay this attempt was deemed rash and the admiral himself who was cautious in his temper had entertained great scruples with regard to it but essex strenuously recommended the enterprise and when he found the resolution at last taken he threw his hat into the sea and gave symptoms of the most extravagant joy he felt however a great mortification when effingham informed him that the queen anxious for his safety and dreading the effects of his youthful ardour had secretly given orders that he should not be permitted to command the van in the attack that duty was performed by sir walter raleigh and lord thomas howard but essex no sooner came within reach of the enemy than he forgot the promise which the admiral had extracted from him to keep in the midst of the fleet he broke through and pressed forward into the thickest of the fire emulation for glory avidity of plunder animosity against the spaniards proved incentives to every one and the enemy was soon obliged to slip anchor and retreat farther into the bay where they ran many of their ships aground essex then landed his men at the fort of pontal and immediately marched to the attack of cadiz which the impetuous valour of the english soon carried sword in hand the generosity of essex not inferior to his valour made him stop the slaughter and treat his prisoners with the greatest humanity and even affability and kindness the english made rich plunder in the city but missed of a much richer by the resolution which the duke of medina the spanish admiral took of setting fire to the ships in order to prevent their falling into the hands of the enemy it was computed that the loss which the spaniards sustained in this enterprise amounted to twenty millions of ducats besides the indignity which that proud and ambitious people suffered from the sacking of one of their chief cities and destroying in their harbour a fleet of such force and value essex all on fire for glory regarded this great success only as a step to future achievements he insisted on keeping possession of cadiz and he undertook with four hundred men and three months provisions to defend the place till succours should arrive from england but all the other seamen and soldiers were satisfied with the honour which they had acquired and were impatient to return home in order to secure their plunder every other proposal of essex to annoy the enemy met with a like reception his scheme for intercepting the carracks at the azores for assaulting the groin for taking st andero and st sebastian and the english finding it so difficult to drag this impatient warrior from the enemy at last left him on the spanish coast attended by very few ships he complained much to the queen of their want of spirit in this enterprise nor was she pleased that they had returned without attempting to intercept the indian fleet but the great success in the enterprise on cadiz had covered all their miscarriages and that princess though she admired the lofty genius of essex could not forbear expressing an esteem for the other officers 
the admiral was created earl of nottingham and his promotion gave great disgust to essex in the preamble of the patent it was said that the new dignity was conferred on him on account of his good services in taking cadiz and destroying the spanish ships a merit which essex pretended to belong solely to himself and he offered to maintain this plea by single combat against the earl of nottingham or his sons or any of his kindred the achievements in the subject year proved not so fortunate but as the indian fleet very narrowly escaped the english philip had still reason to see the great hazard and disadvantage of that war in which he was engaged and the superiority which the english by their naval power and their situation had acquired over him the queen having received intelligence that the spaniards though their fleets were so much shattered and destroyed by the expedition to cadiz were preparing a squadron at ferrol and the groin and were marching troops thither with a view of making a descent into ireland was resolved to prevent their enterprise and to destroy the shipping in these harbours she prepared a large fleet of a hundred and twenty sail of which seventeen were her own ships forty-three were smaller vessels and the rest tenders and victuallers. she embarked on board this fleet five thousand new levied soldiers and added a thousand veteran troops whom sir francis vere brought from the netherlands the earl of essex commander-in-chief both of the land and sea forces was at the head of one squadron lord thomas howard was appointed vice-admiral of another sir walter raleigh of the third lord mountjoy commanded the land forces under essex vere was appointed marshal sir george carew lieutenant of the ordnance and sir christopher blount first colonel the earls of rutland and southampton the lords grey cromwell and rich with several other persona of distinction embarked as volunteers essex declared his resolution either to destroy the new armada which threatened england or to perish in the attempt this powerful fleet set sail from plymouth but were no sooner out of harbour than they met with a furious storm which shattered and dispersed them and before they could be refitted essex found that their provisions were so far spent that it would not be safe to carry so numerous an army along with him he dismissed therefore all the soldiers except the thousand veterans under vere and laying aside all thoughts of attacking ferrol or the groin he confined the object of his expedition to the intercepting of the indian fleet which had first been considered only as the second enterprise which he was to attempt the indian fleet in that age by reason of the imperfection of navigation had a stated course as well as season both in their going out and in their return and there were certain islands at which as at fixed stages they always touched and where they took in water and provisions the azores being one of those places where about this time the fleet was expected essex bent his course thither and he informed raleigh that he on his arrival intended to attack fayal one of these islands by some accident the squadrons were separated and raleigh arriving first before fayal thought it more prudent after waiting some time for the general to begin to attack alone lest the inhabitants should by further delay have leisure to make preparations for their defence he succeeded in the enterprise but essex jealous of raleigh expressed great displeasure at his conduct and construed it as an intention of robbing the general of the glory which attended that action he cashiered therefore sidney brett berry and others who had concurred in the attempt and would have proceeded to inflict the same punishment on raleigh himself 
had not lord thomas howard interposed with his good offices and persuaded raleigh though high-spirited to make submissions to the general essex who was placable as well as hasty and passionate was soon appeased and both received raleigh into favour and restored the other officers to their commands this incident however though the quarrel was seemingly accommodated laid the first foundation of that violent animosity which afterwards took place between these two gallant commanders essex next made a disposition proper for intercepting the indian galleons and sir william monson whose station was the most remote of the fleet having fallen in with them made the signals which had been agreed on that able officer in his memoirs ascribes essex failures when he was so near attaining so mighty an advantage to his want of experience in seamanship and the account which he gives of the errors committed by that nobleman appears very reasonable as well as candid the spanish fleet finding that the enemy was upon them made all the sail possible to the terceras and got into the safe and well fortified harbour of angra before the english fleet could overtake them essex intercepted only three ships which however were so rich as to repay all the charges of the expedition the causes of the miscarriage in this enterprise were much canvassed in england upon the return of the fleet and though the courtiers took part differently as they affected either essex or raleigh the people in general who bore an extreme regard to the gallantry spirit and generosity of the former were inclined to justify every circumstance of his conduct the queen who loved the one as much as she esteemed the other maintained a kind of neutrality and endeavoured to share her favours with an impartial hand between the parties sir robert cecil second son of lord burleigh was a courtier of promising hopes much connected with raleigh and she made him secretary of state preferably to sir thomas bodley whom essex recommended for that office but not to disgust essex she promoted him to the dignity of earl marshal of england an office which had been vacant since the death of the earl of shrewsbury essex might perceive from this conduct that she never intended to give him the entire ascendant over his rivals and might thence learn the necessity of moderation and caution but his temper was too high for submission his behaviour too open and candid to practise the arts of a court and his free sallies while they rendered him but more amiable in the eyes of good judges gave his enemies many advantages against him the war with spain though successful having exhausted the queen's exchequer she was obliged to assemble a parliament where yelverton a lawyer was chosen speaker of the house of commons elizabeth took care by the mouth of sir thomas edgerton lord keeper to inform this assembly of the necessity of a supply she said that the wars formerly waged in europe had commonly been conducted by the parties without further view than to gain a few towns or at most a province from each other but the object of the present hostilities on the part of spain was no other than utterly to bereave england of her religion her liberty and her independence that these blessings however she herself had hitherto been able to preserve in spite of the devil the pope and the spanish tyrant and all the mischievous designs of her enemies that in this contest she had dispersed a sum triple to all the parliamentary supplies granted her and besides expending her ordinary revenues had been obliged to sell many of the crown lands and that she could not doubt but her subjects in a cause where their own honour and interests were so deeply concerned would willingly contribute to such moderate taxations as should be found necessary for the common defence the parliament granted her three subsidies and six fifteenths the same supply which had been given four years before 
but which had then appeared so unusual that they had voted it should never afterwards be regarded as a precedent. The Commons this session ventured to engage in two controversies about forms with the House of Peers, a prelude to those encroachments which, as they assumed more courage, they afterwards made upon the prerogatives of the Crown. They complained that the Lords failed in civility to them by receiving their messages sitting with their hats on, and that the Keeper returned an answer in the same negligent posture. But the upper house proved to their full satisfaction that they were not entitled by custom and the usage of parliament to any more respect some amendments had been made by the lords to a bill sent up by the commons and these amendments were written on parchment and returned with the bill to the commons the lower house took umbrage at the novelty they pretended that these amendments ought to have been written on paper not on parchment, and they complained of this innovation to the peers. The peers replied that they expected not such a frivolous objection from the gravity of the house, and that it was not material whether the amendments were written on parchment or on paper, nor whether the paper were white, black, or brown. The commons were offended at this reply, which seemed to contain a mockery of them, and they complained of it, though without obtaining any satisfaction. An application was made by way of petition to the Queen from the lower house against monopolies, an abuse which had risen to an enormous height, and they received a gracious, though a general answer, for which they returned their thankful acknowledgments. End of section 35, chapter 43, part 3. Section 36 of Volume 1D of History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688 by David Hume, Volume 1D. Section 36, Chapter 43, Part 4 But not to give them too much encouragement in such applications, she told them in the speech which she delivered at their dissolution, that with regard to these patents, she hoped that her dutiful and loving subjects would not take away her prerogative, which is the chief flower in her garden, and the principal and head pearl in her crown and diadem, but that they would rather leave these matters to her disposal. The commons also took notice this session of some transactions in the court of high commission, but not till they had previously obtained permission from her majesty to that purpose. Elizabeth had reason to foresee that parliamentary supplies would now become more necessary to her than ever, and that the chief burden of the war with Spain would thenceforth lie upon England. Henry had received an overture for peace with Philip, but before he would proceed to a negotiation, he gave intelligence of it to his allies, the Queen and the States that if possible a general pacification might be made by common agreement. These two powers sent ambassadors to France in order to remonstrate against peace. The Queen, Sir Robert Cecil and Henry Herbert, the States, Justin Nassau and John Barnevelt. Henry said to these ministers that his early education had been amidst war and danger and he had passed the whole course of his life either in arms or in military preparations, that after the proofs which he had given of his alacrity in the field, no one could doubt but he would willingly for his part have continued in a course of life to which he was now habituated. 
till the common enemy were reduced to such a condition as to no longer to give umbrage either to him or to his allies that no private interests of his own not even those of his people nothing but the most invincible necessity could ever induce him to think of a separate peace with philip or make him embrace measures not entirely conformable to the wishes of all his confederates that his kingdom torn with the convulsions of civil wars of nearly half a century required some interval of repose ere it could reach a condition in which it might sustain itself much more support its allies that after the minds of his subjects were composed to tranquillity and accustomed to obedience after his finances were brought into order and after agriculture and the arts were restored france instead of being a burden as at present to her confederates would be able to lend them effectual succour and amply to repay them all the assistance which she had received during her calamities and that if the ambition of spain would not at present grant them such terms as they should think reasonable he hoped that in a little time he should attain such a situation as would enable him to mediate more effectually and with more decisive authority on their behalf the ambassadors were sensible that these reasons were not feigned and they therefore remonstrated with the less vehemence against the measures which they saw henry was determined to pursue the states knew that monarch was interested never to permit their final ruin and having received private assurances that he would still notwithstanding the peace give them assistance both of men and money they were well pleased to remain on terms of amity with him his greatest concern was to give satisfaction to elizabeth for this breach of treaty he had a cordial esteem for that princess a sympathy of manners and a gratitude for the extraordinary favours which he had received from her during his greatest difficulties and he used every expedient to apologise and atone for that measure which necessity extorted from him but as spain refused to treat with the dutch as a free state and elizabeth would not negotiate without her ally henry found himself obliged to conclude at vervins a separate peace by which he recovered possession of all the places seized by spain during the course of the civil wars and procured to himself leisure to pursue the domestic settlement of his kingdom his capacity for the arts of peace was not inferior to his military talents and in a little time by his frugality order and wise government he raised france from the desolation and misery in which she was involved to a more flourishing condition than she had ever before enjoyed the queen knew that she could also whenever she pleased finish the war on equitable terms and that philip having no claims upon her would be glad to free himself from an enemy who had foiled him in every contest and who still had it so much in her power to make him feel the weight of her arms some of her wisest counsellors particularly the treasurer advised her to embrace pacific measures and set before her the advantages of tranquillity security and frugality as more considerable than any success which could attend the greatest victories but this high-spirited princess though at first averse to war seemed now to have attained such an ascendant over the enemy that she was unwilling to stop the course of her prosperous fortune she considered that her situation and her past victories had given her entire security against any dangerous invasion and the war must thenceforth be conducted by sudden enterprises and naval expeditions in which she possessed an undoubted superiority that the weak condition of philip in the indies 
opened to her the view of the most durable advantages and the yearly return of his treasure by sea afforded a continual prospect of important though more temporary successes that after his peace with france if she also should consent to an accommodation he would be able to turn his whole force against the revolted provinces of the netherlands which though they had surprisingly increased their power by commerce and good government were still unable if not supported by their confederates to maintain war against so potent a monarch and that as her defence of that commonwealth was the original ground of the quarrel it was unsafe as well as dishonourable to abandon its cause till she had placed it in a state of greater security these reasons were frequently inculcated on her by the earl of essex whose passion for glory as well as his military talents made him earnestly desire the continuance of war from which he expected to reap so much advantage and distinction the rivalship between this nobleman and lord burleigh made each of them insist the more strenuously on his own counsel but as essex's person was agreeable to the queen as well as his advice conformable to her inclinations the favourite seemed daily to acquire an ascendant over the minister had he been endowed with caution and self-command equal to his shining qualities he would have so riveted himself in the queen's confidence that none of his enemies had ever been able to impeach his credit but his lofty spirit could ill submit to that implicit deference which her temper required and which she had ever been accustomed to receive from all her subjects being once engaged in a dispute with her about the choice of a governor for ireland he was so heated in the argument that he entirely forgot the rules both of duty and civility and turned his back upon her in a contemptuous manner her anger naturally prompt and violent rose at this provocation and she instantly gave him a box on the ear adding a passionate expression suited to his impertinence instead of recollecting himself and making the submissions due to her sex and station he clapped his hand to his sword and swore that he would not bear such usage were it from henry the eighth himself and he immediately withdrew from court edgerton the chancellor who loved essex exhorted him to repair his indiscretion by proper acknowledgments and entreated him not to give that triumph to his enemies that affliction to his friends which must ensue from his supporting a contest with his sovereign and deserting the service of his country but essex was deeply stung with the dishonour which he had received and seemed to think that an insult which might be pardoned in a woman was become a mortal affront when it came from his sovereign if the vilest of all indignities said he is done me does religion enforce me to sue for pardon doth god require it is it impiety not to do it why cannot princes err cannot subjects receive wrong is an earthly power infinite pardon me my lord i can never subscribe to these principles let solomon's fool laugh when he is stricken let those that mean to make their profit of princes show no sense of princes injuries let them acknowledge an infinite absoluteness on earth that do not believe an absolute infiniteness in heaven alluding probably to the character and conduct of sir walter raleigh who lay under the reproach of impiety as for me continued he i have received wrong i feel it my cause is good i know it and whatsoever happens all the powers on earth can never exert more strength and constancy in oppressing than i can show in suffering every thing that can or shall be imposed upon me 
your lordship in the beginning of your letter makes me a player and yourself a looker-on and me a player of my own game so you may see more than i but give me leave to tell you that since you do but see and i do suffer i must of necessity feel more than you this spirited letter was shown by essex to his friends and they were so imprudent as to disperse copies of it yet notwithstanding this additional provocation the queen's partiality was so prevalent that she reinstated him in his former favour and her kindness to him appeared rather to have acquired new force from this short interval of anger and resentment the death of burley his antagonist which happened about the same time seemed to ensure him constant possession of the queen's confidence and nothing indeed but his own indiscretion could thenceforth have shaken his well-established credit lord burley died in an advanced age and by a rare fortune was equally regretted by his sovereign and the people he had risen gradually from small beginnings by the mere force of merit and though his authority was never entirely absolute or uncontrolled with the queen he was still during the course of near forty years regarded as her principal minister none of her other inclinations or affections could ever overcome her confidence in so useful a counsellor and as he had the generosity or good sense to pay assiduous court to her during her sister's reign when it was dangerous to appear her friend she thought herself bound in gratitude when she mounted the throne to persevere in her attachments to him he seems not to have possessed any shining talents of address eloquence or imagination and was chiefly distinguished by solidity of understanding probity of manners and indefatigable application in business virtues which if they do not always enable a man to attain high stations do certainly qualify him best for filling them of all the queen's ministers he alone left a considerable fortune to his posterity a fortune not acquired by rapine or oppression but gained by the regular profits of his offices and preserved by frugality the last act of this able minister was the concluding of a new treaty with the dutch who after being in some measure deserted by the king of france were glad to preserve the queen's alliance by submitting to any terms which she pleased to require of them the debt which they owed her was now settled at eight hundred thousand pounds of this sum they agreed to pay during the war thirty thousand pounds a year and these payments were to continue till four hundred thousand pounds of the debt should be extinguished they engaged also during the time that england should continue the war with spain to pay the garrisons of the cautionary towns they stipulated that if spain should invade england or the isle of wight or jersey or Scilly, they should assist her with a body of five thousand foot and five thousand horse and that in case she undertook any naval armament against spain they should join an equal number of ships to hers by this treaty the queen was eased of an annual charge of a hundred and twenty thousand pounds soon after the death of burleigh the queen who regretted extremely the loss of so wise and faithful a minister was informed of the death of her capital enemy philip the second who after languishing under many infirmities expired in an advanced age at madrid this haughty prince desirous of an accommodation with his revolted subjects in the netherlands but disdaining to make in his own name the concessions necessary for that purpose had transferred to his daughter married to archduke albert the title to the low country provinces but as it was not expected that this princess could have posterity 
and as the reversion on failure of her issue was still reserved to the crown of spain the states considered this deed only as the change of a name and they persisted with equal obstinacy in their resistance to the spanish arms the other powers also of europe made no distinction between the courts of brussels and madrid and the secret opposition of france as well as the avowed efforts of england continued to operate against the progress of albert as it had done against that of philip end of section thirty six chapter forty three part four Section 37 of Volume 1D of History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688 by David Hume. Volume 1D, Section 37, Chapter 44, Part 1. Elizabeth. Though the dominion of the English over Ireland had been seemingly established above four centuries, it may safely be affirmed that their authority had hitherto been little more than nominal. The Irish princes and nobles, divided among themselves, readily paid the exterior marks of obedience to a power which they were not able to resist. But as no durable force was ever kept on foot to retain them in their duty, they relapsed still into their former state of independence. Too weak to introduce order and obedience among the rude inhabitants, the English authority was yet sufficient to check the growth of any enterprising genius among the natives, and though it could bestow no true form of civil government, it was able to prevent the rise of any such form from the internal combination or policy of the Irish. Most of the English institutions, likewise, by which that island was governed, were to the last degree absurd and such as no state before had ever thought of for preserving dominion over its conquered provinces the english nation all on fire for the project of subduing france a project whose success was the most improbable and would to them have proved the most pernicious neglected all other enterprises to which their situation so strongly invited them and which in time would have brought them an accession of riches, grandeur, and security. The small army which they maintained in Ireland, they never supplied regularly with pay, and as no money could be levied on the island, which possessed none, they gave their soldiers the privilege of free quarter upon the natives. Rapine and insolence inflamed the hatred which prevailed between the conquerors and the conquered, want of security among the irish introducing despair nourished still more the sloth natural to that uncultivated people but the english carried further their ill-judged tyranny instead of inviting the irish to adopt the more civilized customs of their conquerors they even refused though earnestly solicited to communicate to them the privilege of their laws and everywhere marked them out as aliens and as enemies thrown out of the protection of justice the natives could find no security but in force and flying the neighbourhood of cities which they could not approach with safety they sheltered themselves in their marshes and forests from the insolence of their inhuman masters being treated like wild beasts, they became such, and joining the ardour of revenge to their yet untamed barbarity, they grew every day more intractable and more dangerous. As the English princes deemed the conquest of the dispersed Irish to be more the object of time and patience than the source of military glory, 
they willingly delegated that office to private adventurers who enlisting soldiers at their own charge reduced provinces of that island which they converted to their own profit separate jurisdictions and principalities were established by these lordly conquerors the power of peace and war was assumed military law was exercised over the irish whom they subdued and by degrees over the english by whose assistance they conquered and after their authority had once taken root deeming the english institutions less favorable to barbarous dominion they degenerated into mere irish and abandoned the garb language manners and laws of their mother country by all this imprudent conduct of england the natives of its dependent state remained still in that abject condition into which the northern and western parts of europe were sunk before they received civility and slavery from the refined policy and irresistible bravery of rome even at the end of the sixteenth century when every christian nation was cultivating with ardor every civil art of life that island lying in a temperate climate enjoying a fertile soil accessible in its situation possessed of innumerable harbors was still notwithstanding these advantages inhabited by a people whose customs and manners approached nearer those of savages than of barbarians as the rudeness and ignorance of the irish were extreme they were sunk below the reach of that curiosity and love of novelty by which every other people in europe had been seized at the beginning of that century and which had engaged them in innovations and religious disputes with which they were still so violently agitated the ancient superstition the practices and observances of their fathers mingled and polluted with many wild opinions still maintained an unshaken empire over them and the example alone of the english was sufficient to render the reformation odious to the prejudiced and discontented irish the old opposition of manners laws and interest was now inflamed by religious antipathy and the subduing and civilizing of that country seemed to become every day more difficult and more impracticable the animosity against the english was carried so far by the irish that in an insurrection raised by two sons of the earl of clarinicade they put to the sword all the inhabitants of the town of athenry though irish because they began to conform themselves to english customs and had embraced a more civilized form of life than had been practised by their ancestors the usual revenue of ireland amounted only to six thousand pounds a year the queen though with much repining commonly added twenty thousand more which she remitted from england and with this small revenue a body of a thousand men was supported which on extraordinary emergencies was augmented to two thousand no wonder that a force so disproportioned to the object instead of subduing a mutinous kingdom served rather to provoke the natives and to excite those frequent insurrections which still further inflamed the animosity between the two nations and increased the disorders to which the irish were naturally subject in fifteen sixty shan o'neill or the great o'neill as the irish called him because head of that potent clan raised a rebellion in ulster but after some skirmishes he was received into favour upon his submission and his promise of a more dutiful behaviour for the future this impunity tempted him to undertake a new insurrection in fifteen sixty seven but being pushed by sir henry sidney lord deputy he retreated into clanderboy and rather than submit to the english he put himself into the hands of some scottish islanders 
who commonly infested those parts by their incursions. The Scots, who retained a quarrel against him on account of former injuries, violated the laws of hospitality and murdered him at a festival to which they had invited him. He was a man equally noted for his pride, his violence, his debaucheries, and his hatred of the English nation. He is said to have put some of his followers to death because they endeavoured to introduce the use of bread after the English fashion. Though so violent an enemy to luxury, he was extremely addicted to riot, and was accustomed, after his intemperance had thrown him into a fever, to plunge his body into mire, that he might allay the flame which he had raised by former excesses. Such was the life led by this haughty barbarian, who scorned the title the Earl of Tyrone, which Elizabeth intended to have restored to him, and who assumed the rank and appellation of King of Ulster. He used also to say that though the Queen was his sovereign lady, he never made peace with her but at her seeking. Sir Henry Sidney was one of the wisest and most active governors that Ireland had enjoyed for several reigns, and he possessed his authority eleven years, during which he struggled with many difficulties and made some progress in repressing those disorders which had become inveterate among the people. The Earl of Desmond, in 1569, gave him disturbance from the hereditary animosity which prevailed between that nobleman and the Earl of Ormond, descended from the only family established in Ireland that had steadily maintained its loyalty to the English crown. The Earl of Thomond, in 1570, attempted a rebellion in Connaught, but was obliged to fly into France before his designs were ripe for execution. Stukely, another figure, found such credit with the Pope Gregory the Thirteenth, that he flattered that pontiff with the prospect of making his nephew, Buon Campagno, King of Ireland, and as if this project had already taken effect, he accepted the title of Marquis of Leinster from the new sovereign. He passed next into Spain, and after having received much encouragement and great rewards from Philip, who intended to employ him as an instrument in disturbing Elizabeth, he was found to possess too little interest for executing those high promises which he had made to that monarch. He retired into Portugal, and following the fortunes of Don Sebastian, he perished with that gallant prince in his bold but unfortunate expedition against the Moors. Lord Grey, after some interval, succeeded to the government of Ireland, and in 1579 suppressed a new rebellion of the Earl of Desmond, though supported by a body of Spaniards and Italians. The rebellion of the Borks followed a few years after, occasioned by the strict and equitable administration of Sir Richard Bingham, governor of Connaught, who endeavoured to repress the tyranny of the chieftains over their vassals. The Queen, finding Ireland so burdensome to her, tried several expedients for reducing it to a state of greater order and submission. She encouraged the Earl of Essex, father to that nobleman who was afterwards her favourite, to attempt the subduing and planting of Clandeboy, Ferny, and other territories, part of some late forfeitures. But that enterprise proved unfortunate, and Essex died of a distemper occasioned, as is supposed, by the vexation which he had conceived from his disappointments. A university was founded in Dublin with a view of introducing arts and learning into that kingdom, and civilizing the uncultivated manners of the inhabitants. But the most unhappy expedient employed in the government of Ireland was that made use of in 1585 by Sir John Perrow, at that time Lord Deputy. He put arms into the hands of the Irish inhabitants of Ulster, 
in order to enable them without the assistance of the government to repress the incursions of the scottish islanders by which these parts were much infested at the same time the invitations of philip joined to their zeal for the catholic religion engaged many of the gentry to serve in the low country wars and thus ireland being provided with officers and soldiers with discipline and arms became formidable to the english and was thenceforth able to maintain a more regular war against her ancient masters hugh o'neill nephew to shan o'neill had been raised by the queen to the dignity of earl of tyrone but having murdered his cousin son of that rebel and being acknowledged head of his clan he preferred the pride of barbarous license and dominion to the pleasures of opulence and tranquillity and he fomented all those disorders by which he hoped to weaken or overturn the english government he was noted for the vices of perfidy and cruelty so common among uncultivated nations and was also eminent for courage a virtue which their disorderly course of life requires and which notwithstanding being less supported by the principle of honour is commonly more precarious among them than among a civilised people tyrone actuated this spirit secretly fomented the discontents of the maguires o'donnells o'rourkes mcmahons and other rebels yet trusting to the influence of his deceitful oaths and professions he put himself into the hands of sir william russell who in the year fifteen ninety four was sent over deputy to ireland contrary to the advice and protestation of sir henry bagnall marshal of the army he was dismissed and returning to his own country he embraced the resolution of raising an open rebellion and of relying no longer on the lenity or inexperience of the english government he entered into a correspondence with spain he procured thence a supply of arms and ammunition and having united all the irish chieftains in a dependence upon himself he began to be regarded as a formidable enemy the native irish were so poor that their country afforded few other commodities than cattle and oatmeal which were easily concealed or driven away on the approach of the enemy and as elizabeth was averse to the expense requisite for supporting her armies the english found much difficulty in pushing their advantages and in pursuing the rebels into the bogs woods and other fastnesses to which they retreated these motives rendered sir john norris who commanded the english army the more willing to hearken to any proposals of truce or accommodation made him by tyrone and after the war was spun out by these artifices for some years that gallant englishman finding that he had been deceived by treacherous promises and that he had performed nothing worthy of his ancient reputation was seized with a languishing distemper and died of vexation and discontent sir henry bagnall who succeeded him in the command was still more unfortunate as he advanced to relieve the fort of blackwater besieged by the rebels he was surrounded in disadvantageous ground his soldiers discouraged by part of their powders accidentally taking fire were put to flight and though the pursuit was stopped by montacute who commanded the english horse fifteen hundred men together with the general himself were left dead upon the spot this victory so unusual to the irish roused their courage supplied them with arms and ammunition and raised the reputation of tyrone who assumed the character of the deliverer of his country and patron of irish liberty the english council were now sensible that the rebellion of ireland was come to a dangerous head and that the former temporizing arts of granting truces and pacifications to the rebels 
and of allowing them to purchase pardons by resigning part of the plunder acquired during their insurrection served only to encourage the spirit of mutiny and disorder among them it was therefore resolved to push the war by more vigorous measures and the queen cast her eyes on charles blount lord mountjoy as a man who though hitherto less accustomed to arms than to books and literature was endowed she thought with talents equal to the undertaking but the young earl of essex ambitious of fame and desirous of obtaining this government for himself opposed the choice of mountjoy and represented the necessity of appointing for that important employment some person more experienced in war than this nobleman more practised in business and of higher quality and reputation by this description he was understood to mean himself and no sooner was his desire known than his enemies even more zealously than his friends conspired to gratify his wishes many of his friends thought that he never ought to consent except for a short time to accept of any employment which must remove him from court and prevent him from cultivating that personal inclination which the queen so visibly bore him his enemies hoped that if by his absence she had once leisure to forget the charms of his person and conversation his impatient and lofty demeanour would soon disgust a princess who usually exacted such profound submission and implicit obedience from all her servants but essex was incapable of entering into such cautious views and even elizabeth who was extremely desirous of subduing the irish rebels and who was much prepossessed in favour of essex's genius readily agreed to appoint him governor of ireland by the title of lord lieutenant the more to encourage him in his undertaking she granted him by his patent more extensive authority had ever before been conferred on any lieutenant the power of carrying on or finishing the war as he pleased of pardoning the rebels and of filling all the most considerable employments of the kingdom and to ensure him of success she levied a numerous army of sixteen thousand foot and thirteen hundred horse which she afterwards augmented to twenty thousand foot and two thousand horse a force which it was apprehended would be able in one campaign to overwhelm the rebels and make an entire conquest of ireland nor did essex enemies the earl of nottingham sir robert cecil sir walter raleigh and lord cobham throw any obstacles in the way of these preparations but hoped that the higher the queen's expectations of success were raised the more difficult it would be for the event to correspond to them in a like view they rather seconded than opposed those exalted encomiums which essex's numerous and sanguine friends dispersed of his high genius of his elegant endowments his heroic courage his unbounded generosity and his noble birth nor were they displeased to observe that passionate fondness which the people everywhere expressed for this nobleman these artful politicians had studied his character and finding that his open and undaunted spirit if taught temper and reserve from opposition must become invincible they resolved rather to give full breath to those sails which were already too much expanded and to push him upon dangers of which he seemed to make such small account and the better to make advantage of his indiscretions spies were set upon all his actions and even expressions and his vehement spirit which while he was in the midst of the court and environed by his rivals was unacquainted with disguise could not fail after he thought himself surrounded by none but friends 
to give a pretense for malignant suspicions and constructions. Essex left London in the month of March, attended with the acclamations of the populace, and what did him more honour, accompanied by a numerous train of nobility and gentry, who from affection to his person had attached themselves to his fortunes, and sought fame and military experience under so renowned a commander. The first act of authority which he exercised after his arrival in Ireland was an indiscretion, but of the generous kind, and in both these respects suitable to his character. He appointed his intimate friend, the Earl of Southampton, General of the Horse, a nobleman who had incurred the Queen's displeasure by secretly marrying without her consent, and whom she had therefore enjoined Essex not to employ in any command under him. She no sooner heard of this instance of disobedience than she reprimanded him and ordered him to recall his commission to Southampton. But Essex, who imagined that some reasons which he opposed to her first injunctions had satisfied her, had the imprudence to remonstrate against these second orders, and it was not till she reiterated her commands that he could be prevailed on to displace his friend. Essex, on his landing at Dublin, deliberated with the Irish Council concerning the proper methods of carrying on the war against the rebels and here he was guilty of a capital error which was the ruin of his enterprise. He had always, while in England, blamed the conduct of former commanders, who artfully protracted the war, who harassed their troops in small enterprises, and who, by agreeing to truces and temporary pacifications with the rebels, had given them leisure to recruit their broken forces in conformity to these views he had ever insisted upon leading his forces immediately into ulster against tyrone the chief enemy and his instructions had been drawn agreeably to these declared resolutions but the irish councillors persuaded him that the season was too early for the enterprise and that as the morasses in which the northern irish usually sheltered themselves would not yet be passable to the English forces. It would be better to employ the present time in an expedition into Munster. The secret reason for this advice was that many of them possessed estates in that province, and were desirous to have the enemy dislodged from their neighbourhood. But the same selfish spirit which had induced them to give this counsel made them soon after disown it when they found the bad consequences with which it was attended. End of section 37, chapter 44, part 1. Section 38 of Volume 1D of History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688 by David Hume, Volume 1D, Section 38, Chapter 44, Part 2. Essex obliged all the rebels of Munster either to submit or to fly into the neighbouring provinces. But as the Irish, from the greatness of the Queen's preparations, had concluded that she intended to reduce them to total subjection, or even utterly to exterminate them, they considered their defence as a common cause, and the English forces were no sooner withdrawn than the inhabitants of Munster, relapsed into rebellion and renewed their confederacy with their other countrymen the army meanwhile by the fatigue of long and tedious marches and by the influence of the climate was become sickly and on its return to dublin about the middle of july was surprisingly diminished in number 
the courage of the soldiers was even much abated for though they had prevailed in some lesser enterprises against lord cahir and others yet they had sometimes met with more stout resistance than they expected from the irish whom they were wont to despise and as they were raw troops and unexperienced a considerable body of them had been put to flight at the glens by an inferior number of the enemy essex was so enraged at this misbehaviour that he cashiered all the officers and decimated the private men but this act of severity though necessary had intimidated the soldiers and increased their aversion to the service the queen was extremely disgusted when she heard that so considerable a part of the season was consumed in these frivolous enterprises and was still more surprised that essex persevered in the same practice which he had so much condemned in others and which he knew to be so much contrary to her purpose and intention that nobleman in order to give his troops leisure to recruit from their sickness and fatigue left the main army in quarters and marched with a small body of fifteen hundred men into the county of offaly against the o'connors and o'moors whom he forced to a submission but on his return to dublin he found the army so much diminished that he wrote to the english council an account of its condition and informed them that if he did not immediately receive a reinforcement of two thousand men it would be impossible for him this season to attempt anything against tyrone that there might be no pretence for further inactivity the queen immediately sent over the number demanded and essex began at last to assemble his forces for the expedition into ulster the army was so averse to this enterprise and so terrified with the reputation of tyrone that many of them counterfeited sickness many of them deserted and essex found that after leaving the necessary garrisons he could scarcely lead four thousand men against the rebels he marched however with this small army but was soon sensible that in so advanced a season it would be impossible for him to effect anything against an enemy who though superior in number was determined to avoid every decisive action he hearkened therefore to a message sent him by tyrone who desired a conference and a place near the two camps was appointed for that purpose the generals met without any of their attendants and a river ran between them into which tyrone entered to the depth of his saddle but essex stood on the opposite bank after half an hour's conference where tyrone behaved with great submission to the lord lieutenant a cessation of arms was concluded to the first of may renewable from six weeks to six weeks but which might be broken off by either party upon a fortnight's warning essex also received from tyrone proposals for a peace in which that rebel had inserted many unreasonable and exorbitant conditions and there appeared afterwards some reason to suspect that he had commenced a very unjustifiable correspondence with the enemy so unexpected an issue of an enterprise the greatest and most expensive that elizabeth had ever undertaken provoked her extremely against essex and this disgust was much augmented by other circumstances of that nobleman's conduct he wrote many letters to the queen and council full of peevish and impatient expressions complaining of his enemies lamenting that their calumnies should be believed against him and discovering symptoms of a mind equally haunted and discontented she took care to inform him of her dissatisfaction but commanded him to remain in ireland till further orders essex heard at once of elizabeth's anger 
and of the promotion of his enemy sir robert cecil to the office of master of the wards an office to which he himself aspired and dreading that if he remained any longer absent the queen would be totally alienated from him he hastily embraced a solution which he knew had once succeeded with the earl of leicester the former favourite of elizabeth leicester being informed while in the low countries that his mistress was extremely displeased with his conduct disobeyed her orders by coming over to england and having pacified her by his presence by his apologies and by his flattery and insinuation disappointed all the expectations of his enemies essex therefore weighing more the similarity of circumstances than the difference of character between himself and leicester immediately set out for england and making speedy journeys he arrived at court before any one was in the least apprised of his intentions though besmeared with dirt and sweat he hastened upstairs to the presence chamber thence to the privy chamber nor stopped till he was in the queen's bedchamber who was newly risen and was sitting with her hair about her face he threw himself on his knees kissed her hand and had some private conference with her where he was so graciously received that on his departure he was heard to express great satisfaction and to thank god that though he had suffered much trouble and many storms abroad he found a sweet calm at home but this placability of elizabeth was merely the result of her surprise and of the momentary satisfaction which she felt on the sudden and unexpected appearance of her favourite after she had leisure for recollection all his faults recurred to her and she thought it necessary by some severe discipline to subdue that haughty imperious spirit who presuming on her partiality had pretended to domineer in her counsels to engross all her favour and to act in the most important affairs without regard to her orders and instructions when essex waited on her in the afternoon he found her extremely altered in her carriage towards him she ordered him to be confined to his chamber to be twice examined by the council and though his answers were calm and submissive she committed him to the custody of lord keeper edgerton and held him sequestered from all company even from that of his countess nor was so much as the intercourse of letters permitted between them essex dropped many expressions of humiliation and sorrow none of resentment he professed an entire submission to the queen's will declared his intention of retiring into the country and of leading thenceforth a private life remote from courts and business but though he affected to be so entirely cured of his aspiring ambition the vexation of this disappointment and of the triumph gained by his enemies preyed upon his haughty spirit and he fell into a distemper which seemed to put his life in danger the queen had always declared to all the world and even to the earl himself that the purpose of her severity was to correct not to ruin him and when she heard of his sickness she was not a little alarmed with his situation she ordered eight physicians of the best reputation and experience to consult of his case and being informed that the issue was much to be apprehended she sent dr james to him with some broth and desired that physician to deliver him a message which she probably deemed of still greater virtue that if she thought such a step consistent with her honour she would herself pay him a visit the bystanders who carefully observed her countenance remarked that in pronouncing these words her eyes were suffused with tears 
when these symptoms of the queen's returning affection towards essex were known they gave a sensible alarm to the faction which had declared their opposition to him sir walter raleigh in particular the most violent as well as the most ambitious of his enemies was so affected with the appearance of this sudden revolution that he was seized with sickness in his turn and the queen was obliged to apply the same salve to his wound and to send him a favourable message expressing her desire of his recovery the medicine which the queen administered to these aspiring rivals was successful with both and essex being now allowed the company of his countess and having entertained more promising hopes of his future fortunes was so much restored in his health as to be thought past danger a belief was instilled into elizabeth that his distemper had been entirely counterfeit in order to move her compassion and she relapsed into her former rigour against him he wrote her a letter and sent her a rich present on new year's day as was usual with the courtiers at that time she read the letter but rejected the present after some interval however of severity she allowed him to retire to his own house and though he remained still under custody and was sequestered from all company he was so grateful for this mark of lenity that he sent her a letter of thanks on the occasion this further degree of goodness said he doth sound in my ears as if your majesty spake these words die not essex for though i punish thine offence and humble thee for thy good yet will i one day be served again by thee my prostrate soul makes this answer i hope for that blessed day and in expectation of it all my afflictions of body and mind are humbly patiently and cheerfully borne by me the countess of essex daughter of sir francis walsingham possessed as well as her husband a refined taste in literature and the chief consolation which essex enjoyed during this period of anxiety and expectation consisted in her company and in reading with her those instructive and entertaining authors which even during the time of his greatest prosperity he had never entirely neglected there were several incidents which kept alive the queen's anger against essex every account which she received from ireland convinced her more and more of his misconduct in that government and of the insignificant purposes to which he had employed so much force and treasure tyrone so far from being quelled had thought proper in less than three months to break the truce and joining with o'donnell and other rebels had overrun almost the whole kingdom he boasted that he was certain of receiving a supply of men money and arms from spain he pretended to be champion of the catholic religion and he openly exulted in the present of a phoenix plume which the pope clement the eighth in order to encourage him in the prosecution of so good a cause had consecrated and had conferred upon him the queen that she might check his progress returned to her former intention of appointing mountjoy lord deputy and though that nobleman who was an intimate friend of essex and desired his return to the government of ireland did at first very earnestly excuse himself on account of his bad state of health she obliged him to accept the employment mountjoy found the island almost in a desperate condition but being a man of capacity and vigour he was so little discouraged that he immediately advanced against tyrone in ulster he penetrated into the heart of that country the chief seat of the rebels he fortified derry and mount norris in order to bridle the irish he chased them from the field 
and obliged them to take shelter in the woods and morasses he employed with equal success sir george carew in munster and by these promising enterprises he gave new life to the queen's authority in that island as the comparison of mountjoy's administration with that of essex contributed to alienate elizabeth from her favourite she received additional disgust from the partiality of the people who prepossessed with an extravagant idea of essex's merit complained of the injustice done him by his removal from court and by his confinement libels were secretly dispersed against cecil and raleigh and all his enemies and his popularity which was always great seemed rather to be increased than diminished by his misfortunes elizabeth in order to justify to the public her conduct with regard to him had often expressed her intentions of having him tried in the star chamber for his offences but her tenderness for him prevailed at last over her severity and she was contented to have him only examined by the privy council the attorney-general coke opened the cause against him and treated him with the cruelty and insolence which that great lawyer usually exercised against the unfortunate he displayed in the strongest colours all the faults committed by essex in his administration of ireland his making southampton general of the horse contrary to the queen's injunction his deserting the enterprise against tyrone and marching to leinster and munster his conferring knighthood on too many persons his secret conference with tyrone and his sudden return from ireland in contempt of her majesty's commands he also exaggerated the indignity of the conditions which tyrone had been allowed to propose odious and abominable conditions said he a public toleration of an idolatrous religion pardon for himself and every traitor in ireland and full restitution of lands and possessions to all of them the solicitor-general fleming insisted upon the wretched situation in which the earl had left that kingdom and francis son of sir nicholas bacon who had been lord keeper in the beginning of the present reign closed the charge with displaying the undutiful expressions contained in some letters written by the earl essex when he came to plead in his own defence renounced with great submission and humility all pretensions to an apology and declared his resolution never on this or any other occasion to have any contest with his sovereign he said that having severed himself from the world and abjured all sentiments of ambition he had no scruple to confess every failing or error into which his youth folly or manifold infirmities might have betrayed him that his inward sorrow for his offences against her majesty was so profound that it exceeded all his outward crosses and afflictions nor had he any scruple of submitting to a public confession of whatever she had been pleased to impute to him that in his acknowledgments he retained only one reserve which he would never relinquish but with his life the assertion of a loyal and unpolluted heart of an unfeigned affection of an earnest desire ever to perform to her majesty the best service which his pool abilities would permit and that if this sentiment were allowed by the council he willingly acquiesced in any condemnation or sentence which they could pronounce against him this submission was uttered with so much eloquence and in so pathetic a manner that it drew tears from many of the audience all the privy councillors in giving their judgment made no scruple of doing the earl justice with regard to the loyalty of his intentions even cecil whom he believed his capital enemy treated him with regard and humanity 
and the sentence pronounced by the lord keeper to which the council assented was in these words if this cause said he had been heard in the star chamber my sentence must have been for as great a fine as ever was set upon any man's head in that court together with perpetual confinement in that prison which belongeth to a man of his quality the tower but since we are now in another place and in a course of favour my censure is that the earl of essex is not to execute the office of a counsellor nor that of earl marshal of england nor of master of the ordnance and to return to his own house there to continue a prisoner till it shall please her majesty to release this and all the rest of his sentence the earl of cumberland made a slight opposition to this sentence and said that if he thought it would stand he would have required a little more time to deliberate that he deemed it somewhat severe and that any commander-in-chief might easily incur a like penalty but however added he in confidence of her majesty's mercy i agree with the rest the earl of worcester delivered his opinion in a couple of latin verses importing that where the gods are offended even misfortunes ought to be imputed as crimes and that accident is no excuse for transgressions against the divinity bacon so much distinguished afterwards by his high offices and still more by his profound genius for the sciences was nearly allied to the cecil family being nephew to lord burley and cousin german to the secretary but notwithstanding his extraordinary talents he had met with so little protection from his powerful relations that he had not yet obtained any preferment in the law which was his profession but essex who could distinguish merit and who passionately loved it had entered into an intimate friendship with bacon had zealously attempted though without success to procure him the office of solicitor-general and in order to comfort his friend under the disappointment had conferred on him a present of land to the value of eighteen hundred pounds the public could ill excuse bacon's appearance before the council against so munificent a benefactor though he acted in obedience to the queen's commands but she was so well pleased with his behaviour that she imposed on him a new task of drawing a narrative of that day's proceedings in order to satisfy the public of the justice and lenity of her conduct bacon who wanted firmness of character more than humanity gave to the whole transaction the most favourable turn for essex and in particular painted out in elaborate expression the dutiful submission which that nobleman discovered in the defence that he made for his conduct when he read the paper to her she smiled at that passage and observed to bacon that old love she saw could not easily be forgotten he replied that he hoped she meant that of herself all the world indeed expected that essex would soon be reinstated in his former credit perhaps as is usual in reconcilements founded on inclination would acquire an additional ascendant over the queen and after all his disgraces would again appear more a favourite than ever end of section thirty eight chapter forty four part two section thirty nine of volume one d of history of england from the invasion of julius caesar to the revolution of sixteen eighty eight this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688 by David Hume, Volume 1D, Section 39, Chapter 44, Part 3. 
They were confirmed in this hope when they saw that, though he was still prohibited from appearing at court, he was continued in his office of master of horse, and was restored to his liberty, and that all his friends had access to him. Essex himself seemed determined to persevere in that conduct which had hitherto been so successful, and which the Queen, by all this discipline, had endeavoured to render habitual to him. He wrote to her that he kissed Her Majesty's hands, and the rod with which she had corrected him, but that he could never recover his wonted cheerfulness till she deigned to admit him to that presence which had ever been the chief source of his happiness and enjoyment, and that he had now resolved to make amends for his past errors, to retire into a country solitude, and say with Nebuchadnezzar, Let my dwelling be with the beasts of the field, let me eat grass as an ox, and be wet with the dew of heaven, till it shall please the queen to restore me to my understanding. The queen was much pleased with these sentiments, and replied that she heartily wished his actions might correspond with his expressions, that he had tried her patience a long time, and it was but fitting she should now make some experiment of his submission that her father would never have pardoned so much obstinacy, but that if the furnace of affliction provided such good effects, she should ever after have the better opinion of her chemistry. The Earl of Essex possessed a monopoly of sweet wines, and as his patent was near expiring, he patiently expected that the Queen would renew it, and he considered this event as the critical circumstance of his life which would determine whether he could ever hope to be reinstated in credit and authority. But Elizabeth, though gracious in her deportment, was of a temper somewhat haughty and severe, and being continually surrounded with Essex's enemies, means were found to persuade her that his lofty spirit was not yet sufficiently subdued, and that he must undergo this further trial before he could again be safely received into favour. She therefore denied his request, and even added in a contemptuous style that an ungovernable beast must be stinted in his provender. This rigour, pushed one step too far, proved the final ruin of this young nobleman, and was the source of infinite sorrow and vexation to the queen herself. Essex, who had with great difficulty so long subdued his proud spirit, and whose patience was now exhausted, imagining that the queen was entirely inexorable, burst at once all restraints of submission and of prudence, and determined to seek relief by proceeding to the utmost extremities against his enemies. Even during his greatest favour he had ever been accustomed to carry matters with a high hand towards his sovereign, and as this practice gratified his own temper, and was sometimes successful, he had imprudently imagined that it was the only proper method of managing her. But being now reduced to despair, he gave entire reins to his violent disposition, and threw off all appearance of duty and respect. Intoxicated with the public favour which he already possessed, he practised anew every art of popularity, and endeavoured to increase the general goodwill by a hospitable manner of life little suited to his situation and circumstances. His former employments had given him great connections with men of the military profession, and he now entertained, by additional caresses and civilities, a friendship with all desperate adventurers, whose attachment he hoped might, in his present views, prove serviceable to him. He secretly courted the confidence of the Catholics, but his chief trust lay in the Puritans, whom he openly caressed, and whose manners he seemed to have entirely adopted. He engaged the most celebrated preachers of that sect 
to resort to Essex House. He had daily prayers and sermons in his family, and he invited all the zealots in London to attend those pious exercises. Such was the disposition now beginning to prevail among the English, that instead of feasting and public spectacles, the methods anciently practised to gain the populace, nothing so effectually ingratiated an ambitious leader with the public as these fanatical entertainments. And as the puritanical preachers frequently inculcated in their sermons the doctrine of resistance to the civil magistrate, they prepared the minds of their hearers for those seditious projects which Essex was secretly meditating. But the greatest imprudence of this nobleman proceeded from the openness of his temper, by which he was ill qualified to succeed in such difficult and dangerous enterprises. He indulged himself in great liberties of speech, and was even heard to say of the queen, that she was now grown an old woman, and was become as crooked in her mind as in her body. Some court ladies, whose favours Essex had formerly neglected, carried her these stories, and incensed her to a high degree against him. Elizabeth was ever remarkably jealous on this head, and though she was now approaching to her seventieth year, she allowed her courtiers and even foreign ambassadors to compliment her upon her beauty nor had all her good sense been able to cure her of this preposterous vanity there was also an expedient employed by essex which if possible was more provoking to the queen than those sarcasms on her age and deformity and that was his secret applications to the king of scots her heir and successor. That prince had this year very narrowly escaped a dangerous though ill-formed conspiracy of the Earl of Gowrie, and even his deliverance was attended with this disagreeable circumstance, that the obstinate ecclesiastics persisted, in spite of the most incontestable evidence, to maintain to his face that there had been no such conspiracy. James, harassed with his turbulent and factious subjects, cast a wilful eye to the succession of England, and in proportion as the Queen advanced in years, his desire increased of mounting that throne, on which, besides acquiring a great addition of power and splendour, he hoped to govern a people so much more tractable and submissive. He negotiated with all the courts of Europe, in order to ensure himself friends and partisans. He even neglected not the court of Rome and that of Spain, and though he engaged himself in no positive promise, he flattered the Catholics with hopes that, in the event of his succession, they might expect some more liberty than was at present indulged them. Elizabeth was the only sovereign in Europe to whom he never dared to mention his right of succession. He knew that, though her advanced age might now invite her to think of fixing an heir to the crown, she never could bear the prospect of her own death without horror, and was determined still to retain him and all other competitors in an entire dependence upon her. Essex was descended by females from the royal family, and some of his sanguine partisans had been so imprudent as to mention his name among those of other pretenders to the crown. But the earl took care, by means of Henry Lee, whom he secretly sent into Scotland, to assure James that so far from entertaining such ambitious views, he was determined to use every expedient for extorting an immediate declaration in favour of that monarch's right of succession. James willingly hearkened to this proposal, but did not approve of the violent methods which Essex intended to employ. Essex had communicated his scheme to Mountjoy, deputy of Ireland, and as no man ever commanded more the cordial affection and attachment of his friends, 
he had even engaged a person of that virtue and prudence to entertain thoughts of bringing over part of his army into england and of forcing the queen to declare the king of scots her successor and such was essex's impatient ardour that though james declined this dangerous expedition he still endeavoured to persuade mountjoy not to desist from the project but the deputy who thought that such violence though it might be prudent and even justifiable when supported by a sovereign prince next heir to the crown would be rash and criminal if attempted by subjects absolutely refused his concurrence the correspondence however between essex and the court of scotland was still conducted with great secrecy and cordiality and that nobleman besides conciliating the favour of james represented all his own adversaries as enemies to that prince's succession and as men entirely devoted to the interests of spain and partisans of the chimerical title of the infanta the infanta and the archduke albert had made some advances to the queen for peace and boulogne as a neutral town was chosen for the place of conference sir henry neville the english resident in france herbert edmonds and beale were sent thither as ambassadors from england and negotiated with zuniga carillo richardrot and verheiken ministers of spain and the archduke but the conferences were soon broken off by disputes with regard to the ceremonial among the european states england had never been allowed the precedency above castile aragon portugal and the other kingdoms of which the spanish monarchy was composed and elizabeth insisted that this ancient right was not lost on account of the junction of these states and that that monarchy in its present situation though it surpassed the english in extent as well as in power could not be compared with it in point of antiquity the only durable and regular foundation of precedency among kingdoms as well as noble families that she might show however a pacific disposition she was content to yield to an equality but the spanish ministers as their nation had always disputed precedency even with france to which england yielded would proceed no further in the conference till their superiority of rank were acknowledged during the preparations for this abortive negotiation the earl of nottingham the admiral lord buckhurst treasurer and secretary cecil had discovered their inclination to peace but as the english nation flushed with success and sanguine in their hopes of plunder and conquest were in general averse to that measure it was easy for a person so popular as essex to infuse into the multitude an opinion that these ministers had sacrificed the interests of their country to spain and would even make no scruple of receiving a sovereign from that hostile nation but essex not content with these arts for decrying his adversaries proceeded to concert more violent methods of ruining them chiefly instigated by cuff his secretary a man of a bold and arrogant spirit who had acquired a great ascendant over his patron a select council of malcontents was formed who commonly met at drury house and were composed of sir charles davers to whom the house belonged the earl of southampton sir ferdinando gorges sir christopher blount sir john davies and sir john littleton and essex who boasted that he had a hundred and twenty barons knights and gentlemen of note at his devotion and who trusted still more to his authority with the populace communicated to his associates those secret designs with which his confidence in so powerful a party had inspired him among other criminal projects 
the result of blind rage and despair, he deliberated with them concerning the method of taking arms, and asked their opinion whether he had best begin with seizing the palace or the tower, or set out with making himself master at once of both places. The first enterprise being preferred, a method was concerted for executing it. It was agreed that Sir Christopher Blount, with a choice detachment, should possess himself of the palace gates, that Davies should seize the hall, Davers the guard chamber and presence chamber, and that Essex should rush in from the mews, attended by a body of his partisans, should entreat the queen with all demonstrations of humility to remove his enemies, should oblige her to assemble a parliament, and should, with common consent, settle a new plan of government. While these desperate projects were in agitation, many reasons of suspicion were carried to the queen, and she sent Robert Sackville, son of the treasurer, to Essex House on pretense of a visit, but in reality with a view of discovering whether there were in that place any unusual concourse of people, or any extraordinary preparations which might threaten an insurrection. Soon after, Essex received a summons to attend the council, which met at the treasurer's house, and while he was musing on this circumstance, and comparing it with the late unexpected visit from Sackville, a private note was conveyed to him, by which he was warned to provide for his own safety. He concluded that all his conspiracy was discovered, at least suspected, and that the easiest punishment which he had reason to apprehend was a new and more severe confinement. He therefore excused himself to the council on pretense of an indisposition, and he immediately dispatched messages to his more intimate confederates, requesting their advice and assistance in the present critical situation of his affairs. They deliberated whether they should abandon all their projects and fly the kingdom, or instantly seize the palace with the force which they could assemble, or rely upon the affections of the citizens, who were generally known to have a great attachment to the earl. Essex declared against the first expedient, and professed himself determined to undergo any fate rather than submit to live the life of a fugitive. To seize the palace seemed impracticable without more preparations, especially as the queen seemed now aware of their projects, and as they heard had used the precaution of doubling her ordinary guards. There remained, therefore, no expedient but that of betaking themselves to the city, and while the prudence and feasibility of this resolution was under debate, a person arrived who, as if he had received a commission for the purpose, gave them assurance of the affections of the Londoners, and affirmed that they might securely rest any project on that foundation. The popularity of Essex had chiefly buoyed him up in all his vain undertakings, and he fondly imagined that with no other assistance than the good will of the multitude, he might overturn Elizabeth's government. Confirmed by time, revered for wisdom, supported by vigour, and concurring with the general sentiments of the nation, the wild project of raising the city was immediately resolved on the execution of it was delayed till next day and emissaries were dispatched to all essex's friends informing them that cobham and raleigh had laid schemes against his life and entreating their presence and assistance next day there appeared at essex house the earls of southampton and rutland the lords Sands and Monteagle, with about three hundred gentlemen of good quality and fortune, and Essex informed them of the danger to which he pretended the machinations of his enemies exposed him. To some 
he said that he would throw himself at the queen's feet and crave her justice and protection to others he boasted of his interest in the city and affirmed that whatever might happen this resource could never fail him the queen was informed of these designs by means of intelligence conveyed as is supposed to rally by sir ferdinando gorges and having ordered the magistrates of london to keep the citizens in readiness she sent edgerton lord keeper to essex house with the earl of worcester sir william nollies comptroller and popham chief justice in order to learn the cause of these unusual commotions they were with difficulty admitted through a wicket but all their servants were excluded except the purse-bearer after some altercation in which they charged essex's retainers upon their allegiance to lay down their arms and were menaced in their turn by the angry multitude who surrounded them the earl who found that matters were past recall resolved to leave them prisoners in his house and to proceed to the execution of his former project he sallied forth with about two hundred attendants armed only with walking swords and in his passage to the city was joined by the earl of bedford and lord cromwell he cried aloud for the queen for the queen a plot is laid for my life and then proceeded to the house of smith the sheriff on whose aid he had great reliance the citizens flocked about him in amazement but though he told them that england was sold to the infanta and exhorted them to arms instantly otherwise they could not do him any service no one showed a disposition to join him the sheriff on the earl's approach to his house stole out at the back door and made the best of his way to the mayor essex meanwhile observing the coldness of the citizens and hearing that he was proclaimed a traitor by the earl of cumberland and lord burleigh began to despair of success and thought of retreating to his own house he found the streets in his passage barricaded and guarded by the citizens under the command of sir john levison in his attempt to force his way tracy a young gentleman to whom he bore great friendship was killed with two or three of the londoners and the earl himself attended by a few of his partisans for the greater part began secretly to withdraw themselves retired towards the river and taking boat arrived at essex house he there found that gorges whom he had sent before to capitulate with the lord keeper and the other councillors had given all of them their liberty and had gone to court with them he was now reduced to despair and appeared determined in prosecution of lord sand's advice to defend himself to the last extremity and rather to perish like a brave man with his sword in his hand than basely by the hands of the executioner but after some parley and after demanding in vain first hostages then conditions from the besiegers he surrendered at discretion requesting only civil treatment and a fair and impartial hearing the queen who during all this commotion had behaved with as great tranquillity and security as if there had only passed a fray in the streets in which she was nowise concerned soon gave orders for the trial of the most considerable of the criminals the earls of essex and southampton were arraigned before a jury of twenty-five peers where buckhurst acted as lord steward the guilt of the prisoners was too apparent to admit of any doubt and besides the insurrection known to everybody the treasonable conferences at drury house were proved by undoubted evidence sir ferdinando gorges was produced in court and the confessions of the earl of rutland of the lords cromwell sands and monteagle of davers blount and davies 
were only read to the peers according to the practice of that age essex's best friends were scandalized at his assurance in insisting so positively on his innocence and the goodness of his intentions and still more at his vindictive disposition in accusing without any appearance of reason secretary cecil as a partisan of the infanta's title the secretary who had expected this charge stepped into the court and challenged essex to produce his authority which on examination was found extremely weak and frivolous when sentence was pronounced essex spoke like a man who expected nothing but death but he added that he should be sorry if he were represented to the queen as a person that despised her clemency though he should not he believed make any cringing submissions to obtain it southampton's behaviour was more mild and submissive he entreated the good offices of the peers in so modest and becoming a manner as excited compassion in every one end of section thirty nine chapter forty four part three